do that. And I forgot. We're on. You can you may begin. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, today is April 21st. Um, this is a meeting of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. Um, this morning we have a number of uh, public hearings, one, two, three, four, five bills. That doesn't seem like much compared to what we did last week, but um, so uh, let me first establish that I believe there's a quorum and I would like to welcome anyone who is in the attendees room or who is listening on YouTube. Um, the committee is assembled uh, electronically today for the purposes of inviting public comment on legislation. Before we get started, I wanna share some information related to that fact that this meeting is being conducted using the electronic format. Um, let me see. First, I'd like to introduce the members um, I'll begin by telling you I am Senator Susan DeChambeau, I'm Senate Chair, and I represent District 32, which is um, Dayton, Lyman, Alfred, Arundel, Kennebell Port, and my hometown of Biddeford. I will recognize my co-chair, Representative Warren. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning. I'm Charlotte Warren and I represent the city of Hollowell and the towns of Manchester and West Gardner. Thank you. Uh, Representative uh, Lawrence, I mean, Senator Lawrence, excuse me. <laughs> oh, you're muted also. Thank you. I didn't want to interrupt you while you were doing your presentation. Okay. I am State Senator Mark Lawrence from Southern York County. I represent the towns of Agunquit, York, Kittery, Elliott, South Berwick, and half of Berwick. Thank you. Senator Searway. Good morning. I'm uh, Senator Scott Searway, and I represent District 16, which covers Waterville, Winslow, Fairfield, Benton, Albion, and Clinton, and Unity Township. Thanks. Uh, Representative Pickett. Good morning. My name is Dick Pickett. I represent House District 6, 116, the towns of Canton, Dixfield, Hartford, Mexico, and Peru. And I'm sitting in this nice, cozy criminal justice committee room under the dome and the sun shining outside. And we're waiting for you all to come and join us. <laughs> we are joining you. Um, <laughs> Representative Renicki. Good morning. I'm Shelley Rudnicki. I represent House District 108, which is Fairfield, Mercer, and Smithfield. And I am also under the dome, and I am here under protest because we adjourned Signer Day a couple weeks ago, three weeks ago, I guess now, and our work was done. Thank you. Uh, Representative Kostain. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, Dan Costain, uh, House District 100, which is part of Etna, Dixmont, Newport, Plymouth, and Corinna. Thank you. Uh, Representative Pluker. Thank you very much. My, I represent House District 95, which is Warren, Hope, Appleton, and part of Union. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Representative Newman. Good morning. I'm Dan Newman, District 76, which is Belgrade, Rome, Mount Vernon, Fayette, Diana, and Wayne. And Representative Luckner. Morning, I'm Grayson Luckner, representing District 37, which is part of Portland, neighborhoods of Libby Town, Rosemont, Strawwater, and Nason's Corner. And uh, Representative Morales. Good morning, everyone. My name is Victoria Morales. I represent South Portland and House District 33. Thank you. Uh, that's it for the members. I would also recognize Jane Orbiton, a policy analyst who takes great notes, uh, and our committee clerk, uh, Deb Fay, who is right there. 
you will notice if you're watching this that the LD that we're discussing is right there in her box. So thank you. Um, this meeting is currently being live streamed, as you know, on the committee's YouTube channel. That means that anyone who's a participant in the meeting uh, via Zoom can be seen and also heard if their microphone is unmuted. Zoom meetings, um, waiting to test, those who are waiting to testify cannot be seen or heard until they are called upon to speak. This meeting will be recorded and available to view on the YouTube channel as soon as the meeting is over. Um, I will say that those of you who will be brought in to um, present testimony before each bill, I will ask you to raise your hand and we will let you into the room so you can present your testimony. Now, how are we going to do that? For each bill being heard today, I will call on the sponsors first and co-sponsors to speak. After the presentation by the sponsors and co-sponsors, I will ask if there are any legislators in the room that wish to offer testimony. And we will call on the members of the public afterwards based on how they registered to testify. For example, I will always ask those who are in favor of the bill to come in and offer your testimony. Those who are in opposition of the bill uh, will be brought in and also testify. And um, lastly, neither for nor against, but wishing to offer some information. We have a three minute clock and that is for the public uh, and anyone presenting testimony other than the uh, sponsor. And now I will open the hearing and the first one I have, <clears throat> I'll check with Representative Warren and I believe we're going by the numbers, the numerical numbers, okay. <clears throat> so um, LDE, 663, the first one, an act to make comprehensive substance use disorder treatment available to Maine's incarcerated population. And um, we don't have to bring her in, she's right here. Um, my co-chair, Representative Warren, is the sponsor of this bill. Thank you, Madam Chair, I appreciate that. And before I start on the bill, um, I just want to make reference to this time. Um, we are in a very historical time with the decision handed down uh, yesterday evening, um, um, confirming uh, the guilty um, conviction um, against the murder of George Floyd. We are the criminal justice committee in Maine. We are the one and only. Um, so I, I wanted to just reference th that point in history, and I will quote Keith Ellison, Minnesota Attorney General, who said, I would not call today's verdict justice, but it is accountability, which is the first step toward justice. And as we are the Criminal Justice Committee, um, I felt the need to start off um, recognizing this historic uh, turn of events. So thank you for that. Um, good morning, Senator DeChambeau and esteemed colleagues of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. I'm Charlotte Warren and I'm pleased to present to you today LD663, which is an act to make comprehensive substance use disorder treatment available to Maine's incarcerated population. Mainers know too well the struggles and impacts of alcohol, opioids, and other prescribed and illegal drugs. Many of us understand the substance use epidemic personally through the death or near death of someone close to us, a friend, a loved one, a colleague. Tragically, deaths from drug overdose remain on the rise as reported by Maine's Attorney General reports in 2019 and 2020, and the COVID-19 pandemic has only compounded the problem. 
And while the opioid epidemic understandably has garnered significant attention and investment, alcohol continues to be the number one substance used in Maine. The reality is that Maine families and communities across the state and across generations continue to be devastated by the fiscal, social, and emotional costs of untreated addiction. We simply must do more to address all forms of problematic substance use. One population that warrants particular attention are those Mainers incarcerated in our prisons. That is because most individuals entering Maine's correctional facilities struggle with some type of substance use disorder. Many are living with alcohol use disorder and or opioid use disorder and a significant portion face polysubstance issues, co-occurring mental illness and the effects of significant childhood trauma that complicate recovery. And due to a variety of factors, including lowered tolerance and increased stress, individuals transitioning from correctional facilities are among our most vulnerable to relapse and overdose upon release as they try to obtain housing and employment, reintegrate into their families and communities and seek access to healthcare and other services. Maine's Department of Corrections has made great strides as they attempt to address these brutal realities, including launching a medical, excuse me, launching a medication assisted treatment, MAT program, focusing on addressing opioid use disorder. As part of their plan, they have expressed an ongoing understanding of the importance of providing patient-centered use excuse me, patient-centered care using all FDA-approved medications to treat withdrawal, prevent relapse, and support recovery. And I know that we all appreciate the DOC's perspective and commitment to these best practices to support those in their care. LD663 allows us to enshrine these policies and best practices into law with the goal of ensuring that all of those incarcerated in Maine's correctional facilities have access to the most appropriate, most effective care and are insulated from changes in leadership, policy or practice. And because patient-centered care is critical LD 663 establishes in law that resident patients must have access to all FDA approved medications for substance use disorder and alcohol use disorder. Further, while medication is an important component of best practice, LD 663 acknowledges the value of incarcerated individuals receiving behavioral treatment options and recovery supports throughout their stay and after their release. In response to the increased risk of relapse and overdose upon release, LD 663 provides for vital supports as individuals transition out by coordinating with representatives of local recovery communities and healthcare providers to provide medication management, case management, transitional and peer support, and reentry planning. These supports will help make a comprehensive continual continuum of care a reality. Finally, because the understanding of how best to treat and support individuals suffering from OUD and AUD continues to develop, LD 663 requires a collection of data to help understand the challenges, experiences, and outcomes of clients, both during their incarceration and post-release to best gauge the effectiveness of the program, assess successful strategies, and identify areas for improvement. 
This legislation will help close gaps in resources, provide consistency across the system, and establish a balanced approach on opioids, alcohol, and other substances. Interventions during incarceration and immediately upon release include comprehensive patient-centered treatment and recovery services lead to the best chance of treatment, engagement, sustained recovery, and quite literally survival for those in and transitioning out of Maine's correctional facilities. I urge you to join me in passing LD 663. I thank you. I'm pleased to answer any questions that you have. And one final note, Madam Chair, Mr. Bruce Nodden, who I've also been working with on this proposal, has a friendly amendment that he'd like to make, which I support. And I wondered if when you prepare to call on proponents, he could speak first to offer his amendment to the committee. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> Any questions of Representative Warren? Representative Pickett. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, just the only question I have is, uh, and, and you may not be able to answer it, answer it fully, but have you given any thought to revenue sources to, to fund this, uh, this bill? That is a great question. I don't have a specific answer. Um, it's certainly, I think a lot of what we are, what we've put in the bill will be provided in the contract. And as you know, that contract is a pretty stable price, but I'm gonna take notes on that particular question representative and let's take a look at that together because it's a, it's a very good question for us to ask of WellPath or whoever the next provider ends up being. Um, okay. You Thank will you. note you. that um, most of what we are talking about in this proposal representative is already happening currently. Uh, as I mentioned, the, our Department of Corrections is really ahead of the curve on this. And a lot of this is already being provided. What this bill does ensure is that we get it in statute so that regardless of commissioner changes or staffing changes, it, it remains. Um, the best practice. So thank you, but let's work on nailing down those financial details. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. In that answer, you answered my question. Go ahead. Um, Representative Vernicki. Thank you, Madam Chair. She actually answered a couple of my questions um, on that too in her answer, but I'm going to kind of throw something out there and it's probably not going to be a popular thing, but that's okay. I'm not, you know, but should, in, should inmates get better treatment than those who haven't committed a crime? Because that seems to be where we're going with so many of these things. Um, thank you for that question. I have to say, Representative Rudnicki, that one of my favorite things about you is that you are not interested in being popular. Uh, you're not <laughs> here to make friends, you're here to do good work. And I share that. And so I really, I do appreciate that very much. Um, you know, I think that everybody should have access to the care that they deserve, um, everybody. Um, and so do I think that we would be better served as a state if we didn't incarcerate so many folks for a medical issue like substance use disorder, without a doubt. We pay for these services with our general fund, whereas if people were outside of our incarcerated facilities, we would, there would be a lot less money spent on it for sure. Um, I, just, I believe that every single person deserves access to healthcare for their medical concerns. And I, I do come from a family um, with incarcerated uh, family members. And uh, 
you know, I, I wouldn't ever choose one of them over the other. I would never say that one deserved care and another didn't. I truly believe that all Mainers deserve health care equally. Follow up, Madam Chair. Uh, you have another question? Yes, please. Okay, go right ahead. Um, it, it's just something in what you just said. Um, you basically said somebody shouldn't be incarcerated or not have care because they've been incarcerated for substance abuse. These folks have not been incarcerated for substance abuse. They've been incarcerated because they committed a crime. Am I correct? Uh, we disagree on that point. When you are incarcerated simply for possessing, which we allow in this state, you are, you are, that is, you're possessing a chemical. That's, that's, that is, you know, we can, we're probably not going to agree on, on this representative. And I, I don't think that we need to agree on it. Um, I think that we can agree on the fact that um, people deserve treatment. And I think you will agree that I am fighting equally as hard as you've seen in the entire time that you've worked with me for people outside of our incarcerated facilities to also receive treatment. I'm fighting every day for that to happen in every way that I can. And in a lot of ways that don't make me very popular with people in power, right? So thank you for the question. Representative Morales. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Warren. Uh, just to follow up a little bit on that, can you speak to um, whether when we treat folks who are, um, well, number one, does this also apply to jails? That's the first question. And number two, um, when we treat folks for substance use disorder in prison, um, does that correlate to reduced recidivism and also increased public safety in the community? Thank you for the question. I'm just gonna write those last. Um, let me talk about the, the county jails first and thank you for the question. You know, we talked a lot about that issue when, um, when we started working on this bill and this particular bill in front of you is solely focused on the Department of Corrections. Um, as we all know, we are seeing uh, many of our sheriffs um, in our county jails already working on, uh, on doing this. And a big part of that is alongside Mr. Bruce Nodden, who you'll hear from, from um, you know, when he has meetings in our counties with our county uh, sheriffs and all of the folks in our community supporting the folks on the inside of the county jails, they're sort of already creating a lot of this that we're trying to put in statute here. They certainly have these relationships with community providers. So there's a sort of a warm handoff, right? Um, and Bruce, don't get me wrong, he's also working within the DOC, uh, but he's built sort of a very large informal structure with the county jails. So we're focused on the DOC, we're putting a lot of, let me say it a different way. There is a lot of expected and I believe valid expectation on our county jails. And um, I also believe, as you know, because we've all been working on this bill for a while, that we need to change how we fund county jails, right? 80% of county jails shouldn't be billed to property taxpayers, right? We're all working on that together. So while we're trying to make that change in the formula, I personally did not want in this bill to add another layer uh, on to the county jails. And they're doing it. We're seeing them, them do. And, and also, you know, we have to recognize that there was a court case and uh, the, the courts have said that county jails have to do this. 
So, so I'm not focused on the county jails right now. This is focused on DOC. And I meant to bring that up in my testimony. So I'm glad you asked the question. Absolutely. Uh, I, I was just looking at some data yesterday. 44% right now, 44% or the latest data we have, excuse me, 44% uh, of all admissions to uh, the DOC were returned to custody for uh, violations, technical violations I was just looking at yesterday. Um, and I really believe that, I'm just looking at paperwork, I really believe that um, if we don't have proper reentry services, we, we don't even have a chance to reduce return to custody rates. And if we aren't reducing return to custody rates, we are not improving public safety. So they absolutely go hand in hand. Um, I wanted, I know you, I saw Madam Chair looking at her, looking for that information. I wanna get that stat for you. 44%, you're gonna ask me, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> I've got it here. So did that answer your question, Representative? It did, thank you, both of them, thank you. In 2017, 44% of Maine's prison admissions were due to probation violations. Okay. So, I do, yes. so that to me is just one little statistic, one little tiny in a lot of statistics that we need a little support around how we transition people out. And that is something I'm trying to uh, pay a little bit attention to that maybe I haven't paid attention to as much as I should in previous sessions. So thank you for that question. Um, Representative Morales, is that another question? You have, okay. Um, and I'm glad you read it. Um, and I just want to offer to you and to everybody else that that's why I wrote a note, especially when you use the word 44% on technical uh, violations. But what you read is probation violations. To me, those are two different things. You can have a revocation of probation due to having committed a new crime. So I, I think you've got to split the two. There are, I'm very surprised that number is so high on technical. That's Let me correct one thing that. Probation, yeah. Thank probation you. Probation officers are working very hard not to throw someone back in for technical violations, such as getting drunk again or using. The sentence goes on to say, 41% of those revocations were for a technical violation of probation, such as a failed drug test or failure to comply with programming. Okay. Um, and this is from the report that I keep having Jane send to us when people ask about data. Um, this is from the, um, the, um, the working group that you co-chaired, um, Senator DeChambeau. It is called the Policy Framework. It was released in January, 2021 uh, by the Council of State Governments. Um, and, and so there's a whole sort of section in there called key challenges uh, around our Department of Corrections. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, I'm, so I do have a question though. Um, oh, great. First of all, I. I want to mention to some people that, you know, criminal justice and public safety, it is our responsibility to oversee the operations of the Department of Corrections. And they're already doing this. And that's why I support the fact that it's now going to be on a statute in the statute, so that a new governor or another commissioner or another warden um, will have to subscribe to this. And also the contracts um, for um, medical services, um, which right now is WellPath, um, that, that, you know, they already provide most of this. 
So my question, though, is if you would look at the bill line 19 to 22, um, being a caseworker, uh, I took special note of that. Could you look at that and give me an example how to coordinate with representatives of local recoveries when you already have case management inside? I, I, I don't know what, what thought went into that five lines. Could you read me the sentence? I yes, don't have the, the bill right in front of yeah. me. Coordinate with representatives of local recovery communities, medical providers, and other appropriate persons to offer case management, transitional and peer support, medication management, re-entry planning, and comprehensive treatment options to clients after release. That last line makes sense, but in the middle, I don't know if local community people can be involved in the medication management. Um, so, Thank you for the question. Yes, I see what you're getting at. So one of the things that the county jails are really good at doing is matching up with local service providers that and what those local service providers for MAT are providing in the community for the folks who will return to that community. So for instance, if I have someone inside the county jail and let's say we're going to um, put them on methadone for as their medication assisted treatment, I'm gonna make sure that in the community that they're going to return to, I'm gonna be able to match them up with a provider that not only can provide them behavioral health services, but also can provide them with methadone. The same goes for Vivitrol or buprenorphine, right? Mm -hmm. And so that, that warm handoff of, of, of that uh, resident right now down in Warren or in Wyndham, wherever they're going to return to within our state, we better make sure that how we're serving them with inside our facility matches with what's available in their community. And that is what that sentence is all about. Okay. I, I will ask you, I will develop it. I do have somewhat of an amendment. There's just a few words. I agree with you. County jails do a great job. Um, it's difficult. Uh, they don't have caseworkers in every county jail. Um, so, but the Department of Corrections does. So there are a few words in there that I don't think the local uh, recovery people can come in and do the case management. Um, so I, we'll talk about that. I, I just- Sounds good. Thank you, clear. Senator. Okay. Um, you. And Senator Sayway. Oh, I'm out there. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. <laughs> Just, <hang up. laughs> Just trying to get the phones taken care of. That. <laughs> um, so I just had a question. I, I, you said that it, they're already doing it, and and that's good to know. And I think because I, you know, I was on the opioid committee, and and a doc, uh, Judge Stokes said that uh, his biggest problem when he when he sentences somebody. You know, his intentions are just like you. We want to make sure that they get out and be successful citizens. And uh, so, uh, but the, how do we, um, for one thing, I don't know if there's going to be a cost to this. And, and I guess that's a question. And, and to meet up to the standards that you're putting on here, if that is going to bring it up a couple notches and cause it. It, to, to get what you want accomplished, I'm just thinking that it's going to be more than what they're already doing. Thank you, Senator Searway, for that question. Um, that might be a good question for the commissioner. Um, okay. You know, 
I think we've heard in this committee, you remember, we spent two hours one afternoon um, listening to the folks that provide healthcare within our DOC. Um, and my understanding, and I've uh, had lots of follow-up back and forth questions, which I've shared with all of you and have received very uh, information, you know, information rich answers from the DOC, which I've also made sure has been shared with all of you. Um, and so I think most of what we're talking about is certainly happening. Uh, do, will this be a, a sort of another step up for more comprehensive across the board um, and making sure that all residents have access to all FDA approved MAT medications. That is something that I think we, um, you know, will have to work on, but we're not talking about huge difference in price here. And, and, and remember that it's not like the DOC goes out and buys the medicine, you know, like we do through Express Scripts or at our local Hannaford. They're paying a healthcare provider who then is purchasing these medications. Um, so I think most of it is already happening. That's what we've heard, mostly this uh, puts it in statute, but let's ask the question together of the commissioner, does he see um, this being a big uh, increase? Um, the commissioner's on board um, in support. Um, as we all know, he has made this really a priority from day one. So, but I, I really encourage you to, to ask him those questions. Thank you. Seeing no other hands raised, um, I would like to call upon any co-sponsors or legislators who wish to offer testimony. Please raise your hand and our clerk will let you in. Seeing none. No hands? No hands. What I will now ask is those wishing to offer testimony in support of this bill, uh, please raise your hand and we'll bring you in. Senator, and could we hear? Not, Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I'm bringing over Bruce Nodden and then um, the two more. Thank you. There are a lot of hands up. We'll um, recognize our honorary um, DOC member, Bruce Nodden. <laughs> um, and we say that with full respect, Mr. Nodden. Um, not too many people step up to the plate as you do, so thank you. Um, thank you very much. Okay. I will, you may offer your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Shambo. Thank you, Representative Warren. Um, my name is Bruce Nodden, and I'm, I'm the Executive Director of the Maine Prisoner Reentry Network. Um, I'm speaking here today in support um, of LD663. Um, first, I want to say in the last two years, um, we've been so impressed uh, by the, the rapid implementation of evidence-based medication-assisted treatment within all of the Maine Department of Corrections facilities. Um, and MPRM was pleased to be included in the early development of the, MBD, the MDOC's pilot, the MA, MAT pilot, uh, that's now fully implemented and really successful from our standpoint. Um, MDOC included community organizations like ours in the development process, and we're really proud of what the department and the leadership has done, particularly uh, Commissioner Liberty and, and Deputy Commissioner Ryan Thornell. Um, we also see LD663 as, a, as that, an opportunity to codify this hard work and the well-established MAT program that, that DOC and partners have, have developed. 
We also see, also see um, LD663 as an opportunity to improve upon these unprecedented accomplishments. The best programs continually assess themselves seeking continuous quality improvement. From our perspective, residents of M MDOC facilities are not fully aware of all the treatment and recovery options available to them in advance. Um, to address this issue and further strengthen this bill, hopefully, <laughs> we're pro proposing a friendly amendment, something I've never done before. Um, I propose the Department of Corrections could encourage community-based recovery and treatment organizations to work together to educate all residents of Department of Corrections and all evidence-based treatment options to support recovery. This education will support the information provided by the medical and mental health staff and allow residents to make an informed choice about treatment and recovery pathways. The work of these community-based organizations will assist MDOC in expanding their reach. Um, we kind of look at it this way, you know, the great thing about what DOC has done is they've invited organizations like PRCC, Portland Recovery Community Center, to come in and provide um, a recovery coaching uh, within the facilities. We kind of see this in the same way. And I'm, I've only got a couple of seconds, but Senator DeChambeau, I want to answer your question very quickly. We have been allowed and encouraged by the department to introduce community resources prior to release. And the department does a great job of connecting those people to proper treatment centers within the community. So the case managers, the case workers are doing a really good job of that. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions of Mr. Nodden? Very thorough, thank you. Um, let me just take a look. Um, I usually uh, write down the names of the people that came in, but I will recognize Elizabeth Makotowicz. Yep, Makotowicz. Okay, go right ahead, Elizabeth. Okay, my name is Elizabeth, and I used to think a lot like you all did. I had that stigma where addicts choose to be what they are, and it's a weakness, and they choose to break the law. And then God humbled me, and I found myself in an abusive relationship where I went to the hospital with permanent brain damage because he beat me so bad. And then the doctors were pumping me full of opiates and telling me I was on too small of a dose to get addicted. And this was the lie of the pharmaceutical companies. And if you all are looking for a way to pay for this, make them pay for it. 70% of addicts became addicts because they trusted a doctor. And then they found out the hard way, like me. And when I finally fleed my abuser, I went to Spruce Run, the local battered women's shelter, and they turned me away with two beds open. They said my situation was too severe. And it put the other women in the shelter in danger. So drug dealers protected me. I was desperate and I was scared. I never wanted to break the law. I was a single mother in college. And then I finally went to federal prison and I got, I watched lots of people detox. And by the time I got out, the pharmaceutical companies admitted you can die from detox, but all of us inmates already knew that. And the local jails use medications and as a form of abuse. I was in solitary and they had me on an antidepressant. I have a bipolar diagnosis. And by, by the time I got to prison, they told me you shouldn't be on this. This makes bipolar people homicidal or suicidal. And they kept me in solitary during this. And I freaked out so bad. I started hallucinating. I started cutting myself. Meanwhile, I had a sergeant writing on my request form because I was begging for help that I should just kill myself. These cops, in, in the jails, they don't care. And Meghan Markle said it perfectly, where an institution only cares how it looks. They don't care what happens to people in there. And then by the time I get out, I was stabilized on all my medications, not even replacement drug therapy. When I got out on probation, my medications were over $1,000. There was no way for me to pay for that. And I eventually went back to prison because I lost my mind again. You know, relapsing and dealing with the bipolar because Paula Page made it so you people like me couldn't get any kind of, you know, 
insurance or medication or therapy. I tried for years and every provider dropped me because I could not pay for it. And then when I got out, Janet Mills was governor and thank God, because I can get trauma therapy. Now I can get replacement therapy. Now I'm going on three years and I'm still sober. I just launched my art. I just launched a clothing line with my art and I'm doing great because I have access to these, you know, these programs and this kind of therapy. And I really want Maine to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. But, you know, I'm, we just had, you know, the trial of Derek Chauvin. And I have to say, when Paula Page said, oh, we have thugs coming from the hood and impregnating our women and bringing all these drugs. I was a drug dealer on the streets for years. And the only thing I saw was a bunch of white police informants going down to the cities and getting these thugs. You know, most people outside of Maine. Elizabeth, could you wrap it up? Your time is up. Sorry. Um, Thank you. Well, this this law could save lives and, you know, county jails need to do this too. You know, I watched people die in county jail because they didn't get their medication. Any questions for Elizabeth? Seeing none, thank you again. Um, Mr. Lehman, you're here. Do you have testimony you wish to give us? Yes, indeed. Thank Good. you. Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, uh, distinguished members of the committee. My name is Peter Lehman. I live in Thomaston. I'm formerly incarcerated and a person in long-term recovery. I'm testing, testifying on behalf of the Maine Prisoner Advocacy Coalition, whose goal is to promote restorative practices in order to increase public safety and the health of our community. I'm also Bruce Nunn's partner in NPRN, and I want to emphasize that the reason for this treatment is so that incarcerated women and men don't come back, don't create more victims, don't cost us a lot of money by incarcerating them again. This is, um, and, but this, and this bill's about substance abuse and uh, substance use. And substance use becomes a disorder when it leads to health issues or problems at work, school, or home. Continued use, despite these self-destructive consequences, is off, most often rooted in personal needs or pain, most often rooted in trauma. Put another way, self-destructive substance use is, off, is most often self-medication for other mental health issues. Treatment for substance abuse is generally addressing these underlying issues, not merely abstaining from use. Medication is helpful because it mutes or eliminates the cravings for use. Note that these cravings are not just physical, but also mental, when the underlying issues trigger a learned response to use. This is why medications can assist treatment, but medications are not the treatment. Handing out pills is not treatment. I mention all this to get to the observation that getting to underlying issues and dealing with them is not simple. It's not quick, even though it's life-changing. I hope this explains why real treatment is so important. And it's also trying to tell you why it should be available throughout incarceration. I have a small friendly amendment also for this bill to make sure that we say explicitly that this in, in C and D, that this treatment should be throughout incarceration, not just a few pills and no treatment at the end. Strongly urge you to vote to support 663 with the revisions we suggest and urge you to unanimously vote ought to pass. Thanks for your attention and support. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Um, I'm going to ask to clarify, I, I was taking the notes of your amendment, something about that throughout and no meds in the end, or would you repeat what you, that amendment, please? I suggested that in 
subparagraph 10A, paragraph C and D. Those two paragraphs should explicitly say throughout incarceration. Let's see. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, no questions. I will uh, tell the other people that just came in, I recorded your names as you came in. So I've got Jonathan Fellers, Dr. Nick Gallagher, I believe, uh, and Ryan Page. If one of you, if you all know each other and one should go first, just do it. But uh, so I will recognize Jonathan Fellers. Good morning, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and other members of the Joint Standing Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety. My name is Jonathan Fellers, and I am testifying today in support of LD663, an act to make comprehensive substance use disorder treatment available to Maine's incarcerated population. I'm an addiction psychiatrist, and I work with patients, families, and our healthcare system to promote high quality evidence-based screening, assessment and treatment for substance use disorders and co-occurring mental disorders. I serve as the medical director for Crossroads where we provide gender responsive treatment programs for women with addiction. I am medical director for opiate treatment programs of Discovery House in South Portland and in Waterville, also known as methadone clinics. Through these two locations, we provide both methadone and buprenorphine, also known as Suboxone, for about 1,300 Mainers with opioid use disorder. I have a small private practice where I provide both psychiatric and co-occurring outpatient care for patients from all over the state. I serve on the board of the Portland Recovery Community Center. And finally, I live in South Portland with my wife and two young children. There are three medication options for the treatment of a person with opioid use disorder, methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone. I am very pleased with the progress Maine has made in expanding medication assisted treatment for residents with a substance use disorder during incarceration. Expansion of methadone and naltrexone has made far less progress. Consequently, residents often have only one choice for treatment, buprenorphine. LD663 would increase health equity by expanding access to all three of these life-saving medications. It would give residents choice in the care that they receive, thereby promoting autonomy and enabling shared decision-making. This follows evidence-based practice and the guidelines from SAMHSA. Quote, there is no one-size-fits-all approach to opioid use disorder treatment, and quote, give patients expressed preferences significant weight when making decisions. With the national opioid epidemic, everyone's attention has been focused on opioid use disorder. However, alcohol is the biggest addiction issue for Mainers. I am therefore encouraged that LD663 would promote treatment for residents with alcohol use disorders. Current evidence shows that medications are underused in the treatment of alcohol use disorder. This is of concern because the high prevalence of alcohol problems in the general population. The FDA has approved three oral medications and one injectable medication for the treatment of alcohol use disorder. I am not aware of the availability of these medications to Maine's incarcerated population. Expanding access to medication assisted treatment for alcohol use disorder promotes evidence-based practice and health equity. I urge you to pass LD663 and I thank you for your time to speak to you today. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, thank you very much. Any questions for Dr. Fellers? Thank you. Um, I will now, Ooh, I just had it. <laughs> Recognize Dr. Nick Gallagher. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Thank you. Well, thanks. Good morning, Dr. Uh, Senator Deschambeau, Representative Warren, and other members of the Joint Standing Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety. My name is uh, Dr. Nick Gallagher. I'm the Medical Director of Addiction Medicine for Maine General. 
Um, I do not come here today representing Maine General, but as a member of the community who treats patients with substance use disorder on a daily basis, many of whom are recently incarcerated. I'm testifying today in support of LD663. And um, a lot of what I'm going to say is going to kind of piggyback off what um, Dr. Fellers just said. Um, but in all aspects of medicine, whether it be diabetes, uh, blood pressure, or treatment of substance use disorder, our goal should always be to practice evidence-based medicine. We should also be committed to treating every patient as an individual. Medicine is not a one-size-fits-all practice. Luckily, in regard to both opioid use disorder and alcohol use disorder, there are different FDA-approved medication options, as well as very clear guidelines by SAMHSA for the treatment of these disorders. We owe it to all of our patients to discuss the risks and benefits of all treatment options and allow them to be part of the decision-making process. It's easy to get caught up in the daily grind, so sometimes I'll take a step back and think, if this was my grandmother or my mother, how would I want them to be treated? Personally, I'd want my family members to be provided with all the possible evidence-based treatment options, and this is what our patients deserve. There are three FDA-approved medications for opioid use disorder, as mentioned, buprenorphine, naltrexone, and methadone, and three for alcohol use disorder. And again, we can never forget alcohol use disorder when we're talking about substance use disorder. And those are naltrexone, acamprosate, and disulfiram. Um, I thought I'd take a minute to briefly discuss the difference between buprenorphine and naltrexone, as I feel that it will, um, it, it will highlight how different these medications work and, um, and that also that they are for very different patients. Um, so as most of you know, buprenorphine is an opioid partial agonist and it binds to your opioid receptors and it stimulates them at a level that prevents withdrawal and cravings at the appropriate dose, but it does not produce a euphoria. The cons of this medication is that it is an opiate and it requires careful titration, monitoring, and can be a time consuming process to wean somebody off. This medication is ideal for people who are early on in their recovery, those who are at high risk for relapse and those with intense cravings to use opioids. It is my understanding that currently this is medication is the only option for opioid use disorder in main correctional institutions and is the only medication I see any patients on who are coming from these institutions. And I do see patients right out of jail. Um, now, Trexone is an opiate blocker. It's a non-opioid, non-habit-forming, non-addictive medication that is not a controlled substance. It works by physically blocking the opioid receptors and does not produce nearly the same level of control of cravings or urges to use. This is an ideal medication for patients who have not been on opioids for an extended period of time, hence people just coming out of prison for six, seven month sentences that haven't been using any opioids. In that patient population, I would not want to, my first choice would not to be put them back on an opioid. It would be to give them the option of a non-opioid, non-controlled substance medication, which is now Trexone. Um, in addition to the medication for substance use disorder, there's tons of evidence saying that groups, counseling, and other um, uh, sort of holistic care, pr more people are successful, the more um, support they have. And I truly believe that, um, you know, as healthcare providers, we all want to do what's best. Um, a major barrier to treatment for substance use disorder in the medical community is lack of education. So I think expanding upon the already successful treatment programs that main prisons can be done without significant costs through education of providers. Um, that can be done through the a plethora of treatment um, uh, um, materials that are online through SAMHSA with no cost. Also considering providing continuing medical education lectures for providers um, that work in the prisons. And then we can bring, bring the prisons up to the uh, current evidence-based guidelines and FDA recommendations. And I feel that we owe this to our patients. So I, I urge you to vote for this bill in, in support of it. And I thank you all for your time. Thank you, Dr. Gallagher. I just noticed you are an alumni of both Representative Warren and myself at UNA, so. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a Mainer, I'm from, I'm from Maine, so. Oh, good, thank you. Um, thank you guys, I appreciate Ryan it. Ryan Page, welcome, uh, Mr. Page. Uh, questions. Oh, oh, yes. I thought I asked that, I'm sorry. Uh, first one is Representative Pluker followed by Representative Pickett. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, could you just give us a little more detail on naltrexone and why that's significant for our incarcerated populations and important to have? Sure. So um, one of the main differences between um, buprenorphine and naltrexone, one of them is that it 
um, naltrexone is not a controlled substance. It's not an opioid and it's not habit forming. On the other hand, um, buprenorphine is an opioid. It's a controlled substance and it, it, people become dependent on it. So I frequently see patients right out of jail. My, I'm looking at the jail right here. So they, they'll come from jail here, having not been on any opioids for eight, nine months. And in my opinion, the best thing for them is not to just put them back on an opiate. It's to give them the option of being on something that would block their opioid receptors that is non-habit forming, that they can, my patients say it's a kind of a security blanket because they know if they were to use, their receptors are blocked. So those are for stable people that haven't been on opioids that we don't really want to just start them on another opiate. Um, they're, they're off the opiates. They've been detoxed. Some of those patients that I see from the prison, yeah, we I put them on buprenorphine because they're high risk. They're going to use if they don't have that um, opioid receptor stimulation provided by buprenorphine, but that's not all of them. They're, you know, and so having this option that is a safe medication I've, with minimal, if any side effects, um, and is not a controlled substance just makes a lot of sense that rather than putting somebody on another opiate, does that help? It, it does. Could I have a follow up, Madam Chair? Uh, yes, go right ahead. So for the naltrexone, I assume you need a prescription, but do you need to go to a clinic or something like that to get it? Or could you get it at your local pharmacy if you had a prescription? No, because, because it's not a controlled substance. Any doctor with a, with a in the state of Maine can prescribe it. Unlike buprenorphine, which also presents another issue that you have to get somebody to a, a somebody who's licensed to prescribe buprenorphine. Naltrexone, anybody can prescribe it. Thank you very much. No problem. Uh, Representative Pickett, followed by Representative Morales. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And all I wanted to know, Doctor, it would it be possible for you to uh, provide uh, some of that testimony and writing, it would be very helpful to have to study before the work session. Yeah, definitely. I, if somebody can, um, I don't know how I can get in touch with the right people to get my email out or to get the appropriate contact info, but I can definitely um, provide you with, with that testimony for sure. That's great. And, and uh, Madam Chair, could uh, possibly he reach out to, to Deb or something and see if we can get him so that he can uh, introduce yeah. that through the testimony chain? Uh, that, that's, well, she just put it up, um, doctor. Uh, it's criminal justice, public safety, the four letters, uh, CJPC at legislature.main, spelled out, dot gov. So it's CJPS. Criminal Justice, Public Safety at Legislature. Cool, I, I got it. Okay, great. Um, cool, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Oh, thank you very much. No, thank you, guys. Thank yeah. you. Is there another what question? What I just heard from you is very refreshing. It's the first time I've heard that <laughs> about being released and not putting them back on an opioid after they've been without for a year or two. So, uh, Representative uh, Morales. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. Gallagher. Um, wondering if you can explain to us what is the difference between the standard medical treatment for opioid use and alcohol, alcohol use disorder in the community today versus what you know that uh, the Department of Corrections has been providing uh, currently um, in, in prior years? So um, admittedly, I don't know a ton about what the criminal justice um, system is doing for alcohol use disorder. I only know what I see from patients that come to my office from there. Um, I know that my go-to medication for alcohol use disorder is also naltrexone. I've seen awesome results with that. There's a lot of evidence um, that it, it works really well at decreasing and cravings to use alcohol. So I know for a fact that that's not being provided at, um, in the criminal justice um, system here in Maine because naltrexone is what we were just discussing, but it's a great medication for alcohol use disorder. Um, there's a couple of others like acamprosate and disulfiram, both of which are non-controlled substances that don't require any special license. They're good for cravings. Um, I mean, we could talk more about that stuff in detail, but, um, but these are, are really safe medications, easy to prescribe, um, only would require a small amount of training to do. And it's not something you need a special license for. So 
Um, I think it's, uh, is that answering your question? Yeah, it does. Um, could I have a follow-up, Madam Chair? Go right ahead. Um, also, also wondering, speaking about naltrexone and some of the other medications that maybe are not being provided inside, particularly around naltrexone, how long has that been standard, um, considered standard in, um, you know, in the community and approved as treatment? In the been particular community, um, I came back after my fellowship six months ago. And what I did find was that I had to go out searching for alcohol use disorder patients because it wasn't a regular thing for that to be um, sent my way. Um, it was all opioids. So in terms of like now Trexone and um, its treatment and FDA approval for alcohol use disorder, I believe it was about 2000, 2002. So it's been a while that that's been a, a, an approved treatment. Um, for alcohol use disorder, as well as a campersate and disulfiram. They've, they've been around for a while. Okay, thank you very much. That's helpful. No problem. Seeing no other hands raised, I will now go to Ryan Page. Welcome. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Bye. Thank you, Senator DeChambeau. Hi, good morning. Uh, I have already submitted testimony. I'm just going to read that today. So, um, dear Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and esteemed members of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee, my name is Ryan Page, and I am an organizer with the Maine Recovery Advocacy Project. I am also a person in long-term recovery with lived experience who suffered with substance use disorder while incarcerated. Uh, I would like to first acknowledge that across, that the access to an understanding of the need for the treatment of substance use disorder has made considerable strides uh, forward since my incarceration in 2004. At that time, treatment options were limited to a meeting held by members of Alcoholics Anonymous that would come into the jail. There was no talk of any other treatment options from any other staff, correctional or medical at that time. Furthermore, any discussion from correctional staff was stigmatizing and dehumanizing. For example, I recall a corrections officer referring to the AA meetings as quote unquote, junkies anonymous. Though options seem to have expanded to include the use of the medication-assisted treatment with Suboxone, the climate has not followed, sadly. There are so many evidence-based options for treatment of substance use disorder that are not offered and outright excluded. Not to mention that the conditions that need to be met to acquire these life-saving treatment options are nearly impossible to meet for a person coming into the jails that is still in active use due to the requirements made by the jails. This policy failure recently contributed to a loss of human life. Um, somebody that I know, uh, his name is Eddie Estes and he's from Biddeford, Maine. I believe this person's life could have been saved had there been a variety of adequate and accessible treatment options available. I agree that we have done some things, but it's not enough. We can do better and we need to do better. We are failing our communities and these failures are costing human lives and contributing to the cycle of trauma and substance use we see so often. I write today in support of LD663 because I believe that there are as many pathways to treatment as there are people that need them. Those pathways need to be offered and communicated in a, con in a compassionate manner. I ask you to please support this bill because treatment saves lives. It saved mine. Thank you for your time. I'll be open to answer any questions. I also wanted to extend my support for the amendment that Bruce Nodden made earlier today. Um, we were in discussion about that earlier. Thank you so much for your time today, guys. Thank you, Mr. Page. <clears throat> Any questions for Ryan Page? Seeing none, again, thank you. Thank you. I will now uh, recognize I've got Brianne Baer, uh, followed by, uh, where did she go? There's Whitney, Whitney Parrish. Okay. Um, oh, good. Why? No, okay. Uh, did Brienne, did I lose her? Where is she? I'm here. I'm here. Okay, there you go. Go right ahead. Thank you. Hello. Thank you all for being here and hearing public comment. Thank you, Senator Deschambault. 
and distinguished members of this committee, and thank you, Representative Warren, for sponsoring this bill. My name is Brianne Beer, and I'm here as an advocate, and I also work with No Penobscot County Jail Extension. When I was 17 years old, I started dating a guy who, come to find out, was using heroin very heavily. I was really young, really privileged, and really judgmental. I ended up having a baby with him and felt entitled to share my opinion on his addiction. I used to call him derogatory names that have to do with substance use. I used to talk very badly about maintenance medication, all of it. I was mean. Rewind four years. I'm sorry, fast forward four years. And the unthinkable happened to me. I was dabbling in drugs to get me through college as a single mom. I self-medicated. So I went to the doctor all the time. They were throwing Vicodin and Percocet at me. Ovarian pain, stomach problems, headache. You could say anything and get pills. Rewind or fast forward another year. I couldn't go without the pills. I would shake. I would sweat. I would cry. I believe karma is real. I still think my words and judgments toward people struggling with addiction sealed my fate. The creator wanted to teach me a lesson. And well, he certainly did. At this point, I was still a functioning person. I was working, parenting. And then one day I got pulled over and I didn't have my insurance card with me. It led to a mess of events that eventually landed me in jail for a two month sentence and multiple prior arrests. Mind you, never drug charges, just traffic offenses because I didn't pay my tickets. Why? Because of the sickness. I didn't want to feel it. So when it came down to the fines or the substances to heal the sickness, it was substances. I wasn't scared of jail, but the sickness made me want to die. It was terrifying. I finally understood what my son's father had gone through all those years. Fast forward some more. And in 2018, I served that sentence. I didn't have time to wean off maintenance medication. Looking back, I would have done it completely different. The first few days were okay, then a weekend I could barely stand. I spent my days in the bathroom, vomiting and other things. I asked the guards and the med lady for help, nothing. The other women kept saying, ask for the protocol, but no one would even assess me. It took two whole weeks before I was even considered for meds that simply lowered the amount of times I went to the bathroom. I was dehydrated and I didn't sleep for 35 days straight. My legs felt like something, someone had tiny little knives burying them just below the surface enough to feel like torture. Delirious from sleep deprivation, I couldn't keep food down. I hurt like I've never hurt before, even after having three babies. I felt in, things in this time I wouldn't wish on anyone. I cried on the phone to my mom like a baby. I lost hope. I know if I didn't have my kids at home, I might've considered ending it myself. It hurt really bad. I laid in my bunk and wondered until day 40 if I could really be in this, how it was possible to be in this much pain. Some guards made you feel worse. They would drop remarks like, I bet you wish you never used drugs now and laughing in your face. I'm a recovering substance abuse user, substance abuser, and I have a bachelor's degree in science and nursing. Addiction doesn't miss educated or professional people. I believe the stigma we face has a lot to do with policy. And I see my time's up. I just have two more seconds. I don't want revenge. I don't want to make the guards pay or the whole system. In fact, I just want people like me struggling with substance use disorder to be treated fairly and with consideration when incarcerated. I support this bill. We are in 2021, research is everywhere, and I know some changes have been made. I'm grateful for that. But I hope we can progress further and catch up with the times to support the affected incarcerated people. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Beer. Uh, any questions for Brianne? Seeing none, uh, now we'll turn over to Whitney Parrish. Uh, Good morning, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and distinguished members of the committee. Uh, my name is Whitney Parrish. I am the Advocacy and Communications Director for Health Equity Alliance. Uh, HEAL is a nonpartisan nonprofit public health and harm reduction organization um, that envisions and works toward the world where all people are valued and celebrated and health justice is realized for everyone, regardless of who they are, where they come from, or what their lives look like. Um, I am here to testify in strong support of LD663 uh, because no matter your circumstances or where you live, everyone deserves access to comprehensive, high quality health care and the support they need to achieve and maintain good health. I do want to quickly thank all of the testifiers who have told their stories, shared their journeys. Um, that is a very brave and courageous thing to do and more folks need to hear about what actually happens to folks. I love many of those people as well. Health Equity Alliance provides harm reduction services and targeted case management to people who actively use drugs. Our services are comprehensive and rooted in compassionate evidence-based practices because we know these practices work. We build trust through providing non-judgmental services because knowing and being reminded that you have inherent dignity and worth and are deserving of the same care as anyone else can make all the difference in a person's life and health outcomes. 
Although LD663 deals specifically with the treatment side of drug use or substance use disorder, we believe its goal in providing comprehensive, compassionate, dignified care is not only essential to the health and safety of residents in our carceral settings, but to our overall strategy to reduce overdose deaths and increase overall public health. Unfortunately, many of our clients are also familiar with being residents of our county and state facilities. They are familiar with what uh, Brianna just described, um, often physically and emotionally painful, humiliating, and sometimes dangerous experiences that lead them no closer to health or recovery. To be clear, HEAL envisions a world where we cease reliance on punitive measures to address drug use. However, so long as people who use drugs are entering carceral settings, we believe it is absolutely critical that individuals have the health care they may need while there. Lack of this health care is only compounding the issues you all hear about regarding substance use and so wholeheartedly tackle through your work here. Um, we do recognize that this work is being done in, um, in our state facilities um, and support the codification and the enshrinement of this into law because that is so important as you all know and has been pointed out. So I'll end with, you know, no matter where you live or what anyone thinks about the choices you make, you deserve the medical care you need. We're incredibly grateful to Representative Warren for her leadership on issues related to substance use and introducing this concrete step toward improved access and care to health for all Maine residents. We respectfully urge the committee to vote odd to pass. Thanks for your time and attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Parrish. Any questions for Whitney? Seeing none, I wanna thank you again, both of you. <clears throat> um, we are continuing in support and I see Anna Black. Welcome. Good morning, Senator. Thank you. So if it's okay with, um, with the, the chairs, um, Robin Hodges from WellPath is on. I'll provide her testimony on behalf of the department, but I asked Robin to be on in case there's some more technical medical questions that she can better answer. So if it's okay uh, to bring her onto the screen in case there's, like I said, some more technical questions. Yes. Um, Sounds she, great. Yeah. And her title, and she's um, with the department, correct? Or she works directly? She works directly for WellPath for the department of, on behalf of the Department of Corrections. Okay. Yep, she's on there. All right. Great. All right. So thank you. I appreciate your uh, allowing that to happen. So good morning, Representative. Warren, Representative, excuse me, and Senator DeChambeau and other distinguished members of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. I'm Anna Black, Director of Government Affairs for the Maine Department of Corrections. We're providing testimony in support of LD663. The Maine Department of Corrections supports this bill as it codifies medication for the treatment of substance use disorders for a population of people with need and at a high risk for overdosing, those coming out of incarceration. As this committee knows, the MDOC has pr prioritized the provision of MAT in our facilities. We recognize that MAT is a standard of care in the treatment of opioid use disorder, and that we can save lives, promote recovery, and ensure healthier communities with it. During our February 24th conversation, as Representative Warren mentioned with this committee and with WellPath, we went into a great deal of detail about our MAT program, which to date has served more than 250 residents a week in our custody. Um, since we began MAT in our, in our provider, excuse me, in our facilities in July 2019, more than 640 people have received treatment and have released back into the community. Uh, and they haven't just released back alone, they've released with a continuity of care plan in place that includes both treatment and counseling, MAT treatment and counseling. Um, individuals in taking with the MDOC are screened for substance use and mental health concerns. If after the screening, it's determined that the resident is appropriate for substance use disorder services, a comprehensive and longer clinical assessment is done, uh, in, in which case MAT may be discussed. Uh, currently, MDOC has available buprenorphine products and Vivitrol for individuals coming into the DOC. MAT, excuse me, methadone is also available. We can maintain methadone if they're coming in on it. We're actively examining options for becoming either a DEA regulated approved opiate treatment program, as many of you have heard us talk about before, or potentially contracting with ones that we can make methadone more available. The MAT program, which we began in July 2019, started with just four facilities, and it was incredibly helpful for that first cohort, although we recognize that there were limitations, mostly related to length of sentence. 
So in 2019, we expanded our MAT services to all adult facilities and to a larger group of residents who met medical eligibility. In February of this year, we announced that our goal was universal access to MAT for all residents medically eligible, regardless of length of stay. We thought we would have this in place by November of this year, but we are really excited to be able to announce that we think we'll be able to meet universal access to MAT for all residents in our facilities medically appropriate by the summer, which is going to be a first correction across the country in corrections. We certainly appreciate all the partnerships and shared commitments that this committee and many others, including the governor, Gordon Smith, Dr. Jessica Pollard, have been instrumental in making sure that we, the MDOC, can prioritize this life-saving medication. Of course, we appreciate you, Representative Warren, and thank you for bringing this forward. Uh, we certainly look forward to working with you during the work session and off, off mic to talk a little bit more about some of the language, but we are, we are here, we're committed, and we're looking forward to, to supporting this. Thank, thank you. Right on the ball here. Three minutes, good. But you didn't have to, okay, yes. Thank um, you, Anna. Any questions for, I would presume, uh, Anna Black or Robin Hodges? Um, Ms. Hodges, is, did you wish to present testimony or are you here with technical answers here? Here for technical answer support. Okay, thank you. Um, let me just take a look here, make sure. I have Representative Pickett, followed by Representative Morales, and then Representative Luckner. Good morning, Anna. Just wanted to find out if you will be providing your written testimony to us. Sure, uh, Representative, it's already been submitted. I see it on the board, I see it in the queue, but uh, the testimony itself is not there. Maybe it'll show up later, but I saw your name, but I couldn't open it. We'll make sure, I'll, I'll double check. And if not, we can email it in. Thank you. Yep. Representative Morales. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Hodges. Um, I really appreciate the work that you are doing in collaboration um, on this issue. I'm really intrigued by what Dr. Gallagher was talking about with alcohol use disorder. Um, and since we know that that, I mean, I've been listening to public health professionals say that 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 issue has been persistent over the years um, at about seven to eight percent of our population and really it's about one percent of our population with opioid use disorder. So I'm wondering what are the screening protocols for alcohol use disorder and what are we doing inside um, corrections um, to treat that that's consistent with the standard of care in the community. So I can take that question. Thank you for the question. It's a very important question and one that um, Representative Warren asked me last time I was uh, testifying regarding uh, medication assisted treatment. And so let me talk a little bit very quickly in our system. We are, when someone arrives into our system, we are looking at substance use disorders across the board. And so we're not just focused on anyone who just has an opiate use disorder. Right now, there's some focus on that as we expand our MAT program, uh, which will then sort of collapse into our sort of general SUD programming. So individuals are screened at the front door and then we complete a more lengthy SUD assessment, which then kind of determines diagnosis, treatment need while they're inside the facilities. Um, and then we get them connected with either individual or group therapy. Um, and in some cases we may do that in an outpatient setting or we may refer them for residential treatment. Um, so across the board, we're treating individuals who have all SUD disorders versus just being exclusive for any particular disorder. Um, and we also have, for individuals who have alcohol dependence, we also have utilized um, Vivitrol and other medications for them. And if I could have one follow-up, Madam Chair? Yes, go right ahead. Thank you so much. Um, that's great to hear. So the screening tool does include alcohol, alcohol use disorder as well. Um, and what percentage of the population screens for all substance use disorder? And maybe let's go last year and the year before. And then you, if you don't have that, maybe if you could provide that to the committee going back. Um, when did you, well, first of all, if you, maybe when you started doing the screening, um, can you tell me when that was? Absolutely. So the screening has been, we use uh, the Texas Christian University um, screening tool, which screens for all SUD assessments or SUD disorders. Um, and that's a very kind of broad screening tool for SUD. It's evidence-based. Um, and that's been in place actually um, 
uh, WellPath has had the contract since 2012. So before that, I don't know exactly when, but I can tell you at least since 2012, it's been in place as a screening tool. Um, and now it is part of, since 2015, it's part of the mental health intake uh, process. So that way it's given to the resident at the same time as the mental health intake. So we get more honest answers, I'll say. Um, it was given separately from the mental health intake for a long time, but we found that it's increased our um, honesty around need for treatment and um, reporting out some of the issues that the residents have that they felt like they didn't really want to report on a screener when it was so low. Mm, that makes sense. And I don't have numbers off the top of my head, um, but I'm happy to provide that to the DOC to get that to the committee. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, Representative Luckner. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Ms. Black, Ms. Hodge, Hodges. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, in, in previous sessions, we've heard about uh, the, the substance abuse disorder treatment that's happening within DOC. It sounded really comprehensive and, and just like, you, you know, WellPath is doing an excellent job, um, which I'm pleased about and certainly a big supporter of providing more treatment. So uh, this bill, I assume it, it would mean that WellPath is going to bring on some more counselors and things like that. I just, I'm wondering, um, I, I, I guess I would like to see within WellPath, like, you know, how many counselors we have devoted to substance use disorder treatment and, you know, what sort of equipment and basically just, yeah, personnel, you know, staffing and equipment that would be uh, related to this. And, and I just want to get a overall breakdown of, um, you know, what WellPath is doing when it comes to this. Thanks, Representative Luckner. Um, I guess two things. One, we can get the breakdown of employees the WellPath employees, DOC employees, who's doing what? I, th I think we've sent that or different different iterations of that, but we can send that again specific to this bill, no problem. Um, but I'll just note that we don't see this bill per se as needing an increase in staff. So I, I don't know that that, I, I, don't, I don't quite follow that. So maybe maybe you need to explain that a little bit more or maybe the answer is simply, we don't see this bill as-, as okay. Sure, thanks. If that's the answer that this bill doesn't require an increase in staffing or anything, then that, that's interesting. Um, and I guess uh, one other question, if I may, Madam Chair. Yes, go ahead. Yep. Um, so I guess I'm just seeing, I'm checking some stuff out here. And so there are only six mental health providers in the state. Is that correct? That's I don't I couldn't answer that question of how many mental health providers there are in the state. Okay. Um, and do they do you allow for telehealth? Are the counselors all telehealth right now? Yeah. There is okay. we can allow for telehealth. Okay. Good to know. Thank you. Uh, Representative Morales, your hand is okay. You have yes. another question? I do, thank you. Um, it is around the providers. I know you did provide it to us and I'm sorry, I don't have it at my fingertips, but what I remember I thought was that we have six staff members on within WellPath that are actually physically pre present in the system and then the rest are all telehealth. And it's so just wondering is that um, those folks who follow up with the counseling side of MAT and, and substance use treatment, um, is that telehealth or how does that work? Yeah, um, I can't answer the question of the number because I don't have that in front of me. So let's let me make sure we verify that. So we're just so that we're not talking about incorrect numbers. But I will happily let Robin if she'd like to answer the question about how telehealth is working inside currently. Yeah, just a, a clarifying question: Are you asking about providers who are prescribing the medication, or are you asking about counselors? I guess both. Yeah, sort of. I had to think where I, I'm. I'm following up with Representative Luckner because I wanted to get a picture of what does your 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 um, your infrastructure, your healthcare infrastructure, look like um, as we provide these services for folks. And I think I remember that there are six providers, actual bodies in the state of Maine, and so wondering how how many of those are devoted to. Um, substance use uh, treatment, and then do you add to that telehealth 
to augment um, the counseling piece that goes along with it. Gotcha. Yes. Yeah, so our, we have, um, now trying to count off the top of my head, that sounds about right, but Anna will confirm our staffing, but um, our providers are the ones who are primarily seeing individuals for the medication piece. And then within so we're, we're a large medical and behavioral health team. And so that's their sort of piece with the team um, is that they provide the medication intervention. And then we have a team of both mental health counselors and SUD counselors who provide the actual counseling and treatment. And then they all work collaboratively together having weekly meetings and discussions. And are those folks telehealth? So some of the providers do provide telehealth. Obviously COVID has been a challenge for us and transitioning between facilities. So we do do telehealth um, and it kind of just depends. Uh, some, depending on our COVID situation, depending on distance to the site, we use tele um, pretty much at most of our facilities if I'm going off the top of my head. Okay, so yeah, the, so the mental health team is mostly um, not in state, but they are telehealth. All of our providers are actually in state, but they'll be, a lot of them will provide tele from one site to another. Okay. We just have one provider who's actually out of state. Sorry, I just want to add, I think that the issue is that sometimes we have providers who need to be at Mountain View, for example, but then they need to see a client at MCC on the same day. So that's, that's part of why the telehealth is in place and why it's working so that we can, we can have residents being seen on different days at the same facility, excuse me, at different facilities. Okay, thanks. Yeah, if you can resend the document around like all the staff of WellPath and what their duties are, that would be great. Thank you. Any other questions? I don't see any other hands. Thank you both um, for providing that information. Um, I now have, um, the three people that I listed as they came in, Marshall Mercer, Tina Natto, and Caitlin Robbins. Dear Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and distinguished members of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. My name is Marshall Mercer, and I am an organizer for Maine Recovery Advocate Project. I am also still a student of recovery and was once a slave to this very system. I'm here to testify in favor of the LD663, an act to make comprehensive substance use disorder treatment available to Maine's incarcerated population. I was just in a group with some of our incarcerated population on Zoom that was about to enter back into the system. While in this group, I could hardly refrain myself from letting go of every tear in my head. While listening to their concerns, the greatest fear is knowing that they are being released back into the belly of the beast, which any networks, without any networks, set up or treatment in place and that just breaks my heart that anyone would ever feel that way. Leaving a facility with no connection or networks or without the right medical treatment could be life or death for someone with substance use disorder. And the fact that they were so afraid that they didn't even want to leave their own imprisonment in fear of the slavery that awaits them on the outside, that speaks volumes to me. I believe we can do better than this and not just the system, but we as the people. But we as the people come to you kind of folks because we need your help. Understanding we all have a part to play and we are willing to help out in any way to assist this mess. If this bill were to pass, there would be coordination with representatives of local recovery communities, medical providers, and other appropriate persons to offer case management. Traditional and peer support, medication management, reentry planning, and comprehensive treatment options to clients after release. I bet there would be less fear and more results. And when I look around this room, I see people that look like they're like results. Thank you very much for your time. And I'm available for any questions that I can answer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mercer. Um, any questions for Marshall Mercer? Seeing none, thank you again. I now will um, welcome Tina, Tina Natto. Welcome. Good morning, Senator DeChambeau. Um, and thank you for having me today. Um, my name is Tina Natto. I'm here today on behalf of the Maine Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, and I am the executive director. I have submitted written testimony. I'm not going to repeat that testimony. I'm going to pick up on a thread of something that was mentioned quite early on by Representative Renicki, and that is people on the outside having access to treatment. 
Obviously, Mattel supports this legislation. Our clients who are incarcerated need this support. They need the services. They need the treatment. There comes a point, though, when we're talking about sentencing and presenting arguments to prosecutors and judges where the increased availability of treatment inside prisons actually cuts against our clients if that treatment is not available also in the community. Basically, the argument is this. Well, Ms. Natto, if your client needs treatment, they can go to Wyndham and get treatment. So I think it's important to keep in mind that we have to have high quality, excellent treatment available in the community as well. Obviously we support everyone having access to treatment, but if it becomes lopsided, we fear that that can be used as an excuse to incarcerate. Medically accepted best practices inside are wonderful, but they will never be of the same sort and quality that you can find in the community because imprisonment itself is traumatizing and very triggering to people who are struggling with substance use. So yes, let's give them all the help and treatment they need on the outside, but let's not forget on the front end and the back end, how important it is to make sure that all services are funded for all people who need it. So thank you to Representative Rudnicki for bringing that up and for obviously Representative Warren's advocacy on this issue. And I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, I see Senator Shanway, go right ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Tina Neto, I really appreciate you, uh, your perspective on that. I, I, I've been listening and I'm just kind of asking, yeah, I, I think this is a great uh, thing to, that we get people out and get them be productive and that's great. I just wanted to know from your perspective of how we get people to um, change their perspective because I was listening to some and, and there must have been a turning point in their life that made them want to get treatment because some don't want treatment. And that's what I'm, how do you measure that when you, you know, you, you go into sentencing or anything? I, it's, it's just kind of curious to me how, how it works <clears throat> because, you know, I worked, I worked in the jails and I was in law enforcement and it's just, I, I saw where some just didn't want treatment and then there was others that wanted it. And where does that turning point seem to be in, in their lives? So thank you for the question, Senator Sirway. That's a really hard question. Um, every person is absolutely different. And in my role as defense attorney, it's my job to advocate for my client's position. It might not be what I agree with, but if they're not in a point or if they don't see the necessity of treatment for their particular circumstance, I can't advocate for that. That would be a violation of my duty to my client's interests. Um, and on the flip side, if my client you know, does seek treatment or, or wants that to be part of the consideration for sentencing or for diversion, that's something I'll fight tooth and nail for. But it really is something that the client, him or herself has to uh, make for themselves. And, you know, I have to support it in advocacy, whether or not I agree with it. It's just, that's the duty of a lawyer. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions of Ms. Natto? Seeing none, thank you again. Uh, and I now have uh, Caitlin Robbins. Welcome, Caitlin. Hey there. Um, so I am just chiming in here as a person. I am part of the Main Recovery Advocacy Project. I'm also a person in long-term recovery, but I use Vivitrol, which is the naltrexone for um, opiate use disorder. So I'm really just here to talk about how effective that is. Um, so I had gotten, started my recovery journey in November, 2015, in which I stayed clean with no medical assisted treatment for four years. 
And then I returned to the place I used to use and I ended up using an overdosing, um, at which time I needed to figure out a better option. So I had engulfed myself in the community, but also I re-engaged in substance use counseling, re-engaged in a psychiatrist and re-engaged with everybody. And part of my medical recommendation was to get on Vivitrol because I did not want Suboxone. Um, Someone had mentioned prior that um, like having an opioid addiction and then using an opioid to treat it um, can be problematic, I feel. Um, I also am a recovery coach in Caribou and I have to just attest that a lot of people that have opiate use disorder that use Suboxone do struggle with um, like using that prescription as prescribed. And for me personally, I knew that that was going to be an issue I ran into was abusing the Suboxone. So the Vivitrol was really great because it's monthly. I can get it every month. It's a shot. I don't have to worry about taking it every day. Um, it works. I haven't relapsed in two years. Um, I go to my nurse, I get it. It's easy to get prescribed. As someone said, like my primary care can prescribe it, my psychiatrist, um, my OB even could prescribe it. So it's very easy to access for me and it's been amazing. And there's no withdrawals. If I don't get it at the 28 days, if I can't get it for a week or two, um, it's not a problem. Also where that came in handy was I just was pregnant not that long ago and I was able to the last month um, not get my shot because it was affecting my body. Um, it just hurt my hip. So I didn't get it. Um, so that was really great that I could come off it for that month and not have side effects. Um, and I also want to speak as to the comprehensive part is, as I mentioned, I am a recovery coach. And I think that the people that get that support in jail then have the community support when they leave. And if they are leaving to a different area, I know myself personally and where I work, we work really hard to connect people to services before they um, re-enter. So having that comprehensive like recovery coach in the jail and being on MAT other than Suboxone um, will help to connect people when they get out to the community. And I'm at my three minutes. So that's, that's really all I have to add. If you guys have any questions, I'm definitely open for that. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, it's always good to hear that from someone who's gone through that. So I appreciate your testimony. Anyone have any questions for Caitlin? Seeing none again, thank you, Ms. Robbins. Thank you, guys. Um, so do we have anyone else that wishes to speak in support? If not, I will go to... Um, Ms. Faye, do we have anybody in, um, in opposition? Um, Raise your hands, please. Seeing no hands. Okay. Anyone wishing to provide testimony neither for nor against the bill? I see one hand. All right. Actually, it disappeared. <laughs> okay. Okay, they're back. I'm going to bring them over. Thank you. Mr. Publica, Mark Publica. If you are speaking, could you unmute? We don't see you. Yes, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I'm, okay. I'm playing with my wife's computer. Um, uh, good, mor good morning, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and other members of the uh, Criminal Justice um, Public uh, Safety Committee. I'm a physician. I'm an addiction medicine specialist. I practiced addiction medicine for over 40 years. Um, I'm testifying today on behalf of the Northern New England Society of Addiction Medicine in support of LD663. 
Um, um, there, there is so much that I'm, it's difficult to follow all of the wonderful testimony that's already been given, so I apologize for repetition. So we know that well over 40% or 50% of incarcerated population of substance use disorders, um, and for which there are effective uh, treatments rather than a character disorder. We know that um, brain, these disorders are brain diseases, which rob um, those affected of voluntary control over the intake of alcohol and um, other drugs. I think this is important. There actually are changes in the brain associated with addiction that actually change and rob people of voluntary control. Uh, the consequences of untreated substance use disorders is grave. Continued progressive addiction um, to um, uh, cut the consequences of um, continued addiction to um, drug use, criminal uh, recidivism, life-threatening uh, infections, ruin lives, and overdose deaths. The overdose death rate, and this is important, for people who are untreated at release is over 100 times that of the general population. The actual number is 130 per, uh, times. So when we worry about overdose death rates in Maine, um, there's uh, one major uh, factor. Um, fortunately, there are the three um, effective FDA approved medications. Uh, we've heard speak about buprenorphine, methadone, and, and naltrexone slash Vivitrol. Um, I want to say that the literature on methadone for um, 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 and its effect on criminal um, justice is extraordinary. It goes back to the 1960s. Um, in fact, um, um, I'm running out of time, so let me go faster. Rhode Island screens all inmates for opioid use disorder and provides medications for uh, MAT for those who need it. Comparing six month period before the program was implemented to the same period afterwards, the study showed a 61% decrease in post incarceration deaths. That was a decrease of 12% of the state's overall um, overdose death rate. Um, a large percent of inmates have alcohol use disorders, especially naltrexone in the form of Vivitrol is extraordinarily effective. To give you an idea about medication treatment of alcohol, there are approximately 9 million Americans who meet diagnostic criteria for alcohol. In any given year, there are fewer than a quarter million prescriptions written for uh, any of the three FDA approved medications. Um, um, Treating addiction as diseases as, um, with proven um, effective treatments will decrease personal and social harm. My medical society is going to be submitting um, a written support as well, and I urge you to uh, support this important bill. Thank you, Dr. Publica. Any questions? Um, Dr. Publica, I want to be clear. Uh, you spoke in support of the bill, correct? Oh, very much so. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah I was locked out, so I couldn't find, find a way in. <laughs> That's fine. We took it. Great. All right. I'm not seeing anyone else that wishes to provide testimony. Um, I now will close the public hearing on LD663. <laughs> the work session will be uh, April 30th, a week from this Friday. Um, we are not going to be here next Wednesday. Uh, that will be a session for all legislators at, in Augusta. At Madam the, Chair. Um, Representative Pickett. Uh, yes, uh, I wondered instead of going into another uh, public hearing, if where well, we got a we got quite a few for the rest of the afternoon and another one with a lot of uh, testimony, I wondered if we might uh, break now until twelve thirty for lunch and then work right through hit the afternoon and work it right through. Um, I frankly don't have any objection to that. It might be a little smoother either way. Um, so, um, Representative Warren. I, I was um, looking a little bit ahead and um, the next bill only has the sponsor and two people signed up to testify. So if people can hold on for another half hour, might we cross off one more bill and that might make the after lunch slog a little easier. It's gonna be a long day, but I'm open if that, if people need to go now. 
I'll, I'll point out the sponsor is here waiting in the room. Okay, well, I have no objection to that. If we can, we can go ahead with that one as long as we break after that one. That sounds good. It looks like it'll be a quick one, Representative. Thank you. I see the next one. Oh, I frankly, my next one was going to be LD ten thirty five, but and that's Representative Castain, but. Uh, you're right, we're doing um, numerically. So are you looking at 758? Yes, I am, Madam Chair, okay. thank you. Let's do that. We'll see you again, Representative Castain. <laughs> um, so 758 is the next bill. Resolved to study streamlining the background check process for state licensed professions that require background checks. And that is Representative McRae. Welcome. Thank you very much. I really appreciate jumping me in here. I've got I've got committee at one myself. 1230 would have been pushing, pushing all of us and you guys would have had a longer afternoon. I'll be quick. Uh, anyway, good morning, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and the very honorable members of the Joint Standing Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety. Uh, you guys are starting to look familiar to me. Uh, anyway, I'm Representative Dave McRae. I live in Fort Fairfield. I represent the nine communities that comprise House District 148 up here in the center of Roostick County. I am visiting you to present LD 758, a resolve to study the background check process for state licensed professionals that require background checks. Now, I think we all <laughs> can say we hate red tape. We hate paperwork. We hate all this stuff that gets in our way. And if ever there was a bill, I've been after this for well, all three terms, really. And uh, it sort of got put off and, and uh, uh, moved up to the next session, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, what this is going to do is it's going to take all of these people that require background checks from all kinds of reasons. I mean, we're not talking about their license. We're talking about a background checks, their background checks to get a license. Like for me, it was I needed a background check to get my teaching certificate. So there are a lot of people, if it's just me and just a teaching certificate, get your background check, get your certificate, go teach. But if I have other things that I need certificates or background checks for, I'm, I'm put in a spot where I got to do it three and four times if I've got three or four things like that. So currently there are perhaps dozens of background checks required in a multitude of state departments and agencies across this country or the, and this state. This bill will streamline the background check process and make it more efficient for both state, the state and the citizens. It will diminish all associated duplicative and unnecessary paperwork, ultimately reducing overall expenses to the state and certainly to the applicants. Uh, if they have to pay for these several times, I mean, a background check, I was gonna say it's a, ba a background check is a background check is a background check, it isn't. What you need to be a state police officer is a much more in-depth uh, background check than what you would need to be a teacher or maybe a state park worker or what have you. So there may th this commission may find that it's gonna be a tiered program. If you get the, uh, the top level, we'll say state police, I suspect, okay? Which has some federal implications. Uh, that would be the ultimate background check. Well, seems to me that that would cover you for everything below that. And if you were to get one for a teacher, well, that certainly wouldn't make it so that I'm qualified background check wise to be a police officer, but it probably would be sufficient to make me able to work at a state park in the summer. So that's kind of the whole idea. I have a neighbor who is a teacher, a hunter safety instructor, a whitewater river guide, and is a, and soon to be a trapper all of which may or may not require background checks. This bill, LD 758, is a resolve that will establish a commission to simply consolidate as many of these background checks across the, as many departments and agencies as possible. LD 758 proposes that the commission be composed of the commissioners of education, inland fisheries and wildlife, health and human services, as well as administration and financial services or their designee or any other departments that, that we may find between now and the work session that probably should be, should be included. 
the com this committee, your committee, may wish in its wisdom to include members of the 130th legislature. The whole objective here is to just find out what is it we need and let's, doing, let's stop doing all the unnecessary red tape paperwork and, re and redundant work uh, and, and save some money. We're still gonna have to pay fees for licensing. We're gonna have to pay fees for certificates. That's not where this is, but there is also a, so an associated fee uh, with background checks. And I don't know that the state actually does those. I think those are probably farmed out, which won't cost the state anything. It'll save people money and won't take anything out of the general fund. So I wish to thank the committee for affording this opportunity to present this bill. And I'd be most happy to answer any questions that you may have as you explore this uh, proposal. And certainly will welcome any, uh, almost any uh, uh, amendments that get suggested between now and the work session to make this thing happen. Thank you. Thank you. I would remind the members because I have to be reminded also, as you were speaking, uh, Representative McRae, I was writing a whole bunch of questions and I thought, that's not the bill. The bill is asking for a commission to ask all those questions or else we would be here another half hour. Um, the only thing I see that we may have some concerns or recommendations at the work session is the membership. So that's something you'd be willing for us to um, add on if we needed to. You know me all too well. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, I, I'm, I'm looking to make this, uh, this is the kind of bill I like working on the most. In, and, and not because it's so terribly important, but it's just something that's, that's just common sense. And anything that you or uh, your analyst, Ms. Orberton, or, uh, or what have you, have to suggest you have my contact information. And I would be happy to roll with almost any direction that we can go, because I think this is, a, this is just a good service to the citizens of the state. OK. And, and for all the members, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to limit that for the work session, if you have a suggestion. but. Uh, the nickel and diming of, of all of it, I think that can wait for the commission. So, uh, Senator Searway. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I just, uh, I was thinking about that too, but I, I wanted to ask the question if you had talked, uh, Mr. McCray, if you had talked to public safety or, or, uh, or the academy where they do the, you know, background checks like and fingerprinting, uh, uh, if that could be condensed without a commission. Uh, I, I, I think it, it, it's possible. I have talked with, uh, well, it's one of the twin brothers, Brian or Bruce Scott, regarding uh, some of this stuff. Uh, the one that's in administration more get a hold of me I mean, and I can never keep twins apart anyway. <laughs> separate. They always get me. Uh, and those two look so much like it's scary. Anyway, uh, I think that the commission is something that we, we really should consider. Uh, and certainly uh, that aspect would be critical to, to the situation. Uh, but I'd like to see the process so that I don't have to go through the Department of Education to get my background check to be a teacher. It ought to be a centralized thing. Uh, and, and I think that's the aim of this, this, uh, uh, this bill, this resolve is to let's get this streamlined. And, and if there's a way to do it in one of the departments, that's great. But the problem might be that they would forget some, that, oh, wait a minute, that's gonna be a problem for state psychologists in a particular uh, uh, facility or what have you. Uh, so uh, keeping it fairly broad, I think might encompass all of them and not have to have it be done again. So I really right. appreciate right. the question. And if that'll do it, I'm fine with that too. Thank you. Any other questions of uh, Representative McRae? Well, this is the second bill I've heard from you, Representative McCray, and they are so right on. So um, 
I guess it must be the water up in the county that makes you think well, like that. <laughs> I got my snow tires on off this morning and it's snowing like crazy right now. <laughs> uh, All right. But I'll be back. I'll be back for a couple more later. Thank you. Okay, thank uh, you guys. Anyone here, uh, please raise your hand if you wish to speak uh, in support of this bill. Seeing no hand, Senator. Thank you. Um, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Please raise your hand. LD758. Again, seeing no hands. Uh, anyone wishing to speak neither for nor against LD758? I am bringing one person over. Okay. Mr. Rule, Matthew Rule, welcome. Hey there, good afternoon. Uh, members of the committee, my name is Matt Ruel. I'm the director of the State Bureau of Identification at the Department of Public Safety. And I provide this testimony on behalf of the department as neither for nor against LD758. SBI serves as a repository uh, of all criminal history information in the state and provides criminal history for law enforcement and public purposes. I understand the frustration that some have in needing multiple background checks for different job types. Um, that said, we provide hundreds of thousands of background checks uh, requests each year uh, and receive very few complaints. Within that large number of requests, um, each year we have a smaller subset of fingerprint uh, state and FBI background checks that are completed, which is roughly 30 or so thousand checks per year and it's growing. Um, as I discussed with the sponsor, I'm happy to work with, with anyone regarding consolidation uh, or places to gain efficiencies. Um, but I can say that fingerprint-based criminal history checks um, and those requirements are tied to federal law and they're governed by the FBI requirements and rules that are established under something called the National Compact Council. Um, these federal requ uh, requirements are very clear that they can only be used for one purpose, um, or a specific job type or a license type. So as an example, if a person who's applying to be a foster parent, um, they would need to have a, a federal check done. If that person also wanted to work with tax documents, they'll be required to have a check done for that purpose also. So SBI is prohibited from using the same results for both purposes. On the state side, um, we may be able to do something to streamline the process there but we run into issues such as criminal history is only good the day that you run it. There's timeliness issues. Um, money's collected by, by state agencies that may support their operations. Um, so if we change the current process and allowed um, in some way state criminal history to be used more than once, there, there could be a negative general fund uh, revenue issue. But the biggest problem we may run into um, is, is, is that name-based checks aren't based on a biometric. So um, for example, how would I know if John Smith who applied to be a foster parent is the same John Smith who months later wants to work with tax documents or be a main guide? Um, also, if the request didn't come in at the same time, how would I know if the person wasn't charged or convicted during the time period between those requests? So to, to conclude, um, you know, those are just some of the issues that I, I, I could envision as we went through this process. I, I appreciate the sponsor's desire to look at gaining efficiencies in our process, and I, I discussed that with him. Um, I'm happy to work with any of the state licensing agencies should this pass, um, and I'd be happy to attend any work sessions, uh, answer any questions, and work with the committee as needed. Thank you. Well, I thank you. Uh, you've touched upon all those questions I wasn't going to ask, but that's exactly what the purpose of the commission would be. And um, Mr. McRae, I think Mr. Rule would probably be the person that you need, you need in that commission. <laughs> so um, very well said. Thank you, Mr. Rule. Uh, any questions for Mr. Rule? Is it Ruel? That depends where you were raised, how the pronunciation is. It, it is Ruel, so I appreciate okay. that. Thank you. Okay. Um, 
Mr. McCray, you had your hand up. Did you want to ask or say something? Well, first of all, I, I, I very much appreciate what uh, Matt Ruel just spoke of. And I had been in touch with one of the two Scott brothers. And it turns out I was thinking of them on another issue. And it was Mr. Ruel that I talked with earlier <laughs> when he said, when I saw uh, you show up, Matt, I'm thinking, oh, no, it was him. No, it wasn't the, it wasn't the Scott brothers. So anyway, my apologies for that. Okay. I won't hold that against you. It's, it's been a long session, so I understand. Yeah, they're, they're pretty good guys. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. You know, um, I, I'll make a comment, Mr. Ruel. Everything you said, if we can share that information, this would probably result in other legislation down the road just to tighten things up. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm sure that we're all going to be talking quite a bit in the coming weeks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, seeing no questions, uh, I don't believe there's anyone else wishing to speak, neither for nor against. I nope, will then see no hands. Okay, thank you. I will then uh, close the public hearing on LD five uh, seven. No, what is it? 758 and again uh, the work session will be a week from when uh from friday this coming friday um i think we've got those scheduled in the afternoon all right well uh there's been a recommendation and it's it's uh 1209 um i'm looking at the people who are in augusta um What's a good time to come back? 1240, maybe? Or 1245? Uh, yeah, 12, 1245 would be fine. Okay. We shall return at 1245. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much.
We're all ready. Yeah. How are we doing? Not bad. Just want to let them know we're all ready. That includes me. We're all ready. <laughs> this one, this this one, we're going to have to stay on point on this one because we got eighty some people in the queue. I don't know how many people's going to be speaking, but we'll be here till midnight if we don't uh, keep yep. this thing going. Wow. I agree with you, Richard. If we can just make sure that they are specific, clarifying questions about the proposal. Right, and no, uh, and the three minute clock, hold them right to it. And the other thing is, if they come in and they start speaking to the same thing as someone else, if they don't have something new, keep them moving. I think I'm gonna mention also, I, we may have received dozens and dozens of cards, haven't we? Have you, yeah. uh, you guys? Yeah, I have. I haven't seen any, but I haven't been down to our. I haven't checked my post office here. I've gotten quite a few. Yeah. So uh, I, I will preface that by saying we're very familiar, and yeah. we thank the people. Yeah. Yeah. That's one way for my postman to know what I do for a living. <laughs> yeah. And just. Right. And just. Uh, I want to hear fun. from everybody, though. I think it's important no. for us to to say no, that we we want to hear from everybody that's here we're the ones that can shorten it up we can either make it really long by debating with people we all know where we stand on a lot of these issues we can either make it long or we can just keep our ears open and listen and hear from our constituents and the people of maine that's what i yes. want to do and, and save the questions, questions for the work session yeah qualifying questions if you need, if you need it, from what the testimony was. But other than that, just move on. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. Six. <clears throat> I just need one more person. Uh, because there's such a large crowd, all I'm going to do is ask you to identify yourself. There he is. Uh, <clears throat> so. Uh, I got to wait for Deb, if that's on YouTube. Yep, it doesn't turn off. Okay, good. Yeah, we're all set. Uh, right. Good. Well, welcome. This is the afternoon portion of um, <clears throat> Main Criminal Justice uh, Committee. And uh, it's Wednesday, April 21st. I will have the members introduce themselves, um, starting with Representative Warren. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Charlotte Warren, and I represent the city of Hollowell and the towns of West Gardner and Manchester in the House. And, <clears throat> excuse me, Senator Sinway. Good afternoon. I'm Senator Scott Searway and represent District 16, which covers Waterville, Winslow, Fairfield, Benton, Albion, Clinton, and Unity Township. And Representative Pickett. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. My name is Dick Pickett. I represent District 116, the towns of Canton, Dixfield, Hartford, Mexico, and Peru. Thank you. Representative Pluker. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> My name is Bill Blucher. I represent Warren, Hope, Appleton, and part of Union, House District 95. Thank you. Representative Costain. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Dan Costain, District 100, which is part of Adner, Dixmont, Newport, Plymouth, and Corinna. And Representative Luckner. Good afternoon. I'm Grayson Luckner. I represent part of Portland around the Four River Sanctuary in Jewel Falls. You can see behind me, formerly of Camden. Thank you. Uh, Representative Rudnicki. Hi, I'm Shelly Rudnicki, and I represent House District 108, which is Fairfield, Mercer, and Smithfield. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I'm Senator Susan DeChambeau, Senate Chair of this committee, and I represent Dayton, Lyman, Alfred, Arundel, Kenny Bellport in my hometown, I should say city, uh, surrounded by towns uh, of Biddeford. Um, 
I I don't see her, but for the public, Jane Orbiton is our policy analyst. She'll be joining us. And Deb Fahey, uh, that box you see with the LD759, that's the bill we're going to be discussing. Um, Deb Fahey's our committee clerk. And so we shall begin. Um, LD759, <clears throat> an act to amend the child endangerment laws to include certain unauthorized access to a loaded firearm. And the sponsor is represented due to, I, I not had to say that one, um, from Camden. Welcome. Thank you very much. Nice to be with you all. Um, greetings, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, members of the Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety. I am Representative Vicki Dudera. I represent House District 94, which includes the towns of Camden, Islesboro, and Rockport. I'm here today to present LD 759, an act to amend the child endangerment laws to include certain unauthorized access to a loaded firearm. This bill amends the main criminal code to specify that storing or leaving a loaded firearm where a child is likely to gain access to that firearm and the child in fact does gain access to the firearm and uses it, is considered endangering the welfare of a child. I have a small but significant sponsor's amendment and it's attached to um, my name on the testimony page there. Um, this change came about after many discussions with advocates for suicide prevention and it is found at line 15 in the bill. We are eliminating the words recklessly or negligently to ensure that an adult could be charged in circumstances where a loaded firearm that was accessed by a child or teenager was used to attempt suicide. Current law states that a person is guilty of endangering the welfare of a child if that person permits a child to enter or remain in a house of prostitution. A person's guilty of endangering a child if that person sells, furnishes, gives away, or offers to sell furnish or give away to a child under 16 of age any intoxicating liquor or a tobacco product. A person's guilty of endangering a child if that person furnishes air rifles or gunpowder, smokeless powder, or ammunition for firearms. I think we'd all agree that those are dangerous behaviors that put a child in, behave in peril. LD 759 adds to this list with another potentially lethal situation leaving a loaded firearm where a child could access it. This amendment is needed now more than ever because the sad truth is that children in our state do access loaded firearms with tragic implications. And there are more firearms than ever in Maine homes since the pandemic. Tragedies such as the death in August of 2018 of Parker Stevens, an eight-year-old Oakland boy who fatally shot himself while handling his father's shotgun in the family home while his mother and siblings were downstairs. Or the death in 2017 of a five-year-old girl from Belfast who took her father's loaded handgun out of a backpack and shot herself. Or the 16-year-old boy who accidentally killed himself with a family member's handgun while video chatting with a friend at his home in New Sharon last year in August. Or the tragedy in January of this year in Waterville, the seriously injured two-year-old Evan Hood when one of his siblings shot him with a gun found in a closet. How do children access these guns? A minor's not allowed to buy a gun. Children get them in their own homes because the adults in charge are not safely storing them. Sometimes children bring loaded firearms to school to show their classmates. Just two weeks ago, an elementary student brought a loaded gun to school in Richmond. Back in 2013, a four-year-old brought a loaded handgun to his Hallowell preschool. These are just a few of the near misses with loaded guns, guns that children are able to find in their own homes. And then there's main scourge of teen suicides. In Maine, 90% of gun deaths are suicide. In the US, it's 60%. In the past decade, Maine gun suicide increased 50% compared to just 13% nationwide. We have gun suicide in every county in our state. 
and a rising rate of youth suicide, as you will hear from others who will testify. Suicide attempts by children are often impulsive acts, but if they gain access to a gun, they're nearly always fatal. Just last week, a 15-year-old child in Freiburg accessed a firearm and fatally shot herself. If we make it harder for teens to access loaded guns, we may save these young lives and we're gonna prevent the incredible heartbreak that families and communities across our state experience every time a child gets a loaded gun. These horrible accidents, of accidents affect us all from Caribou to Camden, from Belgrade to Bar Harbor, everywhere in between. And as many other states have recognized, they can be prevented by the safe storage of firearms. 27 states, including New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island, have taken action to prevent these types of tragedies. They've recognized that easily accessible guns in the home are associated with accidental shootings and teen suicide, and they've put access prevention laws in place to hold gun owners accountable for the safe storage of their firearms. These laws have been shown to be effective at reducing suicides and unintentional firearm deaths and injuries of children. But here in Maine, we have no such provision. We have no laws requiring that in homes where there are kids, that guns are stored safely. Two years ago, when I came before this committee with a state safe storage bill, I was told that we don't want to create any new crimes in Maine and it would be better to amend the child endangerment statute. I listened. Today, you will hear from folks in medicine, law enforcement, and our judicial system, mothers, fathers, grandparents, all who welcome this change because they believe it will make Maine children safer. You have the nuts and bolts of the bill before you. You know that it provides a number of affirmative defenses to the crime, including that the firearm is stored in a locked box or a gun safe, the child uses the firearm in self-defense or defense of others. The person has no reasonable expectation that a child would be on the premises and the firearm attained by the child is as a result of a crime. All those things are built in. But here's the important takeaway. This legislation represents an opportunity for this committee, an opportunity to help stem the rising tide of suicide in young Maine people, an opportunity to change the culture around safely storing and securing firearms where children are concerned, an opportunity to keep kids safer in their own homes. And finally, an opportunity to clearly and unambiguously spell out in statute that having a loaded firearm where a child can get it is wrong and that adults who do so should be held accountable. Thank you, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, any questions of Ms. Dudema? I, I have one question um, of section two, number three, when you said you wish to remove that whole line, 15. No, it's simply, thank you for the question, Senator DeChambeau. Um, no, it is simply the words, um, recklessly okay. let me just find that. So it will begin discharges the load of firearm. Right. And all we're crossing off is recklessly or negligently. Okay. Yes. Thank you Thank for the you. question. Seeing no other questions, um, I will then ask the public or the people, the attendees, those who wish to speak in support of this bill, please raise your hand and the clerk will let you in. Uh, three or four members at a time. Senator, Senator Williams, Representative oh. Millet is, is waiting to oh. speak. I'm sorry. Representative Millet is in the you waiting know to speak. What? Yes, and I've been so good. Why did I forget this time? Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yes, so I am going to ask if there are any co-sponsors or representatives or senators legislators who wish to speak in support of this bill and welcome um, Representative Millett. <laughs> Sorry about that. No worries, Senator. It's very okay. good to see you. 
Good afternoon, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and esteemed members of the Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety. I am Representative Rebecca Millett, and I represent House District 30, the community of Cape Elizabeth, in the main House of Representatives. I can't express enough how strongly I feel about the worth of LD 759, an act to amend the child endangerment laws to include certain unauthorized access to a loaded firearm. As both a long serving member of the Committee on Education and Cultural Affairs and co founder of our Children's Caucus and current House co chair, I am honored to be presenting this testimony before you today. It is no surprise that children are curious creatures. Their curiosity is what allows them to explore, learn, and grow. This interest in the enticing objects around them can lead them to easily get a hold of something they shouldn't. We often install childproof cabinet and drawer latches and place childproof locks on our medicines. We do this because we recognize their endless curiosity and we want to protect our children from danger. Children are attracted to objects just out of their reach and tragically there have been countless incidences of children gaining access to a loaded gun this way. The negligent storage of firearms, which can threaten the life of a minor, must have consequences. It is evident that in 2021, action needs to be taken to protect our children from finding out what a gun can do and prevent needless tragedies. The bill before you concerns the rudimentary safety of children and teens, and it addresses a gap in public health. By passing this piece of legislation, it would encourage Maine parents and adults to store their loaded firearms safely in order to protect our youngest citizens. A new study by the Journal of the American Medical Association found that across the nation, around 7% of adult adolescents lived in a household with at least one gun that was stored unsafely. In addition to this, the study discovered that approaches that will, discover that approaches that will motivate adults who live in homes with youth to store firearms safely may prevent up to 32% of firearm deaths. While some data suggests that gun owners with children in the home are slightly more likely than other gun owners to store firearms safely, roughly 4.6 million minors live in homes with loaded unlocked firearms in the US. That's 4.6 million children at risk of ending the lives of themselves or another innocent victim. How many of these children live in Maine? Studies show that between 70 and 90% of guns used in youth suicides unintentional shootings among children and school shootings perpetrated by shooters under the age of 18 are acquired from the home or the homes of relatives or friends. An act such as LD 759 would aid in, the removing, in removing the risk of children and teens accessing loaded firearms, as well as preventing such tragedies like teen suicide. As was mentioned earlier by Representative Dara, suicide is the second leading cause of death for Maine youth aged 10 to 24, and firearms are the most prevalent method used in teen suicide. This statistic is heartbreaking, and as something so simple as the safe storage of loaded firearms may have saved the lives of those who acted impulsively when a weapon was available to them. And um, my testimony includes the real life tragedy in Waterville and I, I won't um, go through that part of my testimony. This legislation is about saving children's lives just like we do with smoke detectors, seat belts and car seats. Today, 30 states across the country have implemented a child access prevention law. It is vital that Maine follow suit and moves forward to protect our children. As a community, it is our duty to keep the next generation of Mainers as safe as possible. Thank you for your time and consideration. I look forward to working with you to pass this important piece of legislation into law. Thank you, <clears throat> Representative Millett. Uh, any questions, uh, Representative Millett? Millett, I go out. <laughs> Excuse me. Seeing none, again, thank you. Um, I, uh, there are more, I'm sure. Uh, I don't see anyone coming up here. Um, Sam Please Zager. Please raise your hand. Sam yeah. Zager is in the room. I have to, let me find him. <clears throat> We're still asking for representatives, right? Legislators, I should say. <clears throat> yes. 
but there are there are uh, 28 hands up, so it's hard to find them. Okay. Uh, Mr. Zagger, is it? Yes, it is. Thank you, uh, Senator. Uh, okay. Are you a representative, uh, legislator? I am. Uh, let oh, me wow. change. Welcome. My... See, this is part of COVID. We never get to meet each other. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, go right ahead, uh, Mr. Zagger, representative. Thank you. Thank you, Senator DeChambeau um, and Representative Warren and other esteemed members of the um, committee. I am Sam Zaker. I represent District 41 in Portland. I'm here to testify as a co-sponsor of this bill. And, and to be clear, uh, this would not restrict a person's constitutional right to have or use their firearm. Rather, it would uh, make sure that exercising that right is done judiciously and safely. As a physician, I wish that there were no need for LV-759. I wish there were no fatalities in Maine due to the accidental discharge of firearms, but there are. So we must do what we can to drive that as close to zero as possible. Accidents are the number one cause of death among children. If we wanna make the death of children or adults by uh, take, take the death of children or firearms, of children or adults by firearms safely, then we would want to take reasonable steps in that direction. LD759 does that by addressing stewardship and safety. In the military, I was in the military for more than a decade, we learned over and over again that minimizing fatal accidents required having a culture of safety. For instance, military law, standing orders, and procedures constantly reinforced the message that we had to be ardent stewards of firearms and the ammunition. A vote in favor of this bill would contribute to that culture of safe gun ownership in Maine. And some would may, may rightly say that Maine is a relatively uh, is, is already a safe state for firearms, and I am grateful to every fellow Mainer who safely stores their firearms. Although we must realize that one quarter of parents in gun owning households don't even know that their child handled a gun in in, the, in their house, and this has already been testified to. I also would point out that even though the U.S. military has, it has, uh, also has an excellent record of firearm state safety, it still painstakingly emphasizes it. Maintaining a culture of safety requires constant vigilance. This bill, though, is not merely a qualitative step towards that culture of safety, as important as that is. It, rigorous quantitative research suggests that it also makes sense. One study found that over four out of five uh, youth in firearm suicides the weapon was owned by a parent or other relative. Another uh, study showed that a group of biostatisticians estimated that a law like LD759 would reduce youth suicide and unintentional death by up to 32%. That's a staggering improvement. 2019 study found that legislation indeed can make children safer. This was a state by state uh, uh, cross, cross the nation comparison uh, of over 21,000 children 21,000 children, 21,000 children who died over a five year period in this country from un, un, uh, accidental firearm. States with stricter gun laws had lower pediatric firearm related death rates. Put in another way, fewer children dying by firearm. Isn't that what we all want? Thank you very much for your thoughtful consideration. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> any questions of uh, Representative Zega? Seeing none, again, thank you for your information. Appreciate thank you, Senator. It. Um, we must have others. <laughs> I see no other sponsors. Shall okay. I start with the in favor? Yes. Yep, thank you. Those who wish to speak in support of this bill, please raise your hand. All right, I have three. I will recognize uh, a name I'm familiar with, um, Jeff, the Honorable Jeff Gratwick. Welcome. 
Mr. Gratwood, Dr. Gratwood, can you join us? If not, I will go to, um, I saw, okay, I will do Joan Sterling. I missed, oh, excuse me, Jessica, I didn't see uh, your name. Jessica uh, Schomburg. No problem, thank, thank you. you. Hi, I'm Dr. Schomburg. Thank you to the Committee of Criminal Justice and Public Safety for the community for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Dr. Jessica Schomburg. I'm a resident physician and I live here in Portland, Maine, and I'm training in internal medicine and pediatrics. And I also give my statement on behalf of Dr. Amy Bukowski as well, who is a hospital-based pediatrician living in Freeport, Maine, and a board member of the Maine chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. We stand together in support of LD759 because we feel passionate that promoting the safe storage of firearms can help to save children in Maine from accidental and intentional firearm injuries. Working with children is one of the greatest gifts. They're smart, resilient, hopeful, and our conversations with our patients are about their dreams for the future and about the family and the friends that they love. As pediatricians, we believe it is our job to heal and support children through illness, to preserve their potential and their ability to continue dreaming. But a moment in a risky environment can take away all of that potential. In 2019, 10 children in Maine died due to firearm injuries, but that only tells part of the story. The patients we have managed that sustain non-lethal firearm injuries are some of the most extreme and disheartening examples of lost potential in our careers. And it's not one face or story burning brighter than the rest. Each patient's outcome is equally devastating, whether it's a toddler victim of an accidental firearm injury or an adolescent victim of a self-inflicted firearm injury. There's lost ability to walk, lost vision, well, lost potential to develop normally. What's going on, yes? New mental health diagnoses. Um, new mental health diagnoses an irreversible change in damage to the family dynamic. These are just snippets of what's possible when a method that is so lethal and damaging is left available to those who are most vulnerable, our children. The time is now. We have to penalize those who knowingly endanger Maine's children. Medical research has already established that safe storage of loaded firearms will save children's lives without affecting the rights and liberties of gun owners. A recent study in the Journal of American Medical Association found that approaches that motivate adults who live in homes with youths to store firearms safely may prevent up to 32% of firearm deaths. So in just one year here in Maine, that is three lives, three children in Maine with potentials unrealized who could have reached adulthood, gone on to have families of their own, had meaningful careers and a hundred other significant life moments, now all lost. Yes, children are smart and resilient, but they are also curious and impulsive. As pediatricians, one of our many roles is protector, and we urge you now to stand up with us and protect the children of Maine from senseless and impulsive injury and death. A vote for LD759 is a vote for Maine's children. Thank you. Thank you. Right on the button. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Any questions for uh, Dr. Schomburg? Uh, Representative Pickett. Yes, I don't have a question for the doctor, but I forgot to ask. I, I don't see uh, the sponsor's testimony in the queue. Uh, I see where they send over the amendment under under the re good representative's name, but will we make sure we have that testimony? Uh, Representative Dudua, you have, you wanted to add to that or? Yes, I was just going to thank you, and, and uh, you're correct. I, I wasn't able to successfully upload two, but I just went and uploaded the testimony also, so I'm checking now to make sure it's there. Thank you, though. I appreciate okay. it. Okay, you're welcome. Uh, we're all set with the questions for uh, Dr. Schomburg. Seeing none, I will then turn over to, and I will use the term honorable Jeff Gratwick. Nice to see you. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Senator DeChambeau. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Good. Thank you for your apologies. I live in, um, my name is Jeff Gratwick. Um, I'm a retired physician, retired legislature, 
a, a very loving grandparent. I live in Bangor, which is far, far away. And thus, internet sometimes has a hard time getting here to Bangor. But it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm going to speak a, a personal uh, perspective. Young children are helpless. As we all know, childhood in humans lasts longer than any other animal because so much time is needed for our development. There's so much for us to learn. Our kids are helpless when they start out. They need protection, absolute and complete, for their first years, and then less so as they develop, but they still need the adults around them to protect them. Good parents protect their children. A well-ordered society protects its children because they are its tomorrow. Our American society makes laws about kids, car seats, corporal punishment, smoking in cars, parental abuse, schooling. We have a state agency here that deals with child abuse and child neglect. You all confirm its importance for our kids by voting on its budget every other year. We can all imagine actions on the part of parents and neighbors that we think would be neglectful. If we, quote, see something, we say something, unquote, because we have decided as Mainers that our children, our most precious resource, must be given at least the chance to pursue life, liberty, and indeed the pursuit of happiness. The bill before you today represents common sense. It does what I'm sure each and every one of us would do to protect our kids. It does what we'd want our neighbors to do when our kids are playing at their house. It requires safe storage, no more, no less. I urge you to support, and it's a great pleasure to be with you again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone have any questions for Dr. Bradwick? Seeing you. Thank you. Thank you again, Jim. I will now recognize um, Joanne Sterling. Thank you. Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and members on the Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety. My name is Joanne Sterling. I'm from Peaks Island. And I am reading a testimony for Barbara C. Arsenal from, from Rumford, Maine. She says, thank you for the opportunity to testify for LD 759. I'm a resident of Rumford and my legislatures are Representative Josanne Doloff and State Senator Lisa Keum. A couple of towns over is Rep Representative Richard Pickett and I appreciate his service on this committee. I'm a retired high school guidance counselor and volunteer advocating for veterans through my membership in the American Legion Auxiliary. I am the rural engagement lead for Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense and live in a gun owning home. I support the second amendment. With this background, I am testifying for LD 759. The hardest part of my job as a guidance counselor was losing students due to firearm suicide. The young people who have died in the schools I have worked in and in my community have been honor roll students and from loving families. A crisis to them would be a crisis that we as adults would know would resolve itself in time. It might have been a breakup or not getting to their dream college. Whatever the case, what they did have in common was easy access to loaded and unlocked firearms. This is what allowed for a moment of impulsivity during a hard time to turn into a tragedy. We must, as a society, do more to encourage safe, safe storage. Maine has a long history of responsible gun ownership Safely storing firearms should be a hallmark of being a responsible gun owner. LD 759 will set this benchmark for our state. Our military veterans hold unique respect for firearms as they know the great responsibility that comes with firearm own ownership. The VA is working on encouraging veterans to make safe storage of firearms a priority. The video titled Veterans Crisis Line Firearm safety starts with many veterans are well-versed in firearm safety, but that doesn't mean their families are. Also promoting safe storage is the newly created Maine Safer Homes Task Force. Amongst members are Maine CDC, Maine Bureau of Veterans Services, and VA Maine Healthcare System. The brochure has a section titled, Making My Home Safe, with descriptions of various locks and safes. Within Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense, 
I meet monthly with other military family members and veterans who advocate for veterans to focus on the same training, safety, and accountability that was part of their firearm standards during active duty. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Ms. Shirley. Any questions of um, jo Joanne Sterling? Seeing none, again, thank you. Thank you. Um, I will now recognize Camilla Shannon. Oh, you're muted. You want to unmute? Go right ahead. That's Representative Cooper. Oh my gosh. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Wait I'm not a sure. You uh, didn't think we'd let you in if we knew it was you? What is <laughs> well, that might be part of it. But no, she's my friend and next door neighbor, and I could not find the link. So okay. I asked her to send me hers. So okay. I apologize for the confusion. So uh, yes, I am former Representative Janice Cooper. And um, as you know, I used to be part of this uh, distinguished committee and I thank you for, for letting me speak to you today. If I was there in person, I would have brought treats, but as it is, you will have to just accept my, my words. Um, I am here to support uh, uh, LD 759. We discussed a similar bill in the last legislature, but time and political concerns killed that, a time, that, that attempt to save children from carelessly stored firearms. I'm pleased that the sponsor, Representative Dodera, paid close attention to the details that derailed our earlier efforts. As is often the case, the devil is in the details and often opponents focus on details for opposing gun safety measures. Here, we have a carefully crafted bill that targets real world circumstances. And those details are, uh, in this bill appear primarily in the affirmative defenses that have already been discussed. Um, in, the news in the newspaper accounts of accidental shootings by children that have stained Maine's history and ruined lives, the owner of the weapon was either careless or clueless. I say clueless because I remember reading a column by a gun owner sta stating that safe storage bills would be unnecessary if only parents would educate their children about the dangers of guns. His children, he assured readers, uh, 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 would never dream of touching his firearms nor searching for them. But I say that he is clueless because although he may know more about guns than I do, he knows apparently less about children. They are instinctively curious and despite warnings, they will prowl through forbidden drawers and shelves. They just do, as any parent knows. Most observant parents will acknowledge this and take the uh, safety precautions that are outlined in this bill. Moreover, there's a host of respected studies, some of which have been alluded to, that demonstrate that at least a third of children know where guns are stored in their homes and admit to having handled them. That there aren't more deaths because of that is only a matter of luck. We cannot and should not leave it to children to police themselves. This bill also would protect older children from the leading cause of their deaths, suicide by firearms. If safely stored, an impulsive teenager will be stymied from killing himself or herself, and it's mostly boys. Uh, survivors of suicide attempts tell us that the impulse to kill oneself is impulsive. And if barriers exist, the moment will pass, or at least enough time will be bought to deal with the underlying problem. Having lost a child, I can tell you that there is no greater tragedy to befall a parent, none. So let us take this modest step to save a family from a horrific fate. I also wanna say that this committee uh, which I was so so pleased to be a member of, is at a crossroads. 
last in the last legislature, we we uh, reviewed a number of vitally important bills that unfortunately, because of the pandemic, uh, never reached the floor. But you have an opportunity uh, this year and next to move forward on this bill as well as other bills that will protect the public. If slavery is the is the is the ultimate um, original sin of this country, the prevalence of, of firearms in so many homes is is a stain that is growing and, and endangering more and more people, particularly uh, the innocent, the children of our society. So I ask you to think of your child, to think of your grandchildren and pass this bill, even if you think you know how to keep your those uh, individuals safe. Other people are very careless about it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cooper. Uh, any questions? Seeing none, um, thank you again. Thank you. I will now recognize Erin Belfort, Dr. Belfort, I believe. Thank you. Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren and members of the Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety. My name is Dr. Erin Belfort. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist at Maine Medical Center in Portland, and I'm a resident of Cape Elizabeth. I've been practicing child and adolescent psychiatry in Maine since 2012. Prior to that, I attended Middlebury College, the University of Vermont College of Medicine, completed a four-year general psychiatry residency at the Harvard Longwood Training Program, and a two-year fellowship in child and adolescent psychiatry at Cambridge Health Alliance. I speak as a concerned citizen, a parent, and on behalf of my employer, Maine Medical Center, and on behalf of the Maine Council of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. As a psychiatrist, losing a patient to suicide is a risk in my profession and the worst possible outcome. As you've heard, suicide is the second leading cause of death in youth ages 10 to 24 years old. According to CDC data, suicide in youth increased 56% in Maine from the years 2007 to 2009, compared with the years 2016 to 2018. Almost half of these suicides are from firearms, one of the most lethal methods one could use. Suicide is most common in children with depression or mood disorders. However, impulsive suicide attempts can occur in those with no known history of mental illness. There are usually no second chances given the lethality of this method. From a developmental standpoint, adolescent brains are only partially wired. Their frontal lobes in particular continue to develop into the mid twenties. This is the part of the brain that is responsible for imagining future consequences and planning. Adolescents are wired for impulsivity. Data on survivors of a suicide attempt demonstrate that impulsivity plays a large role 40% contemplated suicide for less than 20 minutes. Removing access to high lethality means like firearms gives young people time to think, to reconsider, to make another choice. The risk of dying by suicide is higher in homes with firearms. This risk can be decreased by reducing access to the ways children can harm themselves. There is nothing more painful for me as a psychiatrist and as a parent than sitting with a family who's lost a teenager to suicide. In the midst of their grief, they're racking their brains with guilt. How did I miss it? How did I not know? I recently sat with a young family member who was the first to respond after the shot was heard. They were struggling with the trauma of intrusive memories, telling me through tears, they're not sleeping. They continue to see the blood, the brain matter, the bone fragments, the gun on the floor, the shaking of the body. It's horrific and it's preventable. This young person who died by suicide will not graduate high school. They will not feel the quick impulse of first romance. They will not go to college, get a job or become a parent or grandparent. Please vote in support of LD 759 to require the safe storage of firearms, which will help reduce accidental death and death by suicide in youth in Maine. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Belfort. Uh, Representative Pickett, you have a question. 
Yes, Madam Chair, I was just wondering if the good doctor could provide her testimony. I see her name in the queue, but I don't see the testimony. I would be happy to do so. Thank you. Any questions, Dr. Goldfarb? Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Um, I've got Sarah Staffieri. Yes. Okay, <laughs> go, welcome. Great, thank you. Um, Senator Deschambeau, Representative Warren, and esteemed members of the Joint Standing Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety. My name is Sarah Staffieri. I live in Waterville, and I'm a mom to two children, a seven-year-old son and a four-year-old daughter. I'm a volunteer with Moms Demand Action and the Show Up Now or Sun Network. I'm here today to testify in favor of LD759. I think we can all agree that one of our greatest responsibilities in life is caring for and raising children. I believe this responsibility extends beyond the individual parents and home to include the efforts of our state leaders, such as all of you here today on this committee, to draft and pass laws that foster safe and healthy communities for our children. This bill will offer a level of safety that I believe is missing from Maine's legislation. With rights comes great responsibilities. Safely storing firearms is a simple common sense act. LD 759 is a common sense measure um, that we can easily agree on. Loaded firearms should never be accessible to children. Allowing this to happen is negligent, dangerous, and to certainly be illegal. My own town, Waterville, has experienced a disturbing number of gun tragedies and accidents in the last few years. Representative Dudera mentioned some, but there were many others there's no time to talk about. Most recently, a neighbor's two-year-old child was accidentally shot in the head by his brother, a child the same age as my son. This news certainly shook me, but it has also motivated me as a parent to come here today to speak openly to you about how concerned I am about gun safe storage. To be clear though, these concerns are not new to me. I have had panicked thoughts about dropping my child off at a friend's house to play. What if there is a gun within reach? Before my children enter any home, my husband and I always ask if all firearms are secured, but that doesn't feel like enough. I've talked to both my son and daughter many, many times about what they would and should do if they encounter a gun. My son always gives the perfect answer now. Never touch the gun, run away and tell an adult. I know mom. This response allows me to exhale in relief for a moment, but I always go back to questioning how this coaching would translate if Gabriel or Natalie were given an actual opportunity to hold an unsecured weapon. Studies confirm my worst fears. No matter the amount of education a child receives on gun safety, most children would be curious enough to handle a firearm. And I believe mine fall in that category too. In a study published in Developmental and Behavioral Pediatrics, researchers found that when young children are unsupervised, they frequently touch and play with real guns even after receiving clear and specific instructions not to do so. It is painfully obvious that the responsibility is on us as adults to prevent the child's encounter with the weapon in the first place. LD 759 does just that by ensuring the safe storage guidelines of loaded firearms are strengthened here in Maine. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions um, for Sarah? Representative Morales? Uh, yes, thank you. And thank you, Sarah. Uh, as a mom of young kids, um, I just want to say I hear you have and I have very similar concerns. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to call you Sarah, so I don't really mess up your last name. Okay. Um, you brought up something that has been mentioned before this bill was heard. Um, and it's in section one. Um, being the parent, foster parent, guardian, or other person having the care and custody of a child. I'll stop there. Um, the question was brought up, and um, I'm, I don't know if I've ever heard this, but you, if you drop your children off at even a family member's home that don't have children or your neighbors don't have children, for you to ask if their firearms are safe, stored safely. Um, that's one way. But this bill does not address um, if a child goes and visits a neighbor and finds a gun next to the bed, the nightstand or something. Um, so I probably should have saved that question for the sponsor. But um, do you have a comment about that? 
Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I feel like I have many levels of concern and probably the biggest is him at a friend's or my daughter's at a friend's house where there's another child present. Um, and there's an unsecured firearm in that home. Uh, and so I feel like that would fall under the guidelines of this, of this uh, mm -hmm. bill. But I do, I mean, I definitely have concerns about the, um, for instance, my parents keep an unsecured firearm in their nightstand. Mm -hmm. Every time I walk into their house, the first thing I have to say is, is the gun put away every time. And it kills me, you know, I'm scared. What if I forget once, you know? So I think there's more work to be done in other places, <laughs> but um, for this specifically, I do understand that there may be, if you know, if you don't have a child in residence, then, you know, um, but I'm really concerned about, especially in Waterville, my area, you know, all these kids are accessing guns and how am I able to tell which family really has it secured or not if there's not clear endangerment guidelines. Thank you for your answer and your testimony. Um, I now will, uh, oh, let me see, I did have you. Um, Nicole Palmer, followed by Casey Moss and then Polly Frawley. So Nicole. Thank you, can you hear me? Yep, very okay. well. Thank you. Uh, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and members of the Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety. My name is Nicole Palmer and I live in Bowdoin. I have been an educator for almost two decades and I'm also a professional classical musician. I speak to you today in, sport, in support of LD 759. Because I have attended two other hearings in recent weeks about gun safety bills, I am now familiar with the strategy of NRA influenced members of the committee and the community and NRA paid lobbyists whom they usually invite to participate in the work sessions on the bills. This strategy of creating as much noise as possible around any bill designed to prevent loss of life by guns has little to do with truth or integrity and even less to do with protecting public safety. So to the members of this committee who care about both truth and children, I beg you, when the same people who last week claimed that we can't protect victims of death threats from gun violence because Maine is already the safest state in the nation, but who this week claim that dangerous intruders are likely co to come into Maine homes at any moment, and so we need loaded guns within grasp of everybody, including the children, please know that they are feeding you this disingenuous garbage because A, the NRA has spent a lot of money to send you that message. B, the NRA wants to keep making money from feeding you that disingenuous garbage. And C, they are hoping that you don't read the part of this bill that says that if you have the weapon on your person or within your inches of your grasp such, such that you could keep it away from a child, you will not be held liable under this bill. So in other words, the ability of adults to protect themselves is not in jeopardy from this bill, not even a little bit. What this bill does is join 29 other states who have enacted safe storage bills in recognition that the state must take action to protect children. Protecting children, keeping children safe is what this bill is about. And that's why you are seeing before you today so many people who have literally devoted their lives to protecting children. From pediatricians to law enforcement professionals to so many teachers testifying today that I've lost count. The people who are advocating for this bill are the same ones whose sacrifices on behalf of children know no bounds. The same people who will put themselves between a disturbed teen who brought his father's weapons to school because they weren't locked up and their terrified students. But they shouldn't have to do that. And you have the power to prevent it. Please take this sensible and constitutional step that is proven to save lives before we lose even more Maine children to, the, to guns than we already have. Vote ought to pass on LD 759. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, any questions for Ms. Palmer? Seeing none, thank you again. Thank um, you. I have Casey Moss, Dr. Casey Moss. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, Senator De DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and members of the Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety. My name is Dr. Casey Moss, and I am a child psychiatrist at Spring Harbor Hospital, and I'm a resident of West Bath. I'm providing testimony today in support of LD 759. As the daughter of the owner of a sports center, I feel I have a unique perspective on the tradition that so many families share regarding firearm ownership. 
I cannot recall the first time I used a firearm, and I can also not remember the first time I received guidance on firearm safety because in our home, you did not have one without the other. I have many beautiful memories with my family at our shooting range. It was a place where my dad instilled in me essential values such as discipline, responsibility, and accountability. I learned at an early age to respect the lethality of firearm and the ultimate responsibility of gun owners to keep themselves and those around them safe. My dad passed away in a car accident my senior year of high school, and it was easily the most excruciating experience of my life. I'm sure most of us here can imagine, um, most of us here can relate to the pain felt when a loved one dies suddenly. And when it's an accident, it's hard not to imagine all of the things that we or others could have done to prevent it. I cannot imagine a pain greater than losing a child. And yet there are so many parents each year who do related to intentional and unintentional gun deaths. This bill is an opportunity to prevent these violent deaths and the devastation their loved ones experience as a result. I think it's easy to get lost in the polarizing politics of talking about restrictions and firearms. However, this bill is ultimately talking about firearm responsibility, not restrictions. As a child psychiatrist, I have spent time with so many patients who did not die by suicide because their mode of attempting was not fatal enough. They couldn't find an easy way to hang themselves. Someone saw them approaching a bridge. Someone found them before the medications took effect. Yet with access to a loaded firearm, these children would have died, and so many do. There are so many unpredictable variables that result in a child attempting suicide, and we cannot control all of them, but we can limit access. As firearm owners, it is our responsibility to prevent children and teenagers from accessing loaded guns we should be held accountable when it's not the case. Please vote to pass LD 759. Thank you, Dr. Moss. Any questions of Dr. Moss? Thank you again for your testimony. Thank, Thank you. you. I now will recognize Polly Frawley. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and distinguished members of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. My name is Polly Haight Frawley and I live in Cumberland. I'm a parent, I'm an attorney, and I, I don't own guns, they frighten me. I am testifying in support of this bill. Um, and before I get into my testimony, I wanna thank you all for, for considering this important legislation. When I testify on proposed gun safety legislation, I usually hear two questions. Well, what problem are you really trying to address? Or, well, we don't have that problem in Maine. And the problem addressed by this LD is the public health crisis of pediatric firearm mortality. In 2017, gun violence accounted for more than 500 deaths of young children children ages zero to 14, a 50% increase compared to 2009. In addition, we know that between 70 and 90% of guns used in youth suicides and shootings are acquired from the homes or the homes of relatives or friends. Only three in 10 households with guns in which children are present safely store their weapons. So to be clear, the problem is that children are dying because a large majority of gun owners are not safely storing their firearms. And it is a public health crisis we have in Maine as demonstrated by the tragedies that took place in Belfast in 2017, in Oakland in 2018, in New Sharon in 2019, and in Waterville in 2021. It is a public health crisis we have in Maine, as also demonstrated by the fact suicide among Mainers, aged 10 to 24, is the second most leading cause of death, and the use of firearms was the most frequent method. Maine ranks seventh in the country with respect to the number of youth aged 12 to 17, having at least one major depressive episode. Mental health problems have only grown during the pandemic, and as you know, the number of guns in Maine has only grown as well, a 50% increase over 2019 as reported by the FBI. 
Laws requiring self-storage can help address this crisis. They work. The majority of states have adopted them. I refer you to a study by the Rand Corporation, June 2020. The data shows we have a public health crisis. This crisis exists in Maine and there are legislative means to address it. This LD is particularly important because in Maine, one can acquire a gun with no safety training or proper storage instruction required. Thank you so much for listening to us all and I urge you to support this LD. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Frawley. Any questions of Ms. Frawley? Thank you, thank you again. Um, now I have Camilla Shannon. Is this the real Camilla Shannon? Okay. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and distinguished members of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. My name is Camilla Shannon, the real Camilla Shannon. I live in Yarmouth. I'm an educator and the mother of three children, one of whom you may have just seen. I am here today in support of LD 759, an act to amend the child endangerment laws to include certain unauthorized access to a loaded firearm. This bill, if made law, will save the lives of Maine children by preventing accidental shootings and suicides. 4.6 million American children live in homes with unsecured firearms. Most parents assume their children don't know where the guns are stored, yet studies show that three out of four children do. They know exactly where the guns are located. To anyone with children, near children, or who know children, that is to everyone, this shouldn't be a surprise. We all know how curious children are. They open drawers, explore closets, peer into boxes, look under beds. Of course they know where the guns are. Safely stored firearms, locked, unloaded, stored separate from the ammunition, mean that children's natural curiosity doesn't imperil them or those around them. Of course, it's possible that nothing will happen to a child who stumbles upon a loaded firearm, but kids are curious. They pick things up and they play with them. And in the case of an unsecured firearm, the consequences are often tragic. Let's not forget the Waterville two-year-old who was already mentioned today. Um, LD-759 would help save other Maine children from that fate. LD-59 would also protect Maine children from suicide. As we all know, means matter. Firearms are the most lethal suicide method. Youth suicide attempts are often impulsive. Nine out of 10 children who attempt suicide go on to live happy and productive lives. If we can help children survive a suicide attempt, odds are they'll be okay. Therefore, LB 759, which encourages caregivers to safely store firearms, will save lives by keeping guns out of the hands of vulnerable, depressed teens. This is very important in our state. Maine youth are suffering from high rates of mental illness. According to a 2019 Journal of the American Medical Association article, Maine had the highest percentage of youth diagnosed with a mental health disorder. Maine suicide rate is consistently higher than the national average and suicide rates ranks as the second leading cause of death for Mainers age 10 to 24. The coronavirus pandemic has certainly only magnified the problem. Also, while not the primary goal of the legislation, as one other person referenced, LD759 may also prevent school shootings. In 80% of cases where school shooters are under 18, they got their gun from home. To conclude, we lose too many main children to guns. By encouraging caregivers to safely secure firearms, LD-759 will save lives. I urge you to pass this bill because saving the life of even one child makes this bill worth it. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, any questions? Thank you again. Um, I have uh, Hillary Koch, followed by Dr. Edward Walwood. Hillary, welcome. Thank you so much, um, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and distinguished members of the Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety. 
My name is Hillary Koch. I am a former teacher and a resident of Waterville. Many years ago, around nine o'clock at night, someone rang our doorbell. Not recognizing the man on the other side, my husband spoke through the door. The man's speech was slurred and my husband didn't understand him. Uh, thinking that he was trying to sell something, my husband replied, we weren't interested. At that moment, the man began to yell and he started to kick and hit our front door. My brain didn't wanna process what was happening. Despite the fact that my husband was on the other side of the door, the man was trying to break inside our house. My husband turned to me, his eyes were wide and serious, and he said, take the kids upstairs and call the police now. Our boys were six and eight years old and the constant banging and yelling at the door terrified us. I remember calling the police and how they asked me if we had a gun in the house. I remember the regret I felt thinking that we didn't. This man was trying to break inside our house and he knew that my husband was there. If he got inside, he was going to hurt us. The man tried to kick our front door in and as my husband braced his entire body against it, we knew we were helpless. The man broke a window in our garage, but he didn't get in. The police came within minutes and they caught the perpetrator the next day. This criminal didn't make it into our house, but he have violated us in ways that I can never forget. My children slept in our bed for weeks. Up until that point, my husband had been a conscientious objector. He had actually gone in front of a panel in his birth country of Germany to demonstrate as much and did civil service as opposed to required military service. The day after the attempted home invasion, my family and I went out together and I bought a shotgun. I swore that I would never hesitate to use it if our lives were in danger. But LD-759 isn't about using a gun. It's about owning a gun responsibly. LD-759 aims to protect not only children, but also anyone else who could be harmed by what boils down to negligence. Gun ownership brings a certain level of responsibility, and I accept that responsibility. I don't want anyone to pass judgment on my decision to own a gun, or even if I choose to store a loaded gun in my home. If a police officer left a loaded gun out in a way where a child was able to have access to it and it resulted in an accident or worse, resulted in a death, the officer would be held accountable. I'm okay with being held to that same standard. But as much of the focus is on me and how you might hold me accountable, I think the heart of this is really about children. Just like I purchased a shotgun in part to protect my children, this law aimed is aimed at protecting them too. So I urge you to support LD-759. But I wanna make a side note that we use something called the nuisance doctrine to require fences around swimming pools to protect children from drowning. And I think it might be useful or helpful to think about something like that with regard to LD-759. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions from Ms. Cole? Seeing none. Oh, yes, Representative Warren. Apologies, this is my one comment, not question. Ms. Koch, that was um, very powerful testimony. Thank you for, for being here. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for all of you for doing this. Thank you. Okay, uh, Dr. Walworth, welcome. Could you unmute yourself, please, so we can hear you? There you go. Okay. Yes. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Senator Dishenbald and Representative Warren and members of the committee, I'm Dr. Edward Walworth, and I live in Lewiston, where I practiced general surgery at St. Mary's and CMMC for 33 years. I've been retired for a few years now. Uh, in my training at Dartmouth Hitchcock, I took care of in the emergency room, or I tried to take care of in the emergency room, a little six-year-old boy who came in with a tiny little hole in his abdomen. A 22 rifle had been used by his brother and we shot him right in the belly, tiny little hole. The child, it hit a major blood vessel and the child bled out. And I've never forgotten that. There was, no, there was no, he was basically dead on arrival. I'm speaking as a surgeon 
uh, as opposed to being a psychiatrist, surgeons are the recipients of a lot of these unsuccessful attempts at suicide or some of these accidents. And I think that the surgeons in the Waterville case are probably doing a marvelous job of keeping that child alive, but he is grievously injured and will suffer for the rest of his life, I'm sure. I'm here to represent, as a representative of the Maine Medical Association and the American College of Surgeons, both of whom, both of which organizations strongly support this and have for years supported preventive public health measures. There's, public health is a surgical issue as well as COVID and infections and things like that, uh, because surgeons are the recipients of this, of the trauma that we see. Um, in my years in Maine, I've been here for uh, over 40 years now, <clears throat> I've seen and advocated for the installation of seatbelts in cars, making them obligatory, uh, child seats. We all have seats for our children and our grandchildren, and even bicycle helmets, uh, which should be worn by children. We haven't succeeded in passing a law for adults wearing bike helmets, but you get the point. Just like fences around swimming pools, all to protect children. Uh, I'm not going to repeat the statistics that you've all heard. I'm just stressing that we're talking about lives. We're not talking about inconveniencing gun owners. We're talking about saving lives. So for the, uh, on behalf of surgeons and physicians and parents and grandparents, I would urge all of you to support 759. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, the testimony. I was thinking of helmets, seat belts and everything. Uh, it was to save lives and you're correct. Thank you. I now have um, in my list, Joe Longton, followed by Susan Talbot, and then Mark Seeger. So Joe Longton, please. <clears throat> uh, you're muted. Here we go. There you go. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> All right, Senator DeChambeau, Representative <laughs> Warren, and distinguished members of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. I am uh, Joseph Longton, a retired U.S. Army Reserve Lieutenant Colonel and reside in Fayette. Today, I'll be reading the testimony of Miles Kirby, a PhD in epidemiology who resides in Falmouth. His testimony reads as follows. I am uh, Dr. Miles Kirby, and I live in Yarmouth, Maine. I was born and raised in Penobscot County, and I'm a proud Mainer. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I am speaking today in favor of LD 759. I speak first as an epidemiologist and public health professional. As a researcher at Harvard University, I study environments and how to create safer places for children to be born into and to grow up in. Specifically, I study risk factors and behaviors that endanger children's well being, such as contaminated drinking water, poor indoor air quality, and environments that can contribute to unintentional injuries. While the risks of poor environments are often experienced over years and have subtle effects on health, sometimes environments are life-threatening and of an, in an immediate way, such as when a generator is used inside spiking carbon monoxide to fatal levels or when a child has easy access to a firearm. One of the best parts of my job is working to find interventions and behavioral solutions to make homes safer. I collect raw data, design surveys, review medical records, analyze statistics, and try to make sense of what the data says. I also try to listen to people's stories and ideas for change as all too often, it's easy to forget the faces and personal stories represented by statistics. Today, you have probably heard or will hear lots of numbers and statistics about firearm storage, unintended injuries, youth suicides, 
and the success stories of other states that have enacted gun storage laws and saw reductions in gun-related deaths. But you will also hear personal stories. As an epidemiologist, I'm used to looking at data and hemming and hawing, finding different ways data can be interpreted or biased in the first place and dwelling on the ambiguities and uncertainties of research, scrutinizing the pros and cons of different study designs. But when it comes to laws that encourage safe gun storage, the evidence for benefits are clear and compelling. Safer storage works and can reduce firearm-related deaths. The evidence for safer storage leading to reductions in adolescent suicide is especially convincing. Rather than share more statistics. Can you wrap it up there, uh, Mr. Longton? Yeah, yeah, okay, yes, I can. Thank you. Uh, you know, he, he goes on to say that he has a personal story and uh, also uh, is working in favor of the passage of this bill. So uh, I will conclude it there. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions of Mr. Longton? Um, you, uh, I would trust that that testimony is being submitted for us to review and you- yeah, Yes, I have submitted a copy of it. And you can tell uh, Dr. Kirby will read his personal story if he has it there. Thank you. All right. Um, I now have Susan Talbot, Dr. Susan. All the doctors are here today, thank you. <laughs> Oh, you're muted, uh, Dr. Talbot. Let's start again. Oh, good. I Here we go. Yeah. To Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, members of the Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety. My name is Dr. Susan Talbot, and I've been a pediatrician in the state of Maine for over 35 years before retiring from primary care and teaching. I'm also a mother and a newly grandmothered. I am here for all of the above um, capacities today to give testimony in favor of the bill 759, a bill to increase childhood safety through the preventive care in the most practical way in homes in which firearms reside. One of the roles of pediatricians is preventive care via education, discussion with patients and parents around multiple concerns that are constantly in flux as children grow older, become more curious, resourceful, physically capable, and while our older children and adolescents can enter periods of un increased impulsive behavior, some unfortunately will experience true anxiety, depression, suicide ideology, ide um, thoughts, as well as attempt suicide. Add ac access to a loaded gun in any of these scenarios and you have a perfect recipe for tragedy. Remember, a three-year-old can pull a trigger. There are many statistics that have been quoted and I'll only give you a few of them. One of the main ones that's been repeated is in Maine, the second most likely cause of death in the 10 to 24 year old to suicide. Greater than 90% of suicide attempts without firearms fail. And the survivors most often go on to lead productive and full lives. In contrary, nine out of 10 of suicide attempts, if there's access to a loaded firearm, they will succeed. In 2020, a year of infamy with COVID and everything else, it's been, there's been a 20% increase of firearm injury in children as compared to 2019. It's been a perfect storm. It's been a market increase in firearm ownership, many of them new owners and um, owners for personal protection and they can go out of, in Maine alone, I've heard the number 50%, but I think from March to August, it was like up 69% increased number of purchases. And they can leave the store without having any knowledge of how to use or store this gun. There have been increased incidents of depression and suicidality in our adolescents. There's been children spending more time at home with parents who are trying to kind of watch them, but are kind of frustrated by trying to kind of work and watch the children at the same time. Research has shown that an estimated 4.6 million children live in households with at least one loaded unlocked gun. 
and up to 75%, they know where the gun is. I've heard that there are some members of the legislature who ask the question, how many children, childhood injuries or deaths does Maine actually have due to firearms? I would ask back, how many are enough? One, two, a dozen, more? The answer is always too many. My perhaps naive understanding of who our state senators and representatives represent is not just the voters, not just their constituents, but all of Maine's citizens, especially the most vulnerable, our children, and our children, our future. We need to stop political football and vote for the safety of our children, our communities, and our state. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Talbot. Could you give us your residence, please? Where you're from? Uh, in Falm oh, sorry, I'm Falmouth. I'm a Falmouth resident. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Any questions of Dr. Talbot? Thank you. I've never seen so many medical professionals and I want to feel like, I think we all do. We want to thank you for your service, even retired or what have you. Thank you very much for taking the time to come here today. Not at all. It's so worth it. Um, I will next see um, or hear from Mark Siga, is it? Yes, thank you. Okay. Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, members of the Joint Committee, thank you for this opportunity to testify in support of LD759. I'm Mark Seeger, resident of Freeport. I'm a retired teacher. I'm also a school administrator, one who has had a former student, still a Maine teenager, find an unsecured gun and use it to die by suicide. LD759 addresses an important public health issue, keeping children safe. It's been an issue for me throughout my life since I listened to my dad. My father was a disabled World War II vet. In his youth, he'd loved to hunt small game in the fields and woods near his home in rural Virginia. He was badly wounded during the invasion of Lingayen Gulf to liberate the Philippines in 1945. He suffered paralytic injuries that included loss of the use of his dominant right hand. He never told stories to us, his five sons, about the war until we were adults. But he did talk about the dangers of guns that were mishandled, improperly stored, or fired by mistake. There have been gun mishaps among his boyhood friends, gun accidents among his army buddies, incidents of domestic violence involving guns in families near his own. He kept his pistol after the war and sometimes took me to the firing range to watch him practice. As he taught himself again how to write and to shoot with his left hand. It was a ritual that seemed to connect him happily to his innocent years before the war. One day he took the three oldest of us out in his fishing skiff and reaching the deepest part of the bay, he cut the engine and brought out his cherished colt. I just can't be sure that our house is safe with all you boys running around, he said, as I recall. Kids and guns don't mix. And gently, he let the gun slip from his grip and drop to rust away on the seabed. There was a big smile on his face as we headed back to shore, a smile of relief as I came to learn and a lesson I never forgot. I know that not everyone can or should take the step my father did, but I also know that he was right about the dangers to kids. Last year alone, more than 370 children in this country came across an unsecured loaded gun and fired it, resulting in 143 deaths and 243 in, uh, injuries. Deaths and injuries that safe storage provisions together with thoughtful and narrowly defined sanctions like those proposed in this bill could help to prevent. I strongly urge you to support LD759 and to help see it enacted into law to keep children safer for all our sakes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Segan. <clears throat> Any questions? 
Thank you. Um, we may not be asking questions, but each presentation has been unique. There's a common theme and uh, we appreciate uh, this. I now will recognize John Kilbride, followed by Carol Salzberg, and then Chris Campbell. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Senator Deschambault, Representative Warren, and distinguished members of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. My name is John Kilbride. I'm the Chief of Police uh, for the Falmouth Police Department. I'm here today to testify in support of LD759. It is no secret that gun sales have increased across the country, including the state of Maine. Many people today carry firearms concealed during these unsettling times. There is no greater obligation than owning a firearm that can inflict life-altering measures in a split second than finding methods to secure the weapon. This modification of the law identifies the seriousness of ownership by holding the owner of the gun accountable and making reasonable efforts to secure the firearm. In my 25 years in law enforcement, I have witnessed prudent ownership of firearms and those unworthy of this right. Tragedies have been avoided from insecure firearms because of luck surrounding the event. Luck should not be the policy of gun ownership. Accountability must be the goal. Most firearm owners understand and take securing firearms seriously, but all it takes is one reckless person to inflict life-altering measures against the innocents. There must be accountability for those treating ownership in a casual manner. Just recently in Falmouth, a few weeks ago, a person left a loaded firearm in a restaurant booth. Luckily, it was found by an employee. If found by a child, this could have, had, this could have ended tragically. We could take no measures criminally against the person leaving the firearm behind. This bill is a crucial step in recognizing the seriousness of gun ownership, causing pause and reflection to those taking on this responsibility. I urge you for your support and moving forward LD 759. Thank you and I'm available for questions. Great, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> any questions of Chief Kilbride, please? Seeing none, again, thanks. Carol Selzberg. Hi, Senator DeChambeau, uh, Representative Warren, distinguished members of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. I am Carol Selzberg from Elliott, Maine. I am sorry that I'm not a doctor. My mother was, <laughs> my mother was sorrier, uh, but I am here today on behalf of my family and the gazillion uh, gun safety organizations that have had to rise to speak for the majority of us who believe we have at least the same right for gun safety as gun owners have a right to own guns. In less than four months, and I think these numbers need to be remembered every day, in less than four months, and as of yesterday, there have been 12,904 gun violence deaths. They are, as we have heard, the leading cause of suicide in Maine is ninth in the nation in suicides, which as you have also heard, represents 90% of Maine's gun deaths. Unprotected guns in the home result in three times more suicides. There were in 2020, 270 suicides in Maine. We can't treat all depressed or anxious individuals, a number skyrocketing since COVID. We can't save all of the sad or troubled kids climbing out on a ledge. We can't always know what bully at school drove our child to take our unlocked gun to end tomorrow's bullying by ending their lives. We can't guarantee that all gun owners responsibly train their families in safety or have no curious, angry, or depressed family members in the home to worry about. But if you have a right to own a gun, we have a right to expect your safe care of it. We have a right to be comfortable, as has been said many times today, when our kids or grandkids visit your home and will never be able to access your deadly weapons. Should we assume that those who won't lock up their deadly weapons don't value their families' lives as much as they value their guns? Here's the fiction and the argument. If you have to lock up your deadly weapon, you can't get to them in time to defend against a home invader. Nuh -uh. There are several safes out there that open in less than three seconds, some costing as little as $75. You've paid a lot for your gun. Your family's lives are priceless. 
There's no excuse for not keeping killer weapons in a safe place. You always have a key to your glove compartment to keep that bored, curious kid you left in the car for a minute from killing the other kid you left in the car. You've heard all the numbers too many times today that drive the need in Maine. I would ask, why would we have to wait for there to be another two-year-old lying dead in the kitchen because her five-year-old brother found his parents' gun and shot her? Please vote LD uh, ought to pass, LD 759 ought to pass, and we'll all sleep better. And I thank you for all of your service. Thank you, Ms. Salzburg. Any questions? Seeing no hands raised, thank you again. Thank you. I now would um, recognize Chris Campbell. Senator Deschambeau, uh, Representative Warren, and distinguished members of the Criminal Justice and Safe Public Safety Committee. I'm Chris Campbell. I live in Belfast, and I'm a professor emeritus at the University of Maine. I'm testifying for LD 5759 because I'm a grandfather of three children who live in Maine. My grandchildren and all Maine youth are threatened by firearm mortality and suicide. These threats are increased by unsafe storage of firearms in homes where children live and play. LD 759 is a child access protection law. It's a, that's a phrase abbreviated as CAP and it's uh, used across the country in, in the, most of the states in the country that have adopted a CAP law. And uh, the article in the Amer American Medical, Medical Association Pediatrics is mentioned several times and uh, it's a very impressive study by a, an organization that's 173 years old and points very clearly to the efficacy of safe gun storage in reducing uh, death of children and youth. And uh, the uh, title of the article is appended to the bottom of my uh, 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 testimony. And so if you want to look at that article more closely, I'd encourage you to do so. In my view, it's a very rigorous study and uh, points very clearly to the efficacy of safe gun storage and preventing uh, death in children. So generally, uh, uh, this article reminded me of a, a very simple sort of situation we all live with, and that is uh, uh, if you trust your doctor, you follow her or his advice. I trust the recommendation of the American Medical Association Pediatri Pediatrics for safe uh, firearm storage, and uh, that makes a cap law like 759 a very reasonable thing to support. Every state in New Hampshire, every state in New England except Vermont has, has a cap law, and most states in the country have one. Uh, LD-759 is a reasonable common sense law that will save lives. It only takes effect after children get a loaded gun, use it in a reckless or threatening manner or in committing a crime um, or by discharging the gun. This bill would not imperil responsible gun use and under the bill, no crime would be committed so long as the gun was locked, reasonably secured, and there was no expectation that a child would be present in the home. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Chris. I do have a question. You mentioned, except Vermont, what law was that that the other states have? It's, it's called generally a child access prevention law. Okay. And I think, I think almost about 30 states around the country have them, and all New England states except for Maine and Vermont have them. I called the governor of Vermont yesterday to ask about uh, whether they're doing one. And I'm hoping to hear back positively. Great, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, I now would recognize in order Anne Sawchuk, Hillary Shendi, and Melissa Birch. So Anne. Hello, uh, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren and members of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. I am Ann Sawchuk and I am from Cumberland, Maine. I have submitted written testimony, but today I am here to read the written testimony of my friend, Jill Shaw of Cape Elizabeth, 
Uh, and, and that is because Jill is a retired school counselor and uh, has had personal experience. Oh, and thank you all for your service, for your public service. Please support Representative Dudera's bill, LD 759, Child Access Prevention an act to amend the child endangerment law. Law abiding adults have the right to own guns. Those same adults as parents have a sacred responsibility to protect their children. There have been several incidents of injury and death of children in Maine. In January of 2021, a two year old boy was shot in the head by a sibling who found a firearm. These tragedies not only affect the victim, but traumatize the extended family, friends, teachers, classmates, and the community at large. My personal experience involved my work as a school counselor. A youngster who I worked with found a rifle and literally blew his face off. My daughter went to school with him and I knew his family. Please support this bill to protect children from unsecured guns by holding adults accountable. And as I said, that's from Jill Shaw of Cape Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, I don't see a show of hands again. Thanks for that testimony. Um, I now have Melissa Birch. Hi, my name's Melissa Birch. I'm a Hi, I'm Melissa Birch. I'm a pediatrician. Um, uh, th th thank you, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and the members of the Committee on P Criminal Justice and Public Safety for giving me the opportunity to speak. I'm also speaking on behalf of the American Academy of Pediatrics, the main pet chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. The experience that sparked my interest in safe uh, firearm storage was uh, occurred Shortly after I became a pediatrician, when I was called to the emergency room to see a two-year-old who had been shot in the leg, her, she and her siblings were left alone in the vehicle very briefly. And while the parents were out of the pickup, uh, her five-year-old brother reached under the front seat of the car, pulled out a loaded handgun and uh, discharged it. The child ended up being okay. She went to the OR and was stabilized. Um, and when I came out, uh, when I was um, finishing writing up my case, I, uh, um, I wondered aloud to one of the other doctors, who would leave a loaded gun with kids around? I, I was stunned when he looked at me and said, I always have a loaded gun. You never know when you might need one. This incident remains vivid for me even this, this long ago. The shooting did not happen in Maine, but it could. Maine kids do continue to be at risk when, adult, when the adults without around them don't store guns safely. There are two distinct groups of guns of, of kids that are at risk, and I think other, other speakers have alluded to this. The younger, curious kids are the first group. Many of you are parents and you remember talking with your family, family physician or pediatrician when the kids were little. How are the medications stored? Are your outlets covered? What kind of car seat are you using? The safe firearm storage is, is a routine part of this conversation. I have that conversation every day with families, but still not every firearm is stored safely. We're all aware of the recent tragedy in, in Waterville. We have a similar case in our practice where a, a child survived a shooting uh, at age four, but the gunshot wound to the, le to the neck left her permanently in a wheelchair. Her family, like the family of the child in Waterville, will be changed forever, is changed forever. And both of these tragedies would, would have been avoided with safe firearm storage. The second group of, of kids at risk is adolescents. I'm not going to give you any statistics, but you're all aware that COVID-19 has made the already high rate of teens, teen depression in Maine worse. Of the many depressed teens I've seen just since the pandemic began, at least two of them had known access to unsecured firearms. In both cases, family members were resistant to safeguarding the weapons. 
is there is there ever worth it to have a loaded handgun in the nightstand when there's a depressed teen in the home? I ask you to pass uh, LD 759 to make it clear that it's never okay. Thank you, Dr. Page. Um, no questions. I will uh, then apologize to Hillary Shendi. I, I skipped over your name, so go right ahead. Thank you. No worries. Senator <laughs> uh, Deschambault, Representative Warren, and honorable members of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. My name is Hillary Shende, and I'm a concerned citizen from Brunswick, Maine. Thank you for hearing my testimony today. I'd like to add my voice to the chorus of voices who want to protect Maine children's lives. I was frankly shocked to learn recently that a law like LD 759 doesn't already exist in Maine. Why would we not have such a law? Medical research shows that safe storage laws incentivize the small percentage of irresponsible gun owners to lock up their guns. And they significantly reduce firearm deaths. Not only that, but safe storage laws pose zero threat to the Second Amendment rights of responsible gun owners. Only the most egregious cases of negligence could be prosecuted for child endangerment at the discretion of the prosecutor and only in cases where that negligence has actually led to the discharge of a weapon by a child. This is a no brainer. Please pass LD 759 as soon as possible before another main child loses their life. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shindy. Um, no hands raised, thank you again. I now thank you. Have, I want to make sure I've got everybody here, and I'm sorry I didn't see you all come in. So I will stop with Rebecca Green, followed by Deborah Hagler and Mary Kane. Uh, Rebecca, please. Thank you, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and distinguished members of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. My name is Rebecca Green, and I'm a resident of Waterville, an early childhood educator. And also, uh, I represent Ward 4 on the Waterville City Council. In fact, I represent the Waterville family whose toddler was severely injured when his five-year-old brother shot him with an unsecured firearm in the home. We've heard a lot about this recent case. This is very real to me. I walk by that home many times a week and it has been very much on my mind since it happened in January. This was a tragic and entirely preventable accident that LD 759 seeks to redress. Not this accident, unfortunately, but others like it. I'm providing testimony in support of LD 759 because of this devastating event and because I don't want to wait until another child is wounded or killed. We need to legislate and educate for safe storage practices in the state of Maine. Because there are no uh, requirements that gun owners receive training on either operating or storing a firearm, and because firearm sales have surged through the pandemic, there are more guns than ever in Maine homes and therefore children who likely have access to these weapons. And I have also the st statistics, which I won't go into. We've all heard them. We have a rising number of guns in main homes, more children at home during the pandemic, rising levels of anxiety and depression in youth, and no requirements for safe storage of firearms. I believe the majority of gun owners intend to be responsible, but the reality is that many people underestimate the ability of children to find unsecured firearms. As the director of the Kennebec Montessori School for 12 years, I know all too well that children are curious. They're wired to be that way. And in fact, the method depends on it. In our classrooms, we assumed that children could and would explore anything they had access to. And we were right, that's how they learned. There's no reason to think that children would be any different at home. We have to act before another child is wounded or killed. These incidents have tragic repercussions for individuals and families and communities. 
LD59 will ensure that the, the right to own a gun comes with the obligation to store it safely, not in a closet or a high shelf, but in a locked safe or with a cable lock. It is a public safety measure that will demonstrate Maine's commitment to keeping children safe and encourage greater awareness and education on responsible safe storage of firearms. I urge you to support this bill and send a clear message to people in Maine that the safe storage of firearms is a responsibility we all have to keeping children safe. Thank you. Senator, you're on Thank mute. You. Yes. <laughs> when my clock starts chiming, I turn it off. Um, thank you, Ms. Green, uh, for your testimony. I don't see any hands raised. Again, thank you. Um, next is Deborah Hagler. Hello. Good afternoon, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and members of the Committee on Public Safety and Criminal Justice. My name is Dr. Deborah Hagler, and I'm providing testimony on behalf of the American Academy of Pediatrics, the main chapter. And I'm going to deviate from my written testimony just to not reiterate a bunch of statistics um, that we've all heard this afternoon, with the exception to now state that firearm injuries have become the leading cause of death for youth between the ages of 14 and 20 in our country. And my testimony has a handy little graph on it that demonstrates this reanalysis of data. And I will say that our youth uh, nationally and in Maine are affected by this violence. They have started to organize as we've all seen. They are connected and affected by this. I have watched my patients through tears give moving testimony about how a click in a classroom can make them jump and how they look around their classroom to figure out where they're gonna dive in case of a school shooting. They are organizing and asking for change around our issues with gun violence. And I'm just gonna deviate also and talk about the impact of the coronavirus on our youth. They have been profoundly affected and they have been struggling before the pandemic began. We know that the incidence of depression has doubled over the last uh, decade in our youth and we've seen them struggle. They have asked and been very forthcoming during this time through telehealth to talk about their struggles. And many of them talked candidly about suicide and their Google searches looking for methods, including how best to use firearms. They are organized and asking for us, the responsible adults to impact and make change. And this law listens to that voice. Kids are impulsive. They are, uh, sad, but they are also amazingly resilient. It's time for the adults to listen. There's good public health precedent for responding to data that indicates that there's a problem. We've all struggled with the cap to our Tylenol bottle and getting it off. The data is clear. It's time to intervene. The American Academy of Pediatrics strongly urges you to intervene and support this legislation to protect the lives of Maine children. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Hagelin. No hands raised, I will proceed. Um, Mary Kane, welcome. Thank you. Senator De DeChambeau, Representative Warren and distinguished members of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. I'm Mary Kane and I live in Hollowell. I want to urge you to support LD 759 I taught in the Richmond school system for 30 years and was both terrified and saddened to read about the incident at the Marsha Bucher Elementary School just two weeks ago. Terrified because someone could have been killed and saddened to think about all the children, parents and educators that were confronted with this very real, very threatening experience. I doubt any of them will ever forget it. It is very scary to realize how many of our children have access to guns in their own homes. The parents may be very well-intentioned, but the child cannot be expected to have the same understanding of the seriousness of handling a firearm. The other terrifying unintended consequence of not securing firearms is that young people may use the gun against themselves. Teen suicide continues to be the second leading cause of death for Maine youth aged 12 to 24, and firearms 
are the most used method in teen suicides. Requiring safe storage of firearms will save our children's lives. What could be more important than that? Thank you for your time and consideration of this important bill. Thank you, Ms. Kane. I don't see any hands raised. We shall continue and proceed. Um, I will recognize in order Robin Brooks, Sue Repko, and Sarah Ostroff. Uh, go ahead. Yes, hi. Uh, good afternoon, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and distinguished members of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. I'm here to testify in support of LD 759. It's a child safety bill. It's about protecting children from the harm they may do to themselves or others with a gun. This law makes clear the danger of an unsecured loaded gun in a child's hands and places the responsibility where it belongs with the adult. I'll put a human face on this bill by talking about a specific instance where a child's death could have been prevented had the parents secured their guns. And I'll say, I began my teaching career in uh, Callis back in 87 and concluded it in Topsom in uh, 2020. And I live in Topsom. So I'm also a mother. Uh, I've taught art for 40 years. In 1994, I was hired by the Lisbon School Department to teach art to the sixth, seventh and eighth grade children at Sug Middle School. That same summer, my husband John was hired to teach English at Lisbon High. Looking back, it must have been the summer of 95 or 96 because the school year had not yet begun. John and I learned that an eighth grade girl I had taught at SUG had killed herself with her father's gun. This girl, whose name I can't recall, she must have been 14 or 15 at the oldest, was on my husband's roster for freshman English, but John never got to meet her. We were both in shock and I've never forgotten her. Although I can't remember her name, this girl, this child was a real person. <clears throat> I ask you right now to take a moment and think about her. If she had lived, this girl would now be in her 40s. Let's pause and let that settle in. I can just barely recall her face. Her sullen expression and withdrawn personality suggested she was a very unhappy child. No doubt she must have been in a great deal of emotional pain. At the time, my friend Marsha Krauss, who was a sixth grade teacher at Sug Middle, uh, remembers this girl. And in particular, she shared with me her recollection of an emergency meeting. She just shared this yesterday uh, on uh, this child's behalf. At that meeting, Marsha related that the mother was told just how vulnerable her, da her daughter was. We told her, and this is a quote, we told her to get all firearms out of the house. Clearly that didn't happen. While searching for details about this young girl's suicide by gun in newspaper archives, I came across this headline from 2017. Girl, uh, authorities, girl five picked up dad's gun and shot self in head, Scarborough. The article reads, an autopsy showed the shooting death of a five-year-old Maine girl at her grandparents' home was accidental. That girl had picked up her father's gun and shot herself in the head. The state medical examiner's office reached its conclusion Wednesday following the death of Elise Thor of Belfast two days earlier. And the rest is in, in my testimony. I see the clock ticking. Uh, essentially, the gun wasn't in a holster and there was no gun lock. No charges have been filed. Passing LD 759 will um, rectify the situation. At least it, it will educate people about the uh, importance of securing firearms. Thank you so much. Um, Thank happy you, to be Thank you. Um, the next person is Sue. Madam Chair. Yes. Oh. May I please thank you. Just make a quick announcement. Um, we have a, a rule that our committee has agreed upon together that we don't wear t-shirts with messages on them or hats or masks. So if you were the one that was moved out of the, the room, um, please just uh, please put on a sweater or something. Um, this goes for both sides. We just don't allow moms demand action or NRA or anything like that. So um, just wanna make sure everybody's aware of that. So thank you. And we'll let you back in. Thank you, Representative Warren. I didn't pick up on that. That's good. Um, I will recognize Sarah Ostroff. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, 
and distinguished members of the Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety. My name is Sarah Ostrov. I live in Falmouth, Maine. And I'll be reading the testimony of Kathy Daphna Harris. This is her testimony. My name is Kathy Daphna Harris and I am a retired school teacher. Thank you for allowing me to speak today in favor of this bill. When I was 16 years old, I was babysitting my neighbor's children one evening. The children were playing in their bedroom, which was right beside their parents' bedroom. And I was in the kitchen making them a snack. I got the biggest scare of my life when the five-year-old little boy I was watching came into the kitchen with a large black revolver. He actually pointed it right at me and acted like it was a toy. I managed to coax him into giving it to me although it took some persuasion and I put it up on a high shelf. When I talked to the parents about this, they were shocked. They had put the gun in a safe in their bedroom, but somehow it must not have been locked. The gun was not loaded, luckily. I hate to think what could have happened if it was. All these many years later, and I still remember the terror I felt when I saw that little boy holding that gun so huge in his tiny hands. If that gun had been loaded, he could have shot me or his brother or even himself. I taught school for 28 years. I spent most of those years teaching kindergarten. I know how impulsive young children can be. When I was a teacher, I was a mandated reporter for child abuse and neglect. It certainly is neglect if a child is able to have access to a loaded weapon. The child does not know the danger, but the adults certainly do. What could possibly constitute more as a case of neglect than leaving a loaded gun unsecure in the presence of a child? I know that in Maine, the Department of Health and Human Services has been under scrutiny to protect the children in this state. I believe this bill further addresses safety measures we need to have in place for our children. My husband is in law enforcement. When he comes home at night, the first thing he does is lock up his gun, even though we don't have young children in our home. He practices gun safety the way he was trained, locking up weapons so that children cannot get their hands on them just makes sense and is what responsible gun owners should do. My neighbor was a responsible gun owner. His gun was not loaded. I might not be here today if that had not been the case. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, anyone else uh, or have an, their hand raised? No. Um, I now have Christian Song. Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren and members of the Committee on the Criminal Justice and Public Safety. My name is Kristen Song and I'm here today in support of LD 759. I saw a woman, her eyes sparkled, her posture was relaxed, her movements were deliberate and full of energy. She smiled, laughed and loved to tell anyone who would listen, seize the day, she lived her life that way. Her third child was born on a warm winter's day, her family was complete, she felt at peace. Her heart grew three sizes that day. The pleasures in her life were her family and her greatest joys were her children. Her most treasured moments were when her family was all together at dinner time, vacation, or trapped on a long car ride. She loved the noise, but she also loved the quiet when her children were tucked in their beds. They were safe, she did her job. Her children grew into teenagers and she fell more in love with them. She used to sit back, watch them and smile. Ah, oh, life is good. I saw a woman on January 31st, 2018. She and her beautiful boy had such a fun and relaxing morning together. You see, her beautiful boy just got his braces off and he was so happy. She took a picture of him and with, with him in his new smile and sent it off to her beautiful boy's dad. They headed off to breakfast to celebrate and her beautiful boy told her all about his dreams, his hopes and his plans for his future. He wanted to go to Rice University, join the army and have seven children. He wanted his house to be filled with music and laughter like his home now. 
They returned home and her beautiful boy walked to his best friend's house. An hour later, the woman saw two police officers walking across her lawn. Her heart sank. The ambulance screamed by her street, carrying her beautiful boy. On the car ride to the hospital, the woman and her husband held hands, praying that her beautiful boy was still alive. They ran into the hospital and the staff parted like the Red Sea, they all knew. The woman ran towards the bays where her beautiful boy lay, but she was stopped and guided to a tiny room. The ER doctor slid down the wall, put his head in his hands and whispered, your beautiful boy is gone. The woman needed to see her beautiful boy to tell him he is so loved and cherished, to kiss his forehead, to tuck him in one last time, to tell him how sorry she is that she has failed him as a mother. She begs to see him, but she is warned that her beautiful boy is unrecognizable, even to her eyes. You see, he was shot in the head. While part of my, but while part of her family walks out of the hospital, their beautiful boy is being wheeled to the morgue. I see a woman, her eyes are dull, her posture slumped, her movements as if by rope. She is in a stupor getting through the day, but numb of heart, mind, and soul. Her body has turned to tears. Her energy is gone. She wonders how she will get through the day. The physical pain is so intense, it is hard for her to breathe. The things that used to bring her pleasure and great joys are chased away to the furthest parts of her mind. They are terrifying reminders of what used to be. She doesn't sleep much, and when she does, her beautiful boy visits her at night, calling to her. Frantically, she tries to get to him, but he slips through her fingers and slowly fades away. A noise awakes her. She realizes she is sobbing and, sobbing and wailing. Why, God? Please tell me why, my beautiful boy. She sits with her coffee in the kitchen and contemplates suicide. Ah, oh, that sounds lovely. No more pain. Her other son grabs her hand and says, I would not survive if I lost another member of this family. How did he know? Was it so obvious? She now knows she has no other choice to live. That woman is me and the beautiful boy is, was my 15 year old son, Ethan. He was shot and killed in his best friend's house with an unsecured gun. My house was safe. My neighbor's house was not. The father stored his three guns and bullets in a shoebox. Ethan's best friend was charged with manslaughter. The gun owner had no consequences. In Connecticut, they passed a safe storage law. The Republicans who never voted in favor of any gun legislation voted in favor of a safe storage law because they understood this legislation had nothing to do about gun control. It was only about saving children. Life-saving legislation like safe storage may be inconvenient for a gun owner. It may take the gun owner some time to figure out what safe storage looks like in their home, and it may take them some extra minutes to secure their weapon when they return home. But I would argue it is much more inconvenient to watch the coroner zip down a body bag and ask, is this your beautiful child? Or to sit in your child's empty bedroom trying to find the words for their eulogy or watch your child who just days before was full of life be lowered into the ground. With the emergence of biometric safes, gun owners can now access their guns in, sec in seconds to protect their family from external dangers. And when the guns are not in their immediate control at home, they can lock them up to protect their family from internal dangers. This legislation is a win-win. I only ask what the NRA asks. This is the Bible. I read through this book. This legislation asks so much less than what the NRA asked their gun owners to do. Thank you. I believe I speak for everybody how moving that was and personal. And thank you. Any questions? None. Um, I have Judith Feinstein, um, Sue Repko, and Maura Pillsbury. Shall I start? Yes. Okay. Uh, Senator Deschambeau, Representative Warren, and members of the committee. Oh, that was really hard to listen to. Excuse me. 
Um, my name is Judith Feinstein. I live in Hollowell. I'm semi semi retired public health professional, and I am honored to read testimony submitted by Kathleen McFadden of Goldsboro in support of this bill. Um, she writes, as a mother of two, a volunteer with Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America, and as one whose family has been irrevocably altered by the epidemic of gun violence, I respectfully urge the committee to support LD 759. The trauma and horror of gun violence is a lifelong sentence that no family should have to endure. In her written testimony, she lists headlines which other people have already read to you. She continues, sadly, these headlines don't begin to tell the full story. Youth suicide by firearm is on the rise. It's estimated that nearly half of Maine homes have at least one firearm, and those numbers have, have risen since the start of the pandemic. Easy access to firearms and impulsivity are significant factors in youth suicide. Attempts by guns almost always result in death. Children as young as 11 have been known to access firearms in their own home to take their own life. We must do more to protect our children from the public health crisis of gun violence. And I wanna to add to that, that in my professional career, I worked with two people who lost teenage boys to self-inflicted gunshots. One, um, one person, this happened while I worked with her, the other one, it had happened prior to my getting to know her. Their lives were not the same. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Feinstein. Um, I don't see any hands. I will recognize Sue Repco. All right, uh, thank you. Um, I, and I'm sorry about the shirt. I didn't know that was a rule. Um, thank you, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and distinguished members of the Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety for the chance to testify in favor of LD 759 today. And thank you for your public service. My name is Sue Repco. I'm from Elliott, Maine, and I'm a teacher, urban planner, gun owner, and volunteer with Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. Uh, unintentional shootings involving children just break my heart. A child is seriously injured or killed in an instant. All that joy, all that potential now limited or gone altogether. And then there is the child who was holding the gun. It's terrible to say, but they're marked forever, even though they never asked for this. Then there's the gun owner who will forever have to live with the fact that they did not choose the safety of those children as their top priority. This all brings to mind the shame, judgment, and what ifs that come with all these stories, and it's like I'm 12 years old again. That's when my father unintentionally shot our next door neighbor. My dad ran a part-time gunsmithing business out of a garage in our backyard in a residential neighborhood in Pennsylvania. I was outside playing one night in May 1975 when I heard a pop pop come from the garage. Dad had often test fired in there, but this time one of the rounds pierced a window, crossed our neighbor's driveway and went into his garage, striking him in the abdomen, nicking his pancreas and liver and going out his back. He crawled out moaning and I watched my dad cry over his prone body. This scene never goes away. Mr. Landis died a couple days later. It was in the paper three days in a row that's how I first learned about zoning approvals, variances, special exceptions. My dad had none. That's how I learned that test firing was illegal. The zoning officer had never cited him despite complaints from neighbors. The local police had brought their guns to him. My dad did not choose safety as his top priority and local government looked the other way. I was suddenly totally ashamed of my dad. Neighborhood kids taunted my younger siblings with killers kids, and at least my dad never killed anyone. Any child holding a gun when it goes off will not be immune from similar taunts. But with LD 759, we can raise awareness about the need for safe storage of loaded firearms and protect children from ever being in that position. Responsible gun owners make us all safer by storing firearms unloaded and locked with ammunition separate. 
Research shows that child access prevention laws play a vital role in reducing unintentional firearm injuries and deaths among children. Why would we not pass such a law to protect Maine children, families, and entire communities from the enduring trauma of this particular kind of shooting? And we've heard so many of these stories and experiences today. Please don't look the other way. I urge you to pass LD 759 and join the many states that have passed this type of responsible storage law to prevent access to loaded firearms by children and teens. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Repko. I now have Maura Pillsbury. Thank you, Senator DeChambeau. Representative Warren and members of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. My name is Maura Pillsbury from Freeport. I am a Moms Demand Action Maine volunteer, a mother of two young children, and I also serve on my local school board. I'm here today to testify on behalf of myself and thousands of members of Maine Moms Demand Action across the state in strong support of LD 759. Moms Demand Action is a grassroots movement of Americans advocating for public safety measures that can protect people from gun violence. We know that gun violence is preventable and we are committed to doing what it takes to keep families and children safe, including supporting proposed laws like LD 759. We thank you for reading uh, the postcards from our members in Maine about the importance of this bill. And I want to just pause and say thank you to Ms. Song and to so many others who have um, testified so powerfully today in sharing your experiences and why uh, this proposed bill is so important. Um, you have my written testimony committee members, and I know it has been a long afternoon for you, so I'll focus on adding my voice also as a local school board member. Um, I participate in discussions about how we can protect our schools with bulletproof vests and active shooter drills, but we also need to think about prevention, what we can do to prevent incidents of gun violence from happening in the first place to keep our schools and children safe, and this is just one such bill that would do that. Um, I also wanted to add to the many statistics that we've heard today that according to the 2019 Maine Integrated Youth Health Survey, 32% of Maine high school students felt sad or hopeless for at least two weeks in the past year, and 16% of Maine high school students have seriously considered attempting suicide in the past year. Um, in education and the gun violence prevention movement, we often talk and think about the impact of adverse childhood experiences on children, including violence, abuse, and neglect. One in five Maine high school students have experienced four or more adverse childhood experiences. Um, as someone who's a school board member and you know, increasingly even in the time of COVID, more and more looking at the safety and well-being of our students, I urge you to think about the impact of gun violence on children. According to the US CDC, adverse childhood experiences can have lasting effects on the health behaviors and life potential. And um, they can disrupt healthy brain development, affect social development, and negatively impact education and employment. Um, I just wanna conclude by thanking you so much um, and urging you to support LD 759 as a state with high gun ownership. This bill is crucial here in Maine. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Blisbury. Don't see a show of hands. We shall continue. I now have Linda Ellis, followed by, wait a minute, Lynn Ellis, followed by Linda Crema, Elizabeth Rima. I believe. Um, so, Ms. Ellis? Yes, good afternoon. Uh, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and members of this committee. Uh, I did submit a written testimony, most of which has already been covered. So, I'm going to speak a little bit on a little bit different track. Uh, and that is uh, first, I'll say my name is Lynn Ellis. I'm from Brunswick. I'm a retired social worker. And one of the roles that I had as a social worker was as a bereavement counselor and coordinator. And in a healthcare setting, the, we facilitated grief support groups. And one of the most difficult facilitation in grief support 
was for suicide survivors. I am a, you know, 35 year career trained social worker and it tore at my professional boundaries and at my heart. Uh, there was one particular case of a young man who, uh, who took his life and his mother and his sister attended the grief support group. There is no consolation. There is no, there is nothing that can heal the wounds of that. Uh, so I speak as a member of Moms Demand Action, of Main Gun Safety Coalition, of doing this work for years and years and years. And the, the sole goal is to save lives. And in particular, our children's lives. And in particular, our families who are suffering so badly. And you've heard all the reports to this point. Uh, but I did wanna address an issue that was raised earlier by uh, Senator Shambo in response to earlier testimony. Uh, I have been working with closely with this bill's sponsor, Representative Dudera, the co-sponsors and advocates in my role uh, on the different committees in support of this bill. Uh, and I just wanted to clarify that it is and was the intention of this bill to cover those circumstances when a child is in the temporary care of a non-family member, such as while playing at that child's friend's home. The, bill, the language of the bill clearly and explicitly says other person having the care and custody of that child. And it was intended for the purpose of this bill. So if someone's in your home, you have the, the custody of that child while they're there. So I just wanted to clarify that point. And I also wanted to thank you all for the due diligence that you're giving today with this bill, LD 759, which I strongly support. Uh, thank you. Uh, we miss you. We miss being in the halls of the of the Senate and the House with our red shirts, which we can't wear today. But um, thank you again. Thank you, Miss Ellis. Miss Ellis, I was just referring to a neighbor, a child going into a neighbor's home. Uh, they don't have children. They have their own gun. Um, and so they're not in the care of any children just came in. I, I just know that that is a situation I've heard repeatedly. So that's something I'm sure Representative Dudova would probably think about if maybe that can be covered in some way. Um, so, um, so, like I'm not done. What am I doing here? Okay. <laughs> um, after Lynn uh, Ellis, I have Linda Kramer. Thank you. My name is Linda Kramer. I live in Harpswell, and I'm honored to read testimony from Melissa Hackett, who is Policy and Communications at Associate at the Maine Children's Alliance. Senator Dishambo, Representative Warren, and members of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. My name is Melissa Hackett, and I am offering testimony on behalf of the Maine Children's Alliance strongly in support of LD 759. The Maine Children's Alliance is a statewide nonpartisan research and ad advocacy organization whose mission is to promote sound policies and best practices that improve the lives of Maine's children, youth, and families. We all want our children to grow up healthy and to transition safely into adulthood. As parents, adults, and decision makers, it is our responsibility to take the necessary measures to keep them safe when children and youth have access to firearms in homes, we risk exposing them to accidental death or injury that can be prevented through laws that establish safe storage practices for firearms. We support this legislation to protect Maine children from injury and violence resulting from access to firearms in the home. Firearm injuries are an issue of public health, contributing substantially to premature death and disability of children. Firearm-related deaths are the third leading cause of death overall among U.S. children aged 1 to 17 years. About 4.6 million children in the U.S. live in homes with firearms. And alarmingly, of these households, 43% contain at least one unlocked firearm. 
Studies show that these unsecured guns are accessible to and accessed by young children, even when their parents believe they are not. Laws reducing child and youth access to firearms, including laws enforcing safe storage, are associated with lower overall adolescent suicide rates, which are of particular concern here in Maine. A 2018 brief from the Maine CDC found that firearms were used in more than half, 52%, of all suicide deaths between 2014 and 2016. Although the number of suicides by teens varies each year, our 2021 Maine Kids Count data book includes that the average number of suicides per year for youth under age 20 in Maine was well above the national average. For a teenager going through a difficult time and considering suicide, reducing their access to a firearm can save their life. Nine out of 10 suicide attempts with a gun result in death. But in contrast, most people who attempt suicide by other means live and do not eventually die by suicide. It is our job to protect the youth in our state. Responsible gun safety measures play a critical role in keeping Maine children and families safe. When firearms are not safely stored, there can be fatal unintentional consequences for young children in that home. I have two more sentences. When a teenager is struggling with a difficult experience and they have easy access to a firearm, they are not safe. Our state can and should implement and enforce laws like this one that establish expectations that firearms should only be accessible and in the hands of responsible gun owners to protect the health and safety of our youngest citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kramer. Uh, no show of hands. I will continue. Thank you again. Uh, Elizabeth, is it Ramage? Um, I, I want to make it French, I guess. And Healy, would you pronounce your name, please? <laughs> it's Remage Healy. I've lived in Maine Remage. for 40 years. But I used to complain about, oh, those Franco, you know, Canadian names, you can never tell how to pronounce them, and then I realized, oh, I had one of those names. <laughs> okay. Go right ahead. <laughs> um, Senator Duchambeau, Representative Warren, and members of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. My name is Elizabeth Ramage Healy from Peaks Island, formerly a neighbor of Representative Warren in Hallwell, and uh, there. Shall I start over? Sorry. No, you're fine. Okay. Um, anyway, special thanks, Representative Warren, for co-sponsoring LD 759. And I also have to add, as it seemed like a long time since my turn was up, I've got to re recognize all the members of the committee. Your day is just starting. And I thank you for your openness to the public process. Um, when I was a school counselor in West Gardner, I heard the tragic story of a teacher there. The year before, she and her husband had split up and their 13-year-old daughter was really struggling with depression because of it. The teacher sought help from her pediatrician who advised to get all guns out of the house. She did. Her ex-husband did not. One weekend while visiting him, their daughter got one of his guns and killed herself. Safe storage would have saved her life. Some people say that Maine doesn't have a gun problem. Sadly, Maine does have a gun problem. Maine's gun death, death rate is higher than any state in New, uh, other state in New England and higher than the national average. But Maine's gun problem doesn't make headlines. It's a quiet problem, a quiet killer. That's because almost 90% of gun deaths in Maine are suicides. Uh, and way too many are teens, as you have heard uh, on numerous occasions. Um, keeping guns locked up will help keep teens alive to find their way through a dark time. Safe storage will keep our children safe while also keeping our homes safe. Please support LD 759, which is a small but vital step towards improved family safety. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, Good to see you, Betsy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I believe, um, Ms. Faye, did you tell me where uh, there are no more that wish to speak in support? Yes, but it's been a while, so maybe one more call. Yeah. Let me ask any, if you wish to speak in support of this bill, please raise your hand and the clerk will let you come in the room. One hand. Okay. Number 45, <laughs> not that I'm counting. Uh, where um, do I have? Okay, someone's coming in the room. I think it's someone who already spoke before though. So maybe a mistake. No, nope. we're all set. Uh, all the people that are in the squares have spoken. So I will now ask for um, people who wish to speak in opposition of um, LD 759, please raise your hand and we'll let you in. I see one hand. Anyone else? That's it. Okay. Welcome, Lauren LePage. <laughs> I was going to call you by a different last name, but go right ahead. <laughs> Still LePage for now. Um, and I will be brief because I know the committee has had a very, very long afternoon. Uh, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and honorable members of the committee, it's an honor to be in front of criminal justice for the first time this year. My name is Lauren LePage and I am the state director for the National Rifle Association. On behalf of our thousands of members of Maine, I'm testifying in opposition to LD 759. First, I have a responsibility on behalf of our thousands of law-abiding members across the state and millions nationwide to remind the committee that NRA cares very deeply about safety. We continue to be a worldwide leader in firearms education. We have numerous education programs available which educate individuals on firearm safety. Not only do we defend Second Amendment rights of law-abiding citizens, but NRA is the premier firearms education organization in the world. This legislation is simply unnecessary. Maine law already regulates access to firearms by minors and the corresponding responsibilities as a, of adults. As written, the statute that this bill pros, proposes to amend already covers the behavior outlined in the bill that this bill is trying to prevent. This bill sets the stage for a mandatory storage law, which is largely what we heard the proponents testify to today. One size fits all storage laws impair the ability of law-abiding Mainers to access firearms in their homes to defend themselves and their families. The Supreme Court has said that the need for self-defense is most acute within the home and the use of firearms and defense within the home is elevated above all other interests. The central component of the right to use firearms in defense of one's home and family and loved ones is the right to keep arms that are capable of being used and used immediately for self-defense. Maine has a very strong tradition and heritage of safe firearm ownership. No one Maine household is the same and no one size fits all mandated storage law should be imposed on the diverse citizenry in this state. On behalf of NRA's thousands of members across Maine, I urge the committee to oppose this legislation and as I said before, if there is any interest in the variety of safety programs that we offer, please do not hesitate to let me know. I'm here to be a resource for the committee and happy to provide additional details on those programs. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Um, I have a representative uh, Morales. Uh, you're muted if you can unmute yourself. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. LePage. Um, wondering if you um, conducted um, in preparation for this bill and have the results of for us a, a survey of gun owners um, in Maine on this particular bill 
And I only ask because um, I've reached out to a lot of folks that I know um, who are, you know, gun owners, um, and they seem to all support this bill, um, that this really doesn't impact their rights to own guns um, and to use them lawfully, and that they really believe that this will protect children. I'm wondering if you did that and if you have those results for us. Uh, it, is not in, it is not in our custom to... Um, poll members on every single piece of legislation. Um, it is the analysis that we've done on this bill um, simply is that the existing law surrounding endangered, re reckless endangerment of a child covers the behavior that this bill is trying to target. And that existing law um, would take care of any of the behaviors that have been outlined by the, by the committee. That's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, seeing no hands raised, thank you, uh, Ms. LePage. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Pelletier, are you here to speak in opposition? Is or I am Senator. You are? Okay, go right ahead. Uh, uh, thank you, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, members of the Criminal Justice Committee. My name is John Pelletier. I'm chair of the Criminal Law Advisory Commission. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the folks on our panel were unanimous and uh, didn't lack any certainty that the conduct that would be barred by the bill is already barred by the criminal code. Uh, you know, the standard is that the person uh, the firearm is left in a place when the person knows or reasonably should know that a child is likely to gain access. First of all, from the point of view of prosecuting a crime under this statute, that's a very, very difficult set of facts to try and establish beyond a reasonable doubt. The other thing is that what is described constitutes recklessness. And recklessness that endangers a child in existing law is a crime if the person has a duty of care towards the child, so you're a parent or guardian. But even if you're the neighbor, we have an independent law that reckless conduct that endangers a person is a crime. It's a class D crime in Maine. Uh, and unlike the bill, which requires that some adverse consequence have taken place, the current law uh, allows a charge to be brought for merely creating the risk. So you wouldn't need to have the firearm discharged or used in a crime. Um, so what we're talking about are, uh, are you know, the possibility of a prosecution against the, the gun owner or the responsible adult in the circumstance. And under our law, if you have the proof, those that conduct is reckless and it is able to be prosecuted now. And the criminal code has lots of crimes in it. And our consistent view is that you, you should not, the legislature should not enact a law that makes a special provision for conduct that is already covered by the more general provisions of the code. The, maybe not in this area, but in, in general, the criminals are more inventive than the lawmakers. And so you can't specify every variety of crime. What you do is you craft general language that covers antisocial conduct that you want to criminalize. And that's what the legislature has done with respect to reckless conduct and endangering the welfare of a child. And those statutes cover the conduct that this bill is aimed at. And with that, I'll stop and be glad to answer any questions. Representative Morales followed by Representative Plucker. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Mr. Pelletier. Um, I've got two questions. The first is, is there anything, because this bill is not only about um, prosecution, it's also about an affirmative duty that's specific um, around safe, safe store.
Judge, is there anywhere in the code, has anyone been prosecuted? Um, we've, we've heard lots of testimony today about the number of, um, you know, young people who have died and been seriously injured um, as a result of the failure to protect, hide, safely store um, weapons. Uh, has, to your knowledge, and did, did CLAC actually take a look at whether there have been ever any prosecutions in, in Maine uh, on those grounds? Okay, uh, I, I heard two questions. Uh, on the second one, we did not discuss whether there had been prosecutions and there were a bunch of prosecutors in the room and um, it didn't come up. So I, and, and so I suspect there may not have been many prosecutions, but again, these are difficult facts to prove and prosecutors have discretion. And, the, the, you know, the, there's the balance between perhaps some deterrent value of making an example of someone versus someone who's already suffered a tragedy. And, but those are decisions for prosecutors, I'm not a prosecutor. Uh, but I also heard, is there anything specific that uh, is um, uh, some special requirement about how you store firearms? And I was listening to the testimony and, and that is not, I, I don't see this bill as doing that. Uh, I, the, the bill describes a special kind of recklessness, but it doesn't prescribe, you have to keep it locked or you have to do this or you have to do that. It, you know, it, it describes in essence, recklessness in a general sense with, with, with respect to the storage of a firearm, but it's not, doesn't have specific storage criteria, so. Could I follow up, Madam Chair? Uh, yes. Uh, so I think my specific question was, is there anywhere, any affirmative duty in Maine law, whether criminal or otherwise, and I understand that otherwise is probably not, maybe not um, something that you could answer, um, being the expert on criminal law, but, um, where there is an affirmative duty to safely store these dangerous weapons? Uh, I don't, I, I, not that I'm aware. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. P uh, Pelletier, you wish to continue that response? I, no, um, I, I, I've answered the question. Okay, uh, Representative Pluka. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question was almost exactly along the lines of Representative Morales's, but I just wanted to clarify. So in the examples we heard of a child taking a loaded gun to school, there is um, currently a law on books where the person who is the owner of that gun could be prosecuted for that child's uh, reckless use of the firearm. If, if the, if, if the, result of the conduct was to cause, um, uh, uh, was to endanger, uh, cause a, a risk of serious bodily injury to a person. So if, you, if a five-year-old brings a loaded firearm to school and displays it to their, to their uh, classmate, you could argue, a prosecutor could argue that created a risk a serious bodily injury. And if that conduct was the result of recklessness by the person who was in control of the gun, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a reckless conduct under our statute. And what recklessness is, is it's a failure to perceive a risk. So, you know, it's very similar to the language here. So if, if there is a, a, a risk, that a child could get a firearm and create a risk of serious harm, and that risk is disregarded by the uh, by the person in control of the firearm. That is potentially uh, a prosecutable reckless conduct. Uh, a quick follow-up, Madam Chair. Yes, go right ahead. So uh, there's. What is currently exists is that there, if, if a parent or a guardian recklessly stores 
or recklessly, yeah, recklessly stores a firearm. That is currently a law. And this law says if you store in a way that you reasonably should have known that a child is likely to gain access, that's what this bill would do. And you're saying that they're, for all intents and purposes, those are the same two things. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm saying that a person is guilty of a class D crime if they recklessly create a substantial risk of serious bodily injury. So if you handle your firearm in a way that creates a risk of serious bodily injury, and uh, that is, um, recklessness is two things. It's you disregard risk and the risk, the disregard is a gross deviation from reasonable conduct, which leaving a firearm where a child is likely to get it would be a gross deviation from reasonable conduct. If, if you do that and it creates the risk of a serious bodily injury, that meets the definition of the class D crime of reckless conduct. Thank you very much. And Madam Chair. Yes. I don't know if it's, I have a question for the work session, which is similar to Representative Morales's question. I don't know if it's better for research for CLAC to do the research or better for, for Ms. Orberton to do it, but to find out if there have, and we've heard lots of stories from the media of this kind of thing happening, if there has been any prosecution under existing law for some of that, I'd be interested to hear. Um, I'm not going to. I'm going to say something, and if Ms. Overton disagrees with me, I think we'll give it to our policy analyst who will find the right person to answer that question for us or provide thank that you very information. Much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Reckett, I mean, Reckett, pick it. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Pelletier, we speak again. Uh, so, if I'm understanding you correctly, sir, you you are not saying anything about the fact that this bill is is saying it's not it's not telling people they have to. It's saying if you don't store your weapon in the right in the right way, and a child gets a hold of it, and all of the things you just spoke with Representative Fluker about, there are laws right now that will deal with that, and can and it can be charges can be brought up even to the welfare of a child which is what the bill is trying to do trying to do that already can be done in law so what my question is is the bill really does nothing as far as telling a person that they how to either how to or they must care for their weapon properly because we all people out here that have guns should already know that you don't leave them unattended, you keep them stored, you take care of them. And we all know that if we do something like that and someone gets a hold of it and causes some kind of a, uh, God forbid, a, a situation like we've heard here today, hot wrenching stories we've heard here today, that, that, that are just absolutely horrible, that we can be held accountable for that. So isn't, would you say that the message here is really more about gun owners, if you have a gun, be responsible and take care of the gun because if not, you are and can be held accountable without having to put a new law to tell to, to say that same thing. Am I am I correct in that? Well, that I, I think your direct question is a little bit outside of my purview. But what I'll say is that, uh, and this is a consistent theme that our panel has had for a number of years is that the, we do not view the criminal code as an educational tool so, such that over the years, there are often uh, uh, proposals to make a specific crime because it happened in the, and it was in the press or for one reason or another. And the argument is that we need to highlight this danger and we need to and that by putting it in the criminal code or by raising the classification of a crime, we're gonna educate the public. And our view is that there's a lot of ways to educate the public, but the criminal code is not, because 
it, it, it's a, if you start down that road, there's never an end to it. And in our view, the criminal code is, is best crafted where you use general language to identify the antisocial conduct that the state wants to criminalize. And, and you apply that general language to the myriad of conduct that people come up with. And that's, and, and, you, and, and so that's distinct from a special thing that's already illegal, but we want to highlight it. And our panel has consistently been against uh, that. And so that's, that's how we view, that's how we view this proposal. That in essence, it takes what is already criminal reckless conduct and it creates a special brand of criminal reckless conduct. And there may be a lot of, uh, I mean, people have argued now for quite a long, quite a number of minutes that the, the uh, there are good reasons for doing that. And you are the policymakers, but in our view, putting something in the criminal code that criminalizes something that's already criminal is not an, the appropriate education tool. Thank you, sir. Thunder. Um, I, <clears throat> first of all, uh, I don't know if everybody listening <clears throat> knows uh, what CLAC is. Um, and Mr. Pelletier mentioned uh, prosecutors, defense attorneys, judges, uh, attorney, assistant attorney general, um, and uh, they do this all the time and they look at it. Um, I, <clears throat> I was looking at the, I, first of all, you mentioned a couple of times endangerment of the child and we all already have that. Um, for our uh, work session, could you also include and cite uh, which statute we can find that just to read it? I mean, I'm, I'm looking at something now about reading. Um, um, let me just get that for a minute here. Uh, knowingly, a person is guilty of endangering the welfare of a child if the person knowingly permits the child under the age of 16, as Ms. LePage says, to enter a house of prostitution. Knowingly sells, furnishes, gives away um, intoxicating liquor, cigarettes, tobacco, rifles. Um, and so that's the parent doing that. Um, you know, it, it's unlawful to give them the fire, the ammunition for the firearm, but to recklessly, I guess, or just have it loaded by dad's bedside. Um, and that's the issue about children uh, being curious and using it. Um, I know there's a question in here, but I... Um, we may be, so Madam Chair, we, I just want to remind the committee, we do have six more bills after this. Yes, I know. We're I'm finishing. pretty close to work session. So I'll just let, actually, I think we're That's the session. information I need, um, Mr. Pelletier, if you could provide that. Um, and also, I, I don't know how much a class D is a deterrent to any activity or any action. So I'll leave it at that. Um, Senator Sayway. Thank you, Madam Chair. You know, I've been listening to the whole thing here, and um, I was wondering if how this, the, I, there was mention of a child access protection law, and I don't, does that pretty much match up with what we have? Uh, John, I just wanted to know, is that, you know, that's throughout the, the country, they said. So just a, a question. Well, I, would, I would say what an access prevention law means to me, and I, I, I haven't studied this, but I'll try and answer your question, is it's not, it's not what our existing law is, and it's not what this would be because this is a prohibition on reckless conduct. And if certain bad things happen, 
that it can be prosecuted as a crime. Our panel thinks it could be prosecuted under existing law. What, when someone says a child access prevention statute, then I'm thinking of what Rep. Morales was probably referring to, an affirmative duty. Guns have to be kept in this way. If there's a child living in a home, there needs to be a trigger law, or there needs to be a gun box, or there's some affirmative. And as far as I know, Maine does not have it. Uh, but, uh, but I'd say from the legal analysis of the folks on my panel, this is not that either. Thank you. And otherwise, I, I don't know what the other states' laws are. I'm just, you know, you trying to answer your question. Thank you. Any other questions of Mr. Pelletier? Seeing none, I believe there's one other person who wished to speak in, I guess it's opposition. Um, Jonathan Martell. Um, okay, thank you. Is this an opposition, Mr. Martell? Yes, this would be an opposition. Can you hear me? You. Yeah, go right ahead. All right, thank you. Um, I did submit my testimony online just as um, the same, just because uh, I wasn't sure if I'd be able to speak. Um, dear representatives of the committee, uh, I would like to express my opposition to LD 759. While I understand the outward appearance of this bill to be potentially a good thing, it is in fact a very dangerous bill. It's already a crime to endanger the welfare of a child under Title 17A criminal code. We were just discussing that. Um, and the affirmative def defenses did not protect against being charged with a crime, which means many innocent people will potentially end up in the court system. This is essentially the same bill as LD 379 from 2019 with some extremely minor changes. Um, and I actually reused some of my, <laughs> some of my, my uh, notes from that for this as well. Um, I'm really, it's really kind of too bad that we keep seeing the same, same bills come up almost verbatim every session. Um, the main constitution is clear on firearms laws. And the only way this is really enforceable is to have a registry or in, and inspections. Any self-defense firearms would have to be locked up unless they were always on your person. And um, I did know that they've made it a change where you could have it nearby, but that's very, it's not really defined. Nearby could be across the room, it could be the next room, it could be across the house. It's not, it's not clearly defined, which is a problem, or at least I see that as an issue. Um, and this is completely impractical. Maine does not have a gun problem with children accessing guns. Most gun owners are responsible they keep their firearms out of reach of their kids. They train them to handle them responsibly. And um, that's one of the main traditions that we have seen for a long time. Um, this opens the door for safe storage inspection laws and fines for those that don't keep all their firearms in a safe. That makes you liable if you have a home defense shotgun or pistol in an unlocked location even if it's out of normal reach of children. Uh, this bill goes against the main state constitution and infringes on a person's right to keep and bear arms as they say fit. Parents are perfectly capable of teaching their children's firearm safety and Maine has a long heritage of doing that. Uh, please vote not to pass on LD 759. And uh, my name is Jonathan Martell. I'm from Sanford. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone have any questions of Mr. Martell? Uh, Senator Searway, do you have- Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to ask you where you get your statistics where we don't have any problems with children with firearms. I, you know, I've, two weeks before I almost got done from being a sheriff, I had a gun pointing at me by a juvenile. So I disagree with that, but, I do think our laws do cover the same as what this bill does apparently, but, but uh, I do think the statistics show that there is some situations that, that uh, do happen. 
So I don't know where you get. Do you know where you get your statistics from? So Maine, Maine's one of the safest states in the country. Um, I don't have the stats in front of me, but we we don't have nearly the the rate that uh, is being made out to be in Maine with people having children hurting themselves with firearms. It does happen occasionally, and that's that's horrible. But one of the reasons that the Maine is as safe as it is is because people have are armed legally. We have constitutional carry. Um, most everyone has, or a lot of people have firearms in their house. They have access to them for self-defense. And I think this is um, an egregious encroachment on on that safe situation for most people. And I'd really hate to see um, this foot in the door, which is what exactly what it is for safe storage laws and requiring people to have all their firearms in a safe. Um, we went through a whole slew of bills a few years ago that were very similar to this. And um, it's really difficult to, to have to keep fighting this all the time. And I, I understand where people are coming from. I want children to be safe. And I think one of the, the, the biggest things you can do with kids is take, take away the, the mystery, you know, take a kid shooting and help them understand safety and that, you know, any gun is loaded, whether somebody says it is or isn't, and, you know, make sure that it's always pointed in a safe direction and that you have an adult that's, that's supervising you, you know, take away the mystery. And, and I think that goes a long way instead of, you know, I've got something in a safe that they think their kid doesn't know about, but you know, and there were a lot of talk discussions around suicide, and it's it's really too bad that there are a lot of teenagers that are are suicidal. And you know, un unfortunately, um, even no. if your gun is, Mr. am Martin, I out of time? I think. Yes. Well, it's just that I think we're giving testimony again. Uh, oh, okay. I'm if, sorry. Yeah, no worries. Uh, Thank you. Uh, if Senator Sayway is satisfied with that, we'll continue. Thank you. Thank you. I will ask one more time, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? I believe we're through with that. Anyone wishing to speak neither for nor against on LD 759? Seeing no hand, Senator. Thank you. Therefore, uh, following testimony, I uh, close the hearing on 759. The next bill we have, um, um, Senator DeChambeau. Excuse me? Senator DeChambeau, sorry, excuse me for a second. Our member, Representative Costain, has a meeting that he needs to get to. Could his bill go next? I looked and I do no, not. No, I, I, it's fine. I'm surprised. Okay, go ahead. No, no. Right. But, I'm sorry. Excuse uh, me. Representative Costain, um, we're going Madam to- Madam Chair? Yes. I want you to know that I'm looking at the attendees and Representative Lemlin is not yes. here. Okay, yes. thank you. Yep. Um, so Actually, the next Rep bill- Representative Lemlin is here, just FYI. Under R. I, I will, uh, uh, two representatives, if Representative Costain or um, Representative Lemelin, if he's here just for this bill. Um, and Representative Costain, you have a place you have to go to? You wish yes. To? Okay. Um, Representative Lemelin, I guess. Um, it's kind of late in the day. I don't think you're in committee. If you don't mind, we'll go with Representative Costain. Senator Deshaun. Yes. Are you ready? Yes, go right ahead. Okay. Let uh, me just say the title, an act to prohibit maintaining drug involved premises. Thank you. 
Senator DeChambeau's, Representative Warren, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety. I'm Dan Costain, State Representative for House District 100, which includes the towns of Etna, Dixmont, Plymouth, Newport, and I'm here today in support of uh, LD 1035, an act to prohibit maintaining drug involved premises. I believe this bill is a very straightforward bill. Any individual who rents, leases, or otherwise prohibits a dwelling and has knowledge of drug related activity, it should be a crime. In this case, it would be a class C crime. The safety of our neighborhoods and the peace we all try to enjoy in our homes shouldn't be compromised by willing participant who knowingly provides an outlet for legal drug activity. So this bill uh, was asked uh, for me to put in from uh, MDEA uh, a couple of the agents came to me and asked me about it. And this bill merits a, mirrors a, uh, a federal bill that uh, pretty much is the exact same thing. The issue is, uh, they said sometimes the uh, federal bill is a hard bill to, to get prosecuted, et cetera. So they wanted to uh, try to put the same thing in under the, the state law. So I encourage you to support the bill as a tool to help law enforcement and to try to stay ahead of the epidemic um, that is illegal drug use and help maintain peaceful and lawful neighborhoods that we all can enjoy and, uh, and the safety of them. Uh, today, I, I had several other law enforcement that was gonna come and testify to this bill uh, my understanding is they've been out most of the night uh, and still working on a case right now. So that's why they couldn't be here today. So I request that during the public hearing, I mean, the work session, that we allow these gentlemen and ladies to, uh, to be asked any questions, not necessarily to testify, but to uh, be allowed to uh, ask questions of them at that time. And thank you very much for supporting this bill. Any questions of Representative Costain? Uh, Senator Searway. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, um, Representative <coughs> Costain, do you think that um, this basically is, you know, going after the ones that are getting paid to, to put up places for drug dealing? Is that basically what you're looking at or? Yes, for a prime example, and, and uh, uh, I happen to be an unfortunate person that uh, this happened to. I had a rental property uh, and I had a tenant there and she had somebody from out of state, basically in the back bedroom bringing drugs up from New York and she was peddling the drugs out of there. So uh, this would apply to her, okay? Because she's willingly and allowing it to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, so this crime would actually be to her. Now, if a landlord was allowing it, then the crime would be for the landlord. Uh, in my case, I didn't know anything about it. Uh, yeah. So it just happened to be that three or four months later, they came to me with this and asked me to uh, to present it. Thank you. I don't see any other questions raised hands. I will now ask if there are any co-sponsors or um, other legislators who wish to testify in favor of this bill. Seeing no hands. Thank you. I then will ask anyone from the public who wishes to testify in support of this bill. Please raise your hand. Again, seeing no hands. Thank you. 
Um, <clears throat> anyone wishing to testify in opposition of this bill, please raise your hand. There are, I'm bringing three people over. We'll begin with you, um, um, Attorney Natto. Thank you, Senator, and good afternoon, everyone. I know you have all had a very long day. So um, on behalf of Mac Dole, I'm going to present very brief testimony in opposition to 1035. Um, we understand Representative Costain's intent here. Um, we do believe that it is already covered in current law. Um, regarding trafficking. Uh, in Maine, we have what's called accomplice liability, um, which essentially means that um, if you are aiding or facilitating a crime, you are as guilty as the person who is doing the crime. So in the example Representative Costain just gave, where his tenant was allowing someone to traffic out of uh, the apartment, um, she would also be guilty of trafficking um, under the current law. So because of that, um, and knowing that unlawful trafficking in the aggravated sense is punishable by up to 30 years and regular trafficking is punishable by up to 10 years, we don't feel this bill is necessary in Maine, though we um, did discuss in our legislative committee um, the federal analog. It's just that in Maine, our accomplice liability statute would cover the behavior intended to be criminalized here. So happy to take questions on that count um, and thank you for allowing me to speak. Any questions from Ms. Nato? Senator Stairway? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you for, for explaining that, um, Ms. Nato. Uh, I just want to ask um, what about uh, supplying the place if they, you know, rather than kind of like an additional piece of, of uh, you know, buying and finding a place where they can do the, the dealing and whatever. And, and if the, and I understand what you're saying, kind of the accomplice type thing. And how often is that actually used being the accomplice? Or, uh, or a renter uh, leasing the place if they knew it? Has that I been don't used? Have, sure, thank you for the question. I don't have stats as to what prosecutors decide to charge as far as the facilitating, but the language I'm referring to is actually in the statute, which is 17A MRS section 57. So if you read that statute, which is the language involving encompassed liability, it's very broad which, uh, you know, when we're talking about facilitating or um, aid or attempting to aid someone in the commission of a crime, providing a location for that crime to be committed, whether it's the actual making of the drug or selling of the drug, would meet that definition and could be charged as such and would be the same class of crime. So whereas Representative Costine's bill recommends that this be a class C crime, under current law, it's actually a class A or class B crime, depending on the severity of the trafficking. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. No other questions? Thank you very much. I now will recognize uh, Kathleen London. Hello, esteemed panel, um, to Chair uh, Senator Deschambal and uh, Chairwoman uh, Representative Charlotte Warren and the rest of the committee. Um, my name is Dr. Kathleen London. I'm a family medicine physician in Millbridge and a second year law student at Maine Law. Um, and I'm standing in opposition to LD 1035 and I will send you in my, my comments. Our war on drugs has resulted in mass incarceration and the majority of our mental health treatment is now in prisons instead of in the community or other more appropriate settings. Drug fatality rates are continuing to rise from illegally manufactured fentanyl and other analogs at alarming rates. And with the continued approach that emphasizes punishment, it's really been failing. Deaths for the pandemic spiked last year to 88,000 at the 12 months that ended in August of 2020. And until we move to harm reduction strategies, more people are going to die. And we are going to continue to warehouse our population in prisons. 
America is 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the prison population. 64% of the prison population suffers from mental illness, of which substance use disorder is a subset. Internationally, if you look at rates of incarceration, America leads the way at 655 per 100,000 people incarcerated. Next comes El Salvador at rates of 618, Rwanda at 464, Russia at 383, and so on. We are so proud. The US um, federal prison population, if you look from 1925 to 2018, started on this path with the passage of the Controlled Substance Act. LD 1035 is not necessarily gonna target the right people. So we're gonna end up with more needless incarcerations that aren't going to serve the purpose of rehabilitation. We aren't treating people in prison. We aren't solving our opioid pro process. And this is not a step in the right direction. Thank you. And I'll take any questions and I will mail in my testimony. Thank you. Any questions of Ms. London? Seeing none, thank you. I then, um, uh, Ms. Fahey, is, is there anyone else? There was a third and they dropped off. Yeah, I thought so, okay. Um, any, so that was in opposition or is that, I'm not sure now. Yes, in opposition. I'm now looking for anyone who wishes to testify, neither for nor against. Please See, no show hand. it. No hands? Oh, there's one. Okay. I see Chelsea Putnam. Ms. Putnam, you will testify neither for nor against? Ms. Putnam, are you with us? If you're talking, you're muted. There you go. Oh, I'm not sure why it says Ms. Putnam, but my name is Courtney Pladson. My name, um, I am the director Excuse of could clinical- I have your name, Could I have your name again, Courtney, what? Yep, it's last name is Pladson. That's P-L-A-D as in dog, S-E-N. Okay, thank you. And first name is Courtney. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yes, um, I am actually a doctor. I provide substance use treatment to people in Portland, Maine. I'm also the director of clinical and quality improvement at the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. I am here today to testify against this bill. Um, what we're seeing now is that the overdose crisis is disproportionately impacting people of poverty, people experiencing homelessness, and people of color. We also, unfortunately, in the state of Maine, have over-representation of people of color in our prisons. We actually have the worst racial disparity in the entire country for people in our jails. And what we know is that the war on drugs specifically targets people in poverty, people who use drugs, people experiencing homelessness, and people of color. And this bill will continue to further marginalize people who really need additional support. Um, the harm reduction community, the research is very clear that increased access to syringes and needles helps engage people. It helps them enter into treatment, helps build positive relationships. But in addition to those, it really is a public health intervention in the same way that harm reduction has been utilized for, with in cars with seat belts, the way we use condoms to decrease sexually transmitted infections. Needles are used to help decrease rates of infections, HIV, hepatitis C, which are both cause a lifetime of harm and is exceptionally expensive in our country to treat. In addition to uh, access to clean needles helps to decrease rates of skin infections, which causes high rates of utilization of urgent cares and emergency departments, which are all needless infections um, in our community. So access to needles does not equate to increased drug use. Um, there's lots of research to support that, but there's lots of research to show that increased access to a safe supply of needles, new needles, helps actually engage people into treatment and help people move into recovery. And I also just wanna say that our, the people in the front lines and our syringe service programs are local heroes. These people are on the front lines of 
the overdose crisis and their outreach and their engagement in our community is life saving. So we wanna increase access to harm reduction. We wanna increase access and engagement with these really vital services. And so I am here in, in, in support against this bill. Thank you. And I welcome any questions. Any questions of Ms. Platson? Madam Chair, you might want to reannounce what bill we're on. Um, we are yeah. not at 994 yet, uh, although we did listen to your testimony. We are still on LD 1035, an act to prohibit drug involved premises. And I think, Madam Chair, wh what level are you at now, folks, neither for nor against? Yes. So if anybody's here to testify on LD 1035, and you are neither for nor against, please raise your hand now. Seeing none. So it looks like we're done with 1035. That was a good catch. I didn't pick up on that, Representative Warren. Thank you. Sure. Um, so, yes, we are now at 928. Oh, um, Representative Bernicki. Madam Chair, um, could I make a motion um, that we do allow um, at the work session for this, um, the individuals that um, Representative Costain um, um, referenced to um, be able to speak at the work session, please. Yes, I would ask, however, um, if Representative Costain would give me those names. Um, if it's MDA, I would ask that we not have four members of MDA, um, but- um, just, a remind, just a reminder, what Representative Costain, Representative Costain and I spoke earlier today, he is not asking for folks to testify. He is asking for folks to be here for the work session okay. to answer questions. So Representative Radicki, I would certainly second your motion, but that's not what the sponsor has asked for. Um, we did have a conversation this morning and everybody is able to be at the work session and I will certainly be one of the people to ask his folks to, to be able to answer our questions. Instead of presenting. All right, yeah. is that... Want that to happen? In that, Representative Bernecki, or do you have another concern? I, I guess my question would be to Representative Cassie. Is he still? Um... Uh, I believe if if they're allowed to answer questions, which they should be. Uh, I mean, I pretty much presented the bill. If anybody has any questions about the bill, they definitely could ask those questions. Uh, to them. Okay, then I'll withdraw my motion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. It's good when we look out for each other. I now will go to LD 928, an act to require adequate training for police officers who use speed measurement devices. Um, Representative Brenecki, your hand is still up. Okay. Um, so I would welcome uh, Representative Lemelin. Thank you, Senator. Uh, <clears throat> Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety. I am Representative Michael Lemelin. I represent District 88, Chelsea, Jefferson, Whitefield, and part of Novelboro. I'm here today to present LD 928, an act to require adequate training for police officers when <clears throat> who use uh, detection devices. Uh, many constituents and friends from around the area have brought to my attention the issues um, with traffic court. Uh, they feel that they received a ticket when they weren't speeding. Uh, all main courts are great. However, traffic court is run totally different. When you go to traffic court, you are told by the judge that you're entitled to a trial. However, the deck is totally stacked against you and you will lose. And of course, I'm paraphrasing here, um, but it's very accurate. 
by law, you cannot challenge the accuracy of the detection devices because they're prima facie, which means they stand alone. And since the police do not, are not required to have uh, tr explicit training in the use of these devices, you can't really challenge uh, their inability to use it. So in Maine, if you're pulled over and you get a ticket, even if the device or the officer may be in error, you must pay, pay the high ticket amount. Most of the officers in Maine do not have the knowledge to use uh, detection devices properly because of this lack of training. If even one person receives a ticket falsely, it is too much. You can go to traffic court and beg the officer and the court to listen to you. However, they're not going to because they don't have to. Um, they already know they're going to win no matter what. <clears throat> There are many ways to minimize the cost of this training. Maine collects millions of dollars on traffic violations and the additional cost could easily be absorbed by the fines. Tickets are over hundred dollars a piece. Training would be for officers who use detection devices only. Most manufacturers can provide this training. Officers receive training on arrest procedures, impairment detection, weapons training, when a person is not trained properly, many issues arrive, inaccurate equipment and the wrong vehicle ID to name a few. <clears throat> An overview of the use of these devices, which the police get now is just not enough. Police use many weapons and receive training, not just an overview. I can give a personal account of an event that happened. Uh, a few years ago, I was traveling down the main turnpike and three sports cars zoomed by me at 90 miles an hour. A few minutes later, I was pulled over and I saw the state trooper on the side of the road and I thought he was gonna go after the three speeding cars. He did not, he pulled me over. I was quite upset because I wasn't speeding. I was in a minivan with my fa entire family and I knew right away why I was pulled over and not those vehicles. And it was because of the inadequate training. When a police officer is sitting on the side of the road and his back, the back of the car is facing heavy traffic on the turnpike, without extensive training, it is nearly impossible to pick out the proper vehicle or vehicles that were speeding. So all I'm asking here is that police officers get adequate training so that they know how to use the devices in which they're in care of. Thank you. I have um, Representative Renecki. I don't know if that's an old hand. Okay. I've got Representative Pickett followed by Representative Kostain. Good afternoon, Representative Lemlin. Uh, I guess the question I have for you, sir, is where did you get your information uh, and your statistics about police officers not being trained to use speed devices and uh, and not be familiar with how to with how to use those? Uh, do, do you mind telling me where you got that information? Uh, one from asking the police officers, and two from reading the testimony of the. Uh, gentleman, Mr. Dish Jardins, who's a training officer who says he gives him an overview. Okay. Okay. And uh, so your, your, your bill is to train these officers to learn how to use a traffic radar, correct? Properly. Yes. No. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Representative Costain, followed by Senator Samway. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sir, I just wanted to uh, ask, uh, so you checked with the Academy on, on their training standards? No, I did not. Okay, so I've been a police officer for 35 years. And uh, 
I was trained adequately in the academy. And I do believe if you get the train records of the academy, it's, it's being done now. We had, uh, I believe, back way back when I took it, it was like a day or a day or two training uh, on radar training. And then once you went back to your police department, you had to set with a, a certified individual that was certified and do visual estimates on top of that. So uh, I don't believe anything has changed as far as that. So maybe for the work session, uh, we should have the director of the academy in to, uh, to clarify what the training is on uh, the certification of RADA. Representative Castain, would you accept that uh, Ms. Overton would get the curriculum uh, and present that and Mr. Um, in the work session, uh, Mr. Deschardin could be here if he needed follow-up questions? That would be great. Okay. Now, um, I don't see Ms. Overton. She's probably listening. So we'll take a note on that um, to look at the academy curriculum on that and the training. Um, are you uh, all done, uh, Representative Castain? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Senator Seaway. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Representative Lemon, Lemelin, right? I, uh, I had spoke to Dave Tirol, who was at the Academy this morning, and he said that they do two days of training just for radar. And, uh, and so um, I would, I'd, how do you, um, what do you expect for the training, and also they have updates too. They update and make sure they get retrained if they feel that they're, uh, they've are they been a while. So um, what would you suggest to be over that? Or, or what do you think that this bill will do over that? Nothing over that, if that's accurate. I, from, when I talk to police officers about the use of the radar, um, they tell me that they're getting training that says basically they are told how to use a tuning fork to test the device at the beginning. And then I was told by them that they basically get, you know, you if you're sitting in your car and you turn it on and it goes off, you look up and grab the person that uh, is going the fastest is what they told me. So maybe they're just fibbing to me. That's why I'd love to see that training. And if it is extensive and, and then in two days, then I'll be glad to, to drop out of this. And I had experienced it myself in the academy amongst these other uh, two that spoke. So I, I, I just, uh, maybe you might want to touch base with them between now and the work session and, and talk to them a little bit about it too. Thank you. Senator Seway, I think at our work session, we'll get that yeah. kind of uh, report. Yeah. Um, I Thank totally you. agree with you. Thank you. Um, I don't see uh, any other hands. I now will ask uh, if there are any co-sponsors or other legislators who wish to speak in favor of this uh, bill? Seeing no hand, Senator. Okay, thank you. Anyone wishing to speak um, in support, please raise your hand. Again, seeing none. And now we'll turn to anyone in opposition of this bill, please raise your hand. I'm bringing um, Rick Desjardins over. Well, there he is. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Deschardin. We're about to see you just about every meeting now. Go right ahead. Great to see everyone. Thank you, uh, 
Senator DeChambeau and, uh, and Representative Warren uh, and Representative Lemel, and thank for thank you for bringing this topic up. Uh, I, I do want to just uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, I'm in opposition to the bill, I, I'm happy to share the curricula and and echo what some of the other um, representatives talk about in Senator they, that uh, have experienced the training at the academy. And, and I just want to clarify, uh, sir, you did read uh, my. My, in my testimony, our overview is of a variety of measuring devices, but there's multiples out there. So we, we try to cover as many as we possibly can. But in essence, what uh, the Academy does is a two day, 16 hour, uh, pretty intensive uh, course of study that really delves into the science behind speed measurements. And, uh, and it also requires officers uh, demonstrate proficiency in, in measuring estimations of speed prior to using the instrument to confirm what they're seeing for speed. But um, again, happy to work with you in the, in the work session to provide that curricula. Um, you know, the concern obviously for the academy's perspective is we, you know, we use uh, instructors that are well-trained and, 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 and very versatile in using a, a variety of uh, equipment, but there's lots and lots of equipment and in your bill, sir, it's, uh, it, it's, it's clear that we would have to essentially have every device that was available uh, in the state and that would be very difficult for us to do. Uh, in addition Mr. to that, Ms. Jordan, oh, can yes. I just interrupt here? Um, this is obviously a public hearing. If you had testimony, it, it sounds to me everything you're saying is what we would take into consideration at a work session. Yep, uh, it's in my testimony. Okay. okay, so you submitted testimony? I did, yes. And, yeah, and between now and um, I think the work session of uh, Representative Lemelin would be um, a week from this Friday. And you probably would have time. You are in the Chelsea area to uh, skip over. I'm sure Mr. Disjardin could accommodate you and show you um, or however you want to do it, uh, especially COVID. I don't know if you're letting public in, so that's up to you. But um, you can send him what he needs to review it, right? So, okay. I can provide it to the uh, to whomever is needed. Yes. Yep. We asked Ms. Orbiton to get that for us. Yep. Did you hear that, Ms. Orbiton? We're, we're asking for the curricula from uh, the academy having to do with uh, devices, speed training on that. Um, yes, and, and I'm back. I Deb moved me inadvertently to the attendee list. So. Oh it's late in the day to play jokes. I'm back. <laughs> okay, did you hear that then? You did? Thank you. I was wondering where you went. <laughs> Sounds like April Fools all over again. Okay. Um, so any question of uh, Representative Pickett, you have your hand up, go right ahead. Yes, I do, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so, Director, uh, the two days, two day uh, training that you, uh, that you have at the Academy, um, in that training, the cadets, or those that are in there on the training, they learn the mechanism of what the machine, of what the, uh, radar is, they learn how to, that there's an internal calibration as well as a tuning fork calibration. They learn that some, some radars are probably most radars now can radar front and back, front and back on, on them. And also uh, something that uh, uh, Representative Costain uh, spoke about and I found very interesting way back when, if I can remember that's back when, back when, probably as old as dirt, but anyways, I can remember back when I got taken out when I was at the academy, out onto the interstate, and I, I'm asking if they still do the same thing as part of the training, where they took me out on the interstate, and then we sat in the, and we sat in the medium, and I had to take, and they had 10 vehicles, and I had to come within five miles an hour of that speed by a visual in order to be able to pass, pass the course that I was taking at that time, just so that I would be able to tell tell and be able to look at a car and, and come within a certain speed by a visual and then taking if I looked up and saw a car speeding I could I say to myself that car is going too fast and then confirm it 
with the radar of the actual speed it was going. Is that part of the training as well? That is correct. And we're you know, obviously we're here in Vassar, so we typically will use 201 or we'll sometimes uh, scoot out to the highway. But for the most part, yeah, they are required to meet a certain um, standard with estimations. And um, and again, those are those are um, done in various speed zones so that they're not you know limited to just a rural road. They'll they'll take them out to different locations to make sure they're able to do those speed estimates. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is everything, any other questions for, um, Director Deschardin, seeing none? Um, we are at, um, those who wish to speak in opposition of this bill. If there's anyone who wishes to raise their hand. Seeing none. Okay. Anyone wishing to um, present testimony neither for nor against this bill? See Again, none? seeing none. All right, thank you. So as I said, the work session's a week from Friday and on LD, I just forgot it. Whatever this, <laughs> this bill, oh, LD 928. I will um, close the public hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Thank you. Uh, Rep Representative Pickett. Yes, Madam Chair. I was wondering, uh, because of the hour of the day and because we know that, uh, I believe it's going to be uh, 994 is probably going to be a lengthy, a lengthy uh, public hearing. I'm wondering if we could uh, possibly go to... Uh, 1128 and the other two which are on the same thing which should be quite fairly short and do those first before we get in so that those people wouldn't have to be waiting and waiting and waiting just wondering if that would be possible you know what i missed that whole second line <laughs> so um i don't i have to disagree representative and i'm sorry but they've all been waiting Yes. Uh, the folks for LD nine ninety four they plan they've been here since two o'clock. So yeah, and I and I understand that, but but the my 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 thing is is we know this next one is going to be probably longer than the one we did before, and so where these other ones should be fairly short, I would I you know I would think that we could take care of them and then have that long one for the end, but. Neither here nor there. I'm just trying to think of everybody involved. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. I have been, as I do, I am in contact with the sponsors. A couple of the sponsors that had later bills needed them to be later because they have other things going on. Um, so I'd like to keep the schedule as it is. Um, as you know, we receive texts before the days and of the day, during the days of people that were trying to, you know, keep the schedule going. So I'd like to keep it as it is. I will follow the schedule. Um, <clears throat> the next one is 994, an act to promote public health by eliminating criminal penalties for possession of hypodermic apparatuses. And that's Representative McDonald. Are you with us, Representative McDonald? I see a Genevieve McDonald, is that? Yes. yes. Yeah. Welcome, uh, Representative McDonald. I just saw, oh, there you are. Good, you popped up. Thank you. I'm happy to be here today. Thank you. Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety. I am Representative Genevieve McDonald of House District 134, and I'm testifying before you today as the sponsor of LD 994, an act to promote public health by eliminating criminal penalties for possession of hypodermic apparatuses. 
Maine continues to move away from penalizing people with substance use disorder in the criminal justice system. We are recognizing and approaching the opioid epidemic as a public health issue and opting for a sharper focus on support, treatment, and prevention. This is a more effective approach to tackling Maine's opioid overdose crisis and is critical Maine's criminal code reflects this life-saving change in strategy. Currently in Maine, possession, possessing 11 or more hypodermic syringes is a class D crime, even when they are unused. That can result in a sentence of up to 354 days in jail and a fine of up to $2,000. LD994 is written makes five changes to how Maine law treats hypodermic syringes. The crime of illegal possession of hypodermic syringes would be eliminated. If someone possesses a hypodermic syringe with residue of drugs, that would no longer be considered criminal possession of those drugs. Providing hypodermic syringes to others who may not be able to obtain them on their own would no longer be considered an act of legal trafficking. It declassifies items used for ingesting drugs, as well as testing strips and other items used to determine the contents of a drug from the de definition of drug paraphernalia. It takes similar action to item four under the Maine Pharmacy Act. Others testifying before you today will provide more in-depth information, but allow me to provide a broad sense of why we need to move forward with this important legislation. Having laws in place that discourage the acquisition and use of clean hypodermic syringes increases the spread of diseases such as HIV and hepatitis C and other serious, sometimes life-threatening infections and does not help people break free from addiction. From a fiscal standpoint, the hospitalization costs of these illnesses are unfavorable for patients, their families, taxpayers, and our healthcare system. Hypodermic syringe laws push people away from treatment options and closer to dangerous situations. We want people to seek out help and syringe service programs are one of the places where this is possible. This change in law would allow people to use these programs without fear of unnecessary interactions with law enforcement. Municipalities across the state are working to establish safe disposal locations. If it were not a crime to possess hypodermic syringes, people would be less compelled to get rid of them quickly and more likely to dispose of hypodermic syringes safely. Burdening someone with a criminal record does not help them. It does not discourage injection or other types of drug use. It does not stop people from using drugs. It potentially jeopardizes their employment, their family stability and other areas of their lives. In addition to serving in the legislature, I'm a commercial fisherman. Opiate addiction has had a significant impact on my industry. Bills such as this are one of the tools we need to save the lives of our friends, neighbors, and loved ones before it's too late. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today, and I'd be happy to take questions from the committee. Thank you, Representative McDonald. Any questions for Representative McDonald? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. We're now taking testimony from any co-sponsors or legislators here to testify on this bill. If you're here to testify, please raise your hand. Seeing no hands, Representative. Thank you. We're now taking testimony in support of this bill. If you're here to testify in support of this bill, please raise your hand and we'll move you over. I will bring over the first three. Thank you, Deb. Am I on? Yes, you are. Okay. Hi, guys. Um, my name is Carrie Morissette, and I am the executive director of the Church of Safe Injection. Even more than that, today I approach you as just a normal human being. Isn't that what we all are, just human beings? I didn't always feel like I belonged in normal communities because of the stigma around drug use. I have lived quite a life in my 12 years of active using. I have had endocarditis three times from using unsterile supplies and from reusing and, using, reusing and using the same supplies over and over again because I was terrified of being caught with them. Because of these choices, I am also living with HIV. Because there was a time that sharing syringes was part of my daily routine. I know that the debate will be never ending whether addiction is a choice or a disease. But as someone who is currently in recovery from a 12 year addiction, I'm here to tell you that it doesn't matter. 
I am still human and I still live in this community. Although I am acknowledged now because I am in recovery, I still have to carry my past using days with me wherever I go. I still have to wake up and take a pill with me every day. And I still have to have checkups all the time because I'm not sure when my heart is going to give out. Sorry. Um, I speak to you today as someone who has survived addiction on the streets and life-threatening situations. It is, it's not about anything besides keeping our community safe and incarcerating them won't help. How can we throw someone in jail for trying to be healthy and use safe using supplies? I support LD94 because I want to help stop the spread of HIV and lower the number of cases on endocarditis in any way I can. I support LD994 because it's the right thing to do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Morissette, for sharing your story. That's not an easy thing to do. Up next, we have Representative Zagar. We, Zagar, we didn't see you. Please go ahead. Uh, thank, thank you. Here. Thank you so much, uh, Representative Warren. Um, I realize how long you, you all have been, so I'm going to abbreviate even my brief testimony that I submitted. Uh, my name is Sam Zager, honored to represent uh, District 41 um, and, uh, and speak uh, as a co-sponsor of this bill. And I thank Representative Donald for uh, submitting it. Um, <clears throat> appreciate this uh, uh, good and honorable committee hearing it. I'm going to mention destigmatization. Destigmatizing substance use disorder is a real thing. It really saves lives. Harm reduction is a real thing. I've as a doctor, been there on the other side and seeing people who have uh, survived near death experiences from opioids go on to have very fruitful lives, uh, working lives, family lives, uh, very enriched. Um, it's a beautiful thing. It's so evidence-based that the American Medical, Medical Association, this is doctors from across America, all different specialties, have a policy supporting the repeal of paraphernalia laws, just like LD-994. SSPs uh, are, are um, uh, uh, syringe um, exchange programs, uh, service programs. This uh, would help um, optimize their effectiveness. Uh, even though this isn't particularly about SSPs, it, it optimizes their effectiveness. Um, and, um, and of course, they, they are, they're effective in, in that they, um, they, they, they're, they're the humane thing to do. Number one, they, they save lives. Um, they're also much, much, much less expensive than treating HIV, hepatitis C. Uh, we just heard Ms. Morissette uh, give uh, her personal testimony. Um, uh, so even if people did not care about the lives that we were saving, which is, I think, crucial, um, saving $485,000 um, for HIV or uh, $47,000 for hepatitis C treatment, um, should matter to anybody who, who has uh, public responsibility. Um, so with, with that, I will, uh, I will um, close and thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Representative Zager. Any questions for the representative? Seeing none, thank you again for your testimony. Thank Up you. next, I see Courtney Allen and then Matthew Fortin. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, Senator DeChambault, Representative Warren, and members of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. My name is Courtney Allen. I am the Policy Director for the Maine Recovery Advocacy Project. I've been before your committee a few times this session, so I'm just going to jump right in. Um, I'm here today to testify in favor of LD-994. There are a lot of public health reasons to support this bill, which you'll hear about today. But for us at the Maine Recovery Advocacy Project, the bottom line is that this bill sends a clear message that the state of Maine will no longer buy into the idea that people who use drugs and people with substance use disorder are criminals. Is it a clear message that we value and support all Mainers and want them to be well? That we are not only going to say that substance use disorder is a disease, that we are going to match our policies with our rhetoric. This bill is also a nod to one of Maine's greatest recovery and harm reduction advocates, Jesse Harvey. Many of you may remember him and folks who don't, um, you, miss, you missed the champion. He was our dear friend. And this bill is graduated, uh, grounded in what Jesse always knew and what he fought for until the day that he died that harm reduction is a valid and important pathway to wellness, 
as much as any other form of recovery from substance use disorder. We support this bill simply because it is the right thing to do. We cannot keep sending mixed messages about substance use disorder. It cannot continue to be illegal to possess the harm reduction supplies a person needs to prevent infections and spread the spread hepatitis C. If we want to turn the tide on the addiction crisis in Maine, we cannot solely focus on recovery coaches, medication assisted treatment, recovery houses, and all the things that fit nicely into our public narratives. We must always also turn our eyes to systemic reform and the honoring of harm reduction as a valid pathway to wellness. The decriminalization of needles and other supplies is the first step in our journey. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Any questions? Yes, Senator Searway. <laughs> that. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Allen, uh, just uh, I appreciate you uh, speaking. I I was going to ask you what, how do you uh, get people to that have the problem and are using needles? How do they? Do, would you get them to come to you to get help if they didn't get charged? Because lots of times. The charge is just a, a tool to get them the help. And if they don't have that, then how do we give them to you? Yeah, Senator Car uh, Carway, thank you so much for that question. Um, so at the Maine Recovery Advocacy Project, we don't do any frontline uh, work with folks, but I will say that I'm also a person in long-term recovery and do a lot of mutual aid uh, with people on the ground. And you know, what we know about substance use disorder is that incarceration and criminalizing um, the needles that folks need to um, get the medicine that it's making them feel better is, is, not, is not actually helping folks get into recovery. When we want, when we, when people wanna enter recovery, we want them to do it when they are ready because we can force abstinence through incarceration and other uh, ways but recovery and forced abstinence are two very, very different things, right? And so we want, we, we encourage folks to always, we want to meet people where they're at. And when they're ready, then we take them into the recovery community and folks who are ready. And it's not. Just to follow up on that, I've had individuals tell me that they, the only way that they could get out of it is by being arrested. They felt there was no way out for them. And uh, they felt that they had to, and it got them to that point. I mean, I had some selling mobile homes of somebody else's home before, and it just, you know, it was that bad ad addiction. And uh, it just, he said that the only way he could be stopped is that way. So how do we do that if we take the decriminalize it? Yeah, you know, I, I, I've, heard, I've heard people in my community say the same thing. And what I like to think about is we need to reimagine the world in which we live in, right? Where there's another system that folks can get what they need, treatment and recovery and safety, that's not inside of, inside of a cage, right? Not inside of a place where we're disconnecting folks from our community. Instead, we're bringing them into our community because what we know is that recovery is founded and grounded in connection and community. And this bill doesn't take away all of the other ways that folks are going to be incarcerated for substance no. use. It just honors the fact that we know that substance use disorder is a disease and that when people are using drugs through HIV, uh, through IV drug use, it's a symptom of their disease, right? There's still going to be all the other criminal charges that we put on folks for all the other ways in which they behave in the world. This is just one simple, small piece of legislation that will help ensure that we're not spreading HIV uh, in our communities with folks who are using drugs and that they have access to what they need for now until they're ready to do something different. Thank Does you. that answer your question? Yeah, somewhat, <laughs> thank you. Seeing no more questions from Ms. Allen. Ms. Allen, thank you for being here and thank you for mentioning Jesse Harvey. We couldn't do this 
hearing without mentioning him. So I appreciate that. Up next, we have Mr. Fortin, welcome. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Representative Warren and members of the committee. Thank you for allowing me to provide testimony. I know it's I've been following along and it's been a, a long day for you. So good job uh, keeping on. My name is Matthew Fortin. I'm a second year law student and former teacher from Westbrook. Uh, I'm in my final week as an extern for the Maine Medical Association. And so I've been given the honor of speaking with you today in my very first testimony. Today on behalf of MMA, I testify in strong support of LD 994. <clears throat> Sorry, I provided written testimony that links to MMA's ongoing efforts against the opioid crisis, along with links to the uh, American Medical Association's efforts to battle the crisis, as Dr. Zager mentioned earlier. I encourage you all to view those when you can. I'm here today with two hats on, with my main Medical Association hat on. This bill makes sense. Removing a roadblock to recovery makes sense medically. Treating substance use disorder as a disease and not a crime is a human-centered approach that our membership strongly believes in. Decriminalizing possession of hypodermic apparatuses encourages those seeking medication-assisted treatment to continue on that path using clean and sterile equipment, reducing their incentive to reuse needles and expose themselves to various diseases. And with my law student hat on, this bill still makes sense. You've heard it from a couple doctors already today, one being a classmate of mine. Our war on drugs has not worked. It's short-sighted, only temporarily putting substance users out of view instead of actually addressing them and helping. It's time to be proactive in the policy making, and it involves a shift of mindset. Instead of laws that cause folks to fear law enforcement interaction, we should be striving to create an environment that gives people greater incentive to seek treatment. This is a chance for a compassionate change to law. Thank you for allowing me to speak with you. MM MMA urges you to vote ought to pass. I will happily attempt to answer any questions you may have. Well, thank you, Mr. Fortin. And for your first testimony, you did very well. So good job. Thank any you. questions for Mr. Fortin? Do you, go, do you get to go by doctor yet? Not yet, I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> Uh, okay, Senator Searway, do you have a clarifying question, Senator yes. Searway? Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so what happens if a family member has a problem with their spouse or, or a parent and, and they're using needles and they want something done, what, what alternative would they have with this law decriminalized? And, and if the person doesn't want to get help. I'm not sure that I uh, would be the person to, to quite answer that well enough, but um, my supervisor, Dan Morin, can be at the work session and he might be able to help you from a physician standpoint. I'm sorry. Any other questions for Mr. Fortin? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Fortin. Up next, oh, Senator DeChambeau. Oh, you're muted, Senator. Thank you, and thank you, Representative Warren. I just want a clarification, Mr. Fortin, because maybe it's my hearing, but you said you were speaking on behalf of MM. Maine Medical Association, the physicians. Maine Medical Association. <laughs> As soon as you said MMA, uh, Maine Municipal Association, and sure. I was ready to say, I doubt it. But anyway. <laughs> I thought okay. that at first too, Senator. <laughs> I know, that's, <clears throat> you, you'll know not to use that MMA again. Okay, uh, thank you, Maine Medical, thank you. <clears throat> up next, did we have, Anna Brewer up next. Apologies, I just got a new work computer today and it was dying and I'm like, how do I plug it in? We <laughs> made it, we're gonna get there. I also spent this hearing trying to set up my new computer. I know oop, it's been a long day for you guys on the committee. So thanks for listening to our testimony. So good afternoon, Senator DeChambault, Representative Warren, and distinguished members of the Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety. My name is Anna Brewer, and I am a team leader at Preble Street. 
I am here today to testify on behalf of Preble Street in support of LD994, which would decriminalize the possession of certain hypodermic apparatuses. As many of you probably know, Preble Street is an anti-poverty human services organization that operates programs throughout the state of Maine, assisting people who are experiencing homelessness, hunger, and poverty. At Preble Street, our mission of providing low barrier services means that we believe in and practice harm reduction. While we believe in and practice compassion and acceptance as a part of our harm reduction strategy, people who use intravenous drugs experience significant stigma in community and healthcare settings, which creates barriers to engaging in healthcare, seeking services, and accessing emergency services during a medical event, such as an overdose. This, stig this stigma is enabled by policies that criminalize substance use disorder, including the policies that this bill seeks to change. Every day, state policies on substance use, which are counter to the principles of harm reduction, harm the people we work with and detract from public health. As many of you may know, in 2020, Maine experienced the most overdose deaths on record. And according to the data for 2021, we are set to outpace our 2020 record. At Preble Street, this is incredibly personal. As we lose too many clients, one is too many, but we lose too many clients every year to preventable overdoses. While the significant rise in overdoses has been linked to the challenges of the pandemic, the effect of things that are addressed in this bill cannot be overlooked. For example, fentanyl used to be mainly mixed with heroin and opioids. However, now we're seeing it being mixed with many substances, not just opioids. A part of fentanyl's danger is that it increases the likelihood of an overdose. For this reason, testing supplies, which allow people to use and test their substances to see if they have been mixed with, with fentanyl, are incredibly important and a matter of life and death. If we want to reverse the trend of rising overdose deaths in our state, we must decriminalize testing supplies as, as outlined in this bill. I know some people before me have also addressed the, the um, statute that would allow people to possess more than 10 needles and have highlighted the fact that um, when, when people are unable to possess more than 10 needles, it can lead to reuse of needles. So when clients reuse needles due to the e illegality of possessing more than 10 needles at a time, their health, our public health and our healthcare system all suffer. Most infections caused by reusing hypodermic supplies require long inpatient hospital stays. And this disrupts the work that the people we work with are doing to engage and connect with the services that they need to find treatment and housing. When we stop criminalizing the possession of more than 10 needles, we will end needless incarceration for people who are struggling and need addiction, additional community resources, not fewer. Anna, you're at the end of your time. So if you could wrap up, please. Yeah. I, yeah. As Preble Street caseworkers see every day, the combined stigma and criminalization of substance use disorder make the difference between housing and homelessness, recovery and continued use, or le and life and death. We believe in harm reduction because we know that everyone deserves an equal chance at a fulfilling life, regardless of whether they use substances intravenously. Preble Street asks that you please support this legislation because by doing so, you'll be, you'll be supporting our neighbors who are most in need. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you. Up next, I have Mickey Rice. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you for listening to our testimony today. I know you've all been sitting here for a while. Um, okay, so. Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and distinguished members of the Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety, thank you for allowing me to speak in support of LD994. My name is Mickey Rice and I live in Freeman Township. I'm 33 and a social worker, but today I speak to you as a person in recovery. I very much appreciate this chance to talk in support of LD994. When I was 17, I started injecting Oxycontin. I used that way for about a year and a half and I had gotten introduced to it by a boyfriend at the time. And I kept using that way because I could feel the effects of the oxys much faster um, than any other way of using. When I first started using, I told myself, uh, well, when I first started injecting, I told myself I would only use clean needles. Then one day I didn't have access to, those ne to clean needles. And I told myself that 
it was no big deal to just use one that my boyfriend had used um, because, you know, I knew he was clean. Um, after a year and a half of dating him um, and us using together, we broke up. And a few months after that, I stopped using um, and without any law enforcement, um, by the way. Fast forward four years later, I was now married with a two-year-old and I had maintained my sobriety. I'm at home one day and I get word from a friend that had heard that my ex had tested positive for hepatitis C. Of course, I'm freaking out at that point and I called my doctor and got tested. I waited a few days. I think it was closer to a week or two, but it was so long ago that I can't remember. One thing that I can remember though and that I'll never forget is getting the call saying that I was po hepatitis C positive. It felt like I got punched in the stomach. I was driving <clears throat> I was driving when the doctor called and I had to pull over because I started crying. Many questions <clears throat> swirled through my head. What if I had given it to my child to my two-year-old child? What if I had given it to my husband? If my husband didn't leave me for giving it to him, he surely would for giving it to our child. And I definitely didn't, wouldn't worst that on my worst enemy, much less the people that I care about the most. I'd even thought of committing suicide at one point. Luckily, my doctor didn't tell me at the time that you can test positive for antibodies and not have it in your RNA. I am one of the few small percentage of people that was able to spontaneously clear the infection myself. Um, now, Maine's rate of hepatitis C has been increasing since at least 2013. Per the CDC, in 2019, 41% of positive hepatitis C cases were due to people injecting drugs. We know that increasing access to clean needles by employing strategies such as decriminalizing hypodermic apparatuses and creating programs to help people access clean syringes decreases the rates of bloodborne diseases such as hep C and HIV. I encourage you to support LD994 to promote public health by ending the criminalization of hypodermic apparatuses. Thank you for listening to my testimony. Thank you, Ms. Rice, for sharing your story with us. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you again. Thank you. Deb will now move over our next group of testifiers. Good afternoon still, Whitney. I'm gonna do the timer here for a bit. So welcome and go ahead. Thank you, Representative Warren. Um, members of the committee, you've been here a long time and I will go as quickly as I can. It is an honor to be in front of you. I am Whitney Parrish, the Advocacy and Communications Director for Health Equity Alliance. And we are here today testifying in very strong support of LD994 because if we're serious as a state about addressing the harm that can be caused by problematic drug use, we must commit ourselves to treating that drug use as a public health issue rather than a criminal matter. To do this, we must align our laws in a way that reduces the compounding harm of outdated or over-criminalization of life-saving tools and strategies. For years, the state of Maine has recognized the importance of the life-saving and health-improving harm reduction practices that my organization and many others across the state offer every day to our participants. HEAL operates seven of the state's 14 Maine CDC certified syringe services programs, where we distribute new sterile works like syringes, provide other supplies and educate on safer use strategies, connect clients with support and services like recovery services through targeted case management, alert the community to overdose spikes and distribute naloxone. These are just a few of our services. And we know through our work and extensive evidence that these strategies work and they work best when people are not criminalized and harmed for accessing them. Harm reduction is not just a buzzword term. It refers to the policies, programs, and practices that seek to minimize negative health, social, and legal impacts associated with drug use, drug policies, and drug laws. It focuses on positive change and on working with people without judgment, coercion, discrimination, or requiring that pe people must stop using drugs as a precondition of support and love. It recognizes that even if you limit access to things like new syringes or safer use supplies, people will still use drugs, as you've heard, and they could do so in ways that cost them their health and their lives. Access to syringe, syringes promote better health and safer use, just like naloxone promotes breathing, access to new syringes and supplies does not promote drug use. 
lack of access promotes unsafe drug use. There's more in my, there's a lot of testimony, um, but I will uh, keep going with one key evidence-based stra strategy is to support our loved ones with using drugs more safely. When a person uses a new needle every time they inject or they test their supply to understand what's in it, the rate of overdose and diseases like HIV and hepatitis drop significantly. We must meet people where we're at. The relationships we build with our programs can be life-saving and we need the ability to build these relationships without putting people we love in harm's way. Through our work, SSPs help reduce the transmission of hepatitis, HIV, and other bloodborne infections. Access is associated with approximately a 50% reduction in HIV and HCV incidences. These infections, as you've heard, are costly. By comparison, arresting a person for possession of sterile syringes has been associated with sharing and reusing syringes leading to elevated risk of disease and contraction of associated cost. We've also been talking at length about opioid use when the landscape is shifting rapidly. While fentanyl still adulterates drug supplies, methamphetamines and other stimulant use is rising. Not everyone who uses drugs injects them and reusing supplies can put them at great risk as well. And I have citations in my testimony related to that. So why is this all important? As Ms. you've heard, possession, you wrap I will wrap up, absolutely. Thank and you. I would absolutely encourage folks to read through the testimony as there are lots of citations and probably answers to questions. Uh, so we all wrap up by saying that even as a registered participant of our program, you are still subject to criminal penalty for accessing our services. At least 11 states have decriminalized drug paraphernalia in December, DC joined that group. Last week, Maryland did, and we believe Maine should be next. So we urge you strongly to support LD994 and vote ought to pass. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much for your testimony. Questions for Ms. Parrish? Seeing none. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Chelsea Putnam. Hi, everybody. Welcome. All right. So good afternoon, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and the re members of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. My name is Chelsea Putnam. I'm a resident of Holton, Maine, and a person in long-term recovery, which to me means that I'm a mother to my daughter and an advocate for recovery and harm reduction in my community. However, two years ago, I had a very different story. Um, I really could have used some of the harm reduction programs we now have today. All that aside, I now have my own apartment, an amazing job with main access points, as the Aroostook County Program Director for a syringe access program, and I'm living a life worth living. Um, I'm here to testify in favor of LD 994, an act to promote public health by eliminating criminal penalties for possession of hypodermic apparatuses. Right now we're living in a public health crisis and this bill could create the change we need to move forward in harm reduction. Currently the law is that a person is allowed to carry up to 10 syringes, actually up to 11, um, but syringe access programs are certified through the state CDC to distribute syringes, um, but some participants of these programs are criminalized, like Whitney said. Um, the community of people who use drugs deserve to have access to these supplies. Um, they need them to keep themselves well. The rates of hepatitis keep rising, especially in small towns such as mine, uh, where people who use drugs can't access these kind of treatments or equipment they need to avoid these diseases as dangerous as this. When the law num uh, limits the number of syringes people can have at one time, it forces people to reuse, uh, which is very dangerous and creates an influx of patients in the hospital needing treatment for things such as infections like endocarditis. Um, the risk of these diseases with all types of drug use, which is why syringe service programs offer access to safe supplies. They offer also services such as peer support, overdose education, naloxone, and referral to community partners which can create that recovery that um, the senators were asking about earlier. Syringe service programs, such as main access points and many others, have helped to reduce these risks and harm experienced by people who use drugs. Promoting syringe service program access by decriminalizing syringes will provide people with access to naloxone and other supplies, as well as the resources they need when they need them. These resources could potentially offer a pathway to recovery for someone actively using and could keep people we love from being stigmatized and incarcerated. The criminalization of paraphernalia has kept people who use drugs away from the care they need, and now is the time to get it. People recognize the need 
please recognize the needs of people who use drugs, people in recovery, and those affected by substance use disorder. Decrimin decriminalizing safe use supplies will give access to those that need it most. Thank you for giving me this time and I can answer any questions. Thank you, Chelsea. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Next, I have Anna McConnell. Thank you, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and the members of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. My name is Anna McConnell. I'm providing testimony on behalf of Maine Access Points um, and in support of LD 994. Uh, as a syringe access program here in Maine, certified by the Maine Center for Disease Control, uh, our program provides access to safe use supplies, harm reduction education, overdose education, and naloxone distribution. We provide these uh, services and our programs in Aristic County, Washington, and York counties. And in this role, we are keenly aware of the impact that this bill would have on people both across the state and especially for people in our rural communities. While our certified programs are legally permitted to distribute safe use supplies, our participants are criminalized for accessing this very public health resource that we distribute. And the national CDC recommends distributing these supplies within a needs-based model, that is providing individuals with as many syringes or other safe use supplies as they need. Moreover, if a friend or a family member is in need of sterile supplies, it's currently illegal for our participants to share those with others who don't have access. Based on decades of research, the CDC recognizes that these programs that allow for secondary distribution decrease the transmission of HIV, viral hepatitis, other illnesses that you've heard of today, um, and we think that it's essential that we move forward in decreasing these barriers for people to access programs like ours, which are publicly funded um, by the state of Maine. During this pandemic, we have seen a really rapid increase in both fatal and non-fatal overdoses due to this contaminated and unpredictable drug supply. So this bill would also allow our participants to safely utilize fentanyl testing supplies so that people who use drugs can be more informed about what substances are in the drugs that they're using. Moreover, when we engage people in our programs by distributing these safer injecting, smoking or snorting supplies, we're then able to connect them with naloxone, a medication that reverses overdose and provide them with the education they need. However, when we do continue to cr criminalize these supplies, our participants are forced with this impossible question, do I risk criminalization and jail time to stay alive and healthy? Or do I keep reusing that same syringe to avoid having these legal consequences? We call on you today uh, as our lawmakers to help save lives and to stand on the side of justice to ensure the dignity and respect of all of our neighbors in Maine. Please do not hesitate to contact us with any further questions or if we can provide the committee with any further information. I'm very grateful for your time. Thank you, Anna. Any questions for Anna? Yes, Senator Searway, you have a question? Yes. I, I happen to go to Canada, to Vancouver, and they have a similar system. And um, Hastings Street is like a war zone of drugs. And it was a rude awakening when I was there. The law enforcement told me how bad it was. And so I'm wondering, how do we deter drug use if we're allowing it? It's a great question. I think one of the most important things for the committee to remember is that syringe service programs like ours actually increase the likelihood of connecting someone to treatment services by five times. So if someone is five times more likely to decide to go the route of medication assisted treatment um, or other forms of moderation or management of their substance use by connecting with programs like ours where they can build trust, build relationship and access those resources that they need when they're still using. And so I think uh, really facilitating the connection to programs like ours um, is a huge step in terms of helping people in their trajectory that they're on. Um, and I think the, the other um, piece of that question is, confronting this fact of, of is drug use something that we will always continue to see in our communities. Um, and I think that's something that we have to 
um, really move forward with an understanding that people will continue to use substances, um, whether, whether we want people to use substances or not, and that this policy approach is a way to reduce those harms and those costs associated with the most high risk behaviors of drug use. Thank you. Any other questions for Anna McConnell? Seeing none, thank you, Anna. Next up, we have Craig Cardamone. Welcome. All right, thank you all so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator DeShambo, Representative Warren, and distinguished members uh, of the Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety. Uh, I appreciate all of you for allowing me to speak in support of LD994. Uh, so my name is Craig Cardamone. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist. I reside in Portland, Maine, and I'm grateful for being able to just be here and support people who use substances and to make sure that they have hypodermic needles and uh, safe supplies. So during my career as a counselor, I've worked with multiple, uh, I've worked in multiple outpatient substance use clinics and have witnessed the devastating effects of criminalizing safe supplies. Most of the people who inject drugs that I've worked with have actually found no benefit in going to jail and have in fact experienced their trauma worsen as well as their addiction worsen while they're in jail. Um, they have also experienced or had hepatitis C, HIV, endocarditis, and other bloodborne diseases. Um, they had also been afraid to seek treatment because of their experiences of being shamed by doctors or being harassed by the police. Criminalizing safe supplies not only causes people who use substances unnecessary pain, they also have a really deep impact on our community, negative impact on our community. Uh, so for example, looking at some studies and some uh, statistics, um, a main Bay study recently found that the median cost of treatment for each person diagnosed with endocarditis due to drug injection use was $150,000. And this is just endocarditis. According to the CDC in 2013, 3,096 of the 47,352 diagnoses of HIV uh, were injection drug use, uh, were, or were impacted by injection drug use. Anywhere from 50 to 90% of persons who inject drugs um, who are also positive for HIV are also co-infected with hepatitis C. Uh, so people who inject drugs can substantially, can substantially reduce their risk of acquiring or transmitting HIV and other bloodborne infections by using a sterile needle after every injection. Uh, that is made easier when the criminal justice system is not a barrier to getting clean needles and safe supplies. When people have access to safe supplies, they're more likely to become enrolled in case management and recovery programs if they choose to pursue those paths. Criminalizing possession of sterile needles pushes people who use drugs closer to the margins and farther away from support and care. We know that incarceration does not stop drug use as drugs are readily available in jails. And again, jails cause trauma, which worsens addiction. If we want all of our citizens to be healthy, we need people who use, we need people who use substances to gain access to clean and safe supplies. So I'm in support of LD994 because it'll allow people to gain access to safe supplies, clean needles, and help people who use drugs stay safe and healthy. Um, and also will reduce the criminalization of human behavior. Uh, thank you for listening to my testimony today and I am ready to have any questions you may have or answer any questions you may have. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Next up, we have D.A. Sarbeck. Welcome. Good afternoon, Representative Warren, Senator DeChambeau, members of the Committee on uh, Criminal Justice and Public Safety. It's good to be here. And I'm going to try to be as relatively as quick as I can because I know it's getting very late in the afternoon. Um, but I'm here in support of LD994. I know you've received a letter from the Attorney General uh, also in support of LD994. And I can uh, say that there are other district attorneys uh, around the state that do also support it. Uh, mainly, we support this uh, bill because just as many people have already said today that this is a, a strategy for harm reduction. Uh, I've been out with the needle exchange and the syringe program in Portland numerous times. Uh, the point that was just brought up about the connections that can be made that can be helpful in having that person that day say, you know what, today's the day that I'm going to seek out 
outside the criminal justice system, I think is a very important connection that can be made uh, by using these harm reduction strategies. Uh, we've heard about the statistics about uh, uh, IV use, uh, drug use, that it can lead to communicable diseases, uh, which is another strategy. But uh, from a practical standpoint, I just want to uh, say that this class E offense of possession of a hypodermic needle is a rarely charged um, uh, crime. Uh, it does get charged, but usually it's in connection to other charges such as trafficking and scheduled drugs. And when that case is going to go down that road of prosecution, most likely this, uh, this charge of possession of a hypodermic needle uh, is going to be something that's gonna be dismissed. Uh, so from a practical standpoint, it's a charge that is rarely uh, goes forward with prosecution. And because of that, because it's very rarely used, I think that it would be, uh, it would be something that I think should not be on the books uh, when it comes to this, especially because of the information that you've heard uh, today and uh, how it can criminalize that behavior, especially behavior that promotes uh, safe use. Uh, so I'll, I'll end it at that, but I'll be happy to answer any questions and I would make myself available for the work session. Thank you, DA Sarbeck. Any questions for the prosecutor? Senator Searway. I know I hate to be a pain. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. As opposed to stories, Senator. This isn't a story. I just okay. asking. I'm just asking. Uh, when you said that, very rarely used, but wouldn't it be helpful to still have that on the books to to uh, get them into uh, a program or something? That's. I mean, there are times when kids or families uh, need the assistance of helping uh, the DAs helping them get some help for their spouse or, or whatever, so. Senator Ciro, I, I completely understand your point. And the, and the reason that I brought that up during my testimony was I figured you were gonna ask that question. Um, I would say this, you, we have to remember that possession of a hypodermic needle is a class E misdemeanor. It'd be very rare that we would be able to use that leverage on a class E misdemeanor to uh, try to promote somebody to get into recovery uh, with that type of charge. I would just tell you, uh, there's no probation that can go along with the Class E charge. We could do a deferred disposition. But my hope would be that if there was a concern that somebody would try to offer those resources outside of the criminal justice system. And if people do have concerns about a loved one that is using, they can contact us outside of a criminal case. We would definitely love to try to uh, connect them to the resources necessary to try to help that person. Any other questions? Seeing none. Next up, we have uh, Marshall. Mer Thank you, DA Sarbeck. Excuse Thank you. Me. Don't Thank forget you. drug take back weekend this weekend. Right. Thank you. Take Thank care. you. Next, we have Marshall Mercer. Good evening, Mr. Mercer. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Dear Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, the distinguished members of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. My name is Marshall Mercer, and I am an organizer for MIRAP. Program Coordinator for Downing's Recovery Support Center in Machias and their student recovery. I'm here to testify in favor of LD-994, an act to promote public health by eliminating criminal penalties for possession of hypodermic apparatuses. As a student of recovery, I'm educated in this area about the need of, to decriminalize syringes and other paraphernalia when in active use because of the stigma behind the way I used to use. I can clearly remember how hard it was for me to go to Rite Aid or a pharmacy to get clean needles to feed the very veins in my arms because of the shame I already felt. I also remember being around many others that felt the same way and because of the way we always had abundance of syringes with us. I always remember what it was like just to have one dull needle between all of us and that was the point, no pun intended, to why we need to be voted as ought to pass. I was blessed. I only made it out with hepatitis C. But I can't help to wonder if there was no fear of criminalization, if I would have still contracted it. I also wonder if we could have saved the state $90,000, not 40, for the treatment I needed and just to ensure that I had access to clean supplies would have been much cheaper. I could have had access to what I need to stay safe as possible until I ultimately found recovery. I know plenty who didn't make it. I was as lucky as me. And because of that and their stigma and the shame, they kept it to themselves, which led to several outbreaks of HIV and two suicides, but it's not too late for everyone. Substance use disorder is a public health issue, not a criminal issue. And decriminalizing syringes, paraphernalia, drug testing, equipment like fentanyl test strips does not promote drug use, 
but instead ensures that we keep our community as healthy as safe as possible and so they can find their own pathway to recovery. Also, as a prisoner who was in prison, I got more drugs in prison than I ever did on the streets, first of all. Second of all, I didn't get help until I got out of, out of prison. It wasn't the prison that ever reformed us. And in closing, thank you for the time and have a good afternoon and I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mercer. Any questions for Mr. Mercer? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. And thank next, you. next we have Professor Tate here with us. Thank you so much. I'm here to testify in support of LD994. Um, Good afternoon, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, distinguished members of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee, and most especially my Senator, Senator Searway. My name is Winifred Tate. I'm director of the Maine Drug Policy Lab at Colby College and a resident of Waterville. Um, and I will not repeat all of the public health information that you've received from many people, but I do wanna emphasize um, that it is not simply a measure uh, um, that this policy of criminalizing syringes and paraphernalia has no ill effects. It clearly does have deep harmful effects in Maine communities and Maine families. And I wanna emphasize one issue, which is the idea of trafficking needles. So I've been doing research with women who use drugs and women in recovery for the past three years. And in our research, we have never found a single documented case of people selling needles for profit. Needles in Maine are not trafficked in any meaningful way. They are shared, they are traded, but those are practices that people use to try to keep themselves from getting dope sick and by harm reduction advocates who are trying to um, ensure that harm reduction practices limited the kind of devastating consequences from the diseases acquired by needle sharing. So I think that we need to really move away from this um, idea that needles are trafficked and to call it trafficking really misrepresents what's going on. And the criminalization of this contributes nothing positive to main communities, but simply encourages stigma and limits the ability of people to get access to the supplies they need to limit the harm their drug use is causing them and their families. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have and I will leave it there in the interest of time. Thank you very much, we appreciate that. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you for being here. And Kathleen London, Welcome back, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. And um, so um, members of the committee, thank you for again for, um, uh, for having me. I'm, so I'm a family medicine physician in down East rural Maine in underserved Washington County. I've been a physician for 26 years and I am also a second year law student at Maine Law. I stand in support of LD994. I treat patients with substance use disorder as part of my family medicine practice. And again, our war on drugs is not working. We have mass incarceration. The majority of people in prison have mental health um, issues, about 64% rate. And, and part of that, a subset of that is substance use disorder. Our drug fatality rates continue to rise from illegally manufactured fentanyl. And in the, my written testimonials, I have put charts for you. And you can see just, it's just outrageous, the amount that it's gone up, especially since 2015. And this, this approach that emphasizes punishment is, is just a failure. Um, ending in August of um, 2020, those 12 months, the pandemic um, overdose rates in the US have spiked to 88,000. So until we move to harm reduction, we're just gonna see more and more deaths. We are warehousing our population in prisons. Um, I remind you again, America is 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the prison population. I, I, that's a stat I just can't get over. And I, again, I, you're, in your written testimony from me, I have provided you with graphs. LD994 will help prevent health issues, disease spread from HIV, from hepatitis, endocarditis, cellulitis, and a host of other infections, as well as this needless incarceration that does not serve its purpose. We are not treating people in prison. Drug use continues in prison. People come out of confinement and either go back to using or they overdose. 
We are not solving our opioid crisis. The opposite of addiction is connection. We need to take the money from criminal justice and put it towards community treatment programs. Drug use is not new. Morphine and cocaine use go back to at least the 19th century in America. We had recipes back then that called for narcotics. Our policies are actively killing people. Mm -hmm. LDN 994 is one step in the right direction to pivot towards harm reduction and away from punitive measures. And I applaud this bill for this step and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you. Next up on my screen, I have Ms. Netto and then Megan Sway and Martin Chartrand, just so people have a little bit of a heads up when I'm gonna call on you. Good evening, thank you, Representative Lauren. Um, my name is Tina Netto. I'm here again on behalf of the Maine Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers in support of this bill. I'm not going to read the testimony that was prepared by Jeremy Pratt, our vice president. I'm simply going to say this. We need to decriminalize the possession of hypodermic needles and testing supplies and anything that is preventing people from getting and seeking the help that they need. I'm so glad to have heard DA Sarbeck's testimony because when defense attorneys and prosecutors are aligned on something, I think that calls for uh, a little bit of closer listening by this committee. Uh, the DAs don't need this weapon in their pocket. Um, they don't need this tool. Um, it is cruel, it is unnecessary, it is a vestige of the past. And unfortunately, when it has been used, it's been used to target people who have spoken out about these policies before. Um, there was mention of Jesse Harvey earlier, and that is just a tragedy upon tragedy there. Um, there's absolutely no need for these statutes anymore. And we strongly support the decriminalization of needles, testing strips, and drugs in general. But let's focus on the little stuff for today. This is something we can do and the DAs are in support of it. So we should be doing it now. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Natto. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Next up, we have Megan Sway. Good evening, Representative Warren, Senator DeChambeau, members of the committee, good evening. My name is Megan Sway and I'm the policy director for the ACLU of Maine. On behalf of our members, I'm here to urge you to support LD 994. Currently, Maine law makes exchanging even one syringe for something of value a crime of trafficking in hypodermic apparatuses, punishable by up to five years in jail and a $5,000 fine. Giving someone 11 or more syringes, even if they're clean, is the crime of furnishing in needles, punishable by less than a year imprisonment and a $2,000 fine. These laws were created in 1997, when Maine was in the midst of its first wave of opioid overdose deaths. At the time, a national public debate was raging about how to deter drug use. Voices such as Robert DuPont's, one of the original architects of the war on drugs, was among the loudest and most influential. DuPont argued that zero tolerance policies and other harsh sanctions were critical to deter drug use and to force people into treatment. In, be in part because of voices like DuPont's, Maine Maine's lawmakers tried to punish their way out of a growing crisis in overdose deaths. 25 years later, we know better. We have seen that criminalizing substance use and the tools that people utilize have not made our friends, families, or neighbors safer. More people in Maine died last year from drug overdoses than died from COVID-19 and the numbers in 2021 are on pace to be much worse. We have had these laws on the books for a quarter of a century. Drug arrests continue to rise, yet Maine's overdose numbers also continue to rise. These laws do not work. We do know what does work, and that is harm reduction. There's consensus among public health leaders that harm reduction is an effective tool to keep people who use drugs safer and more open to potential avenues to recovery. Yet our laws make harm reduction measures, these life-saving practices endorsed by public health, criminal offenses. For example, police in Maine have started handing out fentanyl testing strips so that people can test drugs to ensure that they don't overdose from fentanyl. Yet possessing or using fentanyl test strips, a tool that can save people's lives, is a violation of Maine's law currently. Another example in tension with Maine's criminal laws are syringe service programs, which you've heard a lot about today. People who use those services are more likely to enter treatment for substance use disorder and more likely to report reducing or discontinuing injection compared to those who have never participated in a program. 
Syringe service programs are in tension with the laws that criminalize possession of more than 11 syringes at a time or exchanging even one syringe. Criminalizing drug use presents serious civil liberties concerns and the enforcement of drugs law, drug laws have led to widespread violations of civil liberties, including those secured by the fourth, fifth and sixth amendments. Criminalizing drug use is counterproductive, leading people to a revolving door of criminal legal involvement. And finally, it's cruel. It disconnects people from their healthcare, their families and their place in community, the very things that they need to lead healthy lives. We urge you to support LD994, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sway. Any questions for Ms. Sway? Seeing none, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you, have a great night. Thank you, you too. Next up, we have Martin Chartrand, and then um, we have Director McKinney and Tori Arrington. Good evening, Martin. welcome. Hi, this is Martin. Uh, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, members of the Joint Standing Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety, thank you for waiting all day through all the different hearings and, and still listening to folks' testimony. I'm going to keep it brief uh, because I agree with and, and want to support a lot of the public health reasons that many of the testifiers have asked for you to support LD994, uh, access to, to clean and safe supplies is both life-saving and it's a pathway to recovery. I'm a, I'm a community harm reduction volunteer in Bangor, Maine. I, I spend hours each week working to connect people with safe harm reduction supplies, safer drug use supplies, including clean syringes and naloxone as well as safer smoking supplies and, and test kits. And uh, one thing that has been referred to a little bit is that the, the criminalization of syringes uh, actually criminalizes people trying to, trying to do harm reduction work in the community to bring safer supplies to their, their family or their loved ones or their neighbors. Um, a lot of that is done by, by paid people at syringe service programs. And then yet yeah, there's also a lot of critical work done by people, everyday people who, who connect, uh, you know, take syringes and go and are in the locations where people are using drugs and connect people to the, those naloxone or syringes and that saves a lot of lives. So this would, this would uh, free people up to do that work. Um, and it's, it, it, one thing I've seen and I, I've, in the, in the last year, even during the COVID-19 pandemic, I've continued to hear stories of people who are incarcerated on a charge of possession of hypodermic apparatus, which continued to shock me, given the, the dangers of incarcerating people and trying to, to keep people out of the jail system. But it is happening. And uh, it, in my experience that I've seen, it is not lead people to recovery. Um, I've seen many people taken and incarcerated and then go and back out and actually in a more dangerous situation because of tolerance going up and danger of overdoses. So uh, as folks have said, on the other hand, connection to harm reduction services is a, a, a known pathway to recovery. And so please do support this bill. I will submit written testimony I haven't yet. So you have my contact info if you have any questions and thank you. Thank you, Martin. And thank you for the work that you do in your community. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Next up, we have Director McKinney. Good evening. Good. Well, it's still afternoon though. Uh, you've had a long day for sure. Uh, Thank you, uh, thank you, Representative Warren. Uh, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and other distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety. My name is Director Roy McKinney, and I'm here to testify on behalf of the Department of Public Safety and the Maine Drug Enforcement Agency in support of LD 994, an act to promote public health by eliminating criminal penalties for possession of hypodermic apparatuses. 
Thank you for the opportunity to offer the department's perspective here before you today. For those committee members who served during the 129th legislature, you may recall that the department supported elements of LD 1492, an act to reform drug sentencing laws. That support included modifications to the statutes regarding the possession, furnishing, and trafficking of hyperdermic apparatuses. That is the core of LD 994. From the research I've done, no, no federal law prohibits the possession of hyperdermic apparatuses. About five states have no drug paraphernalia laws at all, and another 10 states exclude hyperdermic apparatuses from their drug paraphernalia laws. For those familiar with Maine's Opioid Response 2021 Strategic Action Plan, decriminalizing the possession of needles is an FY 2021 activity of strategy number 20 that seeks to promote a comprehensive system of care and referrals among healthcare and harm reduction services that the Department of Public Safety supports. On behalf of the department, I thank you for your time today. I will make myself available at the work session and will, and will be pleased to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Director McKinney. Any questions for the director? Seeing none, thank you very much. Have a good evening all. Yes, you too. And next we have Tori Arrington. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Um, I appreciate the chance to testify in front of you today. Um, my name's Tori Arrington. I live in Portland, Maine, and I grew up in Rumford, Mexico. Um, I went to Mountain Valley High School and I'm 28 years old. I have spoken in front of the committee once before, so you might remember me. Um, I just wanted to show up today in support of LD994 um, as one more voice to show up for this. Um, this is the right thing to do. Please do the right thing. Um, I apologize because I, yeah, I've, I've spoken in front of the committee before and um, I usually, I was not planning on going like off the cuff, but I am. Um, I wanted to answer some of the questions that um, Senator Searway um, raised. Um, like, for, for example, the, um, when you said that people, some people said they needed to go to jail to, um, to like find their way or whatever. Um, I think that that is like cherry picking individual stories and the overwhelming majority of people would want like their family members um, and friends and people in their community to have the opportunity to avoid communicable diseases or even death. Um, and the, the war zone imagery of um, Toronto, um, I think is just a scare tactic and it is not representative of decriminalization in other places. Like Whitney mentioned before me, 11 other states have supported harm reduction legislation and decrim. And, or how I've other words heard it called is restructuring drug sentencing laws. Um, I've also heard other people say like, this is, it's cruel um, to not pass this legislation is cruel. And I am so grateful that this bill is, um, I really like can't say it enough how much I hope the bill is passed. So thanks so much for your time today. Tori, thank you for your testimony. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you. Anyone else here to testify in support of LD994? Please raise your hand, seeing none. Anyone here to testify in opposition to LD994? Please raise your hand. Seeing none. Anyone here to testify neither for nor against LD994? Seeing none, I will say that that means this, there is unanimous testimony in support of LD 994. That is a shift in 
in Maine. That is a shift. Um, so with that, anybody have any questions for Jane before the work session? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing on LD994. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative McDonald, for bringing this bill. Okay, up next, I'm just getting to my schedule here. We had uh, Representative Warren, I, I, I can get back to it. Yes, I just had a quick thing that I don't think you know about yet, and then I'll let you get back to it. Um, LD 1128 is Representative Corey's bill. He had a family commitment and he's not able to be here this late. So I told him we would run that at another time. He reached out to the sheriffs and let them know. So that leaves LD 1245 and LD 1440. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Um, LD 1245, this is uh, an act to ensure the provision of adequate personal protective equipment to firefighters who are women. Uh, and the sponsor is, um, I'm not going to be able to say her name correctly. So say it once and I will remember it, Nicole. Grahowski. Go right ahead. Grahowski. Yes, perfect. I should. Thank you. Um, thank you all. Thank you for hanging in um, for a long day. So many important issues. I've been tuning in and out and I just really respect your your efforts to listen so conscientiously to everyone who's come before you. And um, I believe that I will be the only person uh, testifying in person today um, on this bill due to the timing. A lot of the um, firefighters who are planning to testify are um, either on duty and they weren't expecting to be, or they're off duty and with their families. So I hope that you will look at their written testimony. Um, and they, of course, uh, would be happy to be available at the work session to answer detailed questions about their experiences in the science. So um, it's just me, uh, which leaves you um, a little bit less to hear before your dinner time. So thank you so much. Um, as was mentioned, uh, I am Nicole Grahowski. I represent the communities of Ellsworth and Trent in the main house. I want to say, I guess, good evening um, to you all, uh, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, and honorable members of the Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety. I really appreciate being able to speak to you today uh, in support of LD 1245. This bill seeks to ensure that all firefighters in the state of Maine are outfitted with properly fitting protective gear in order to perform their job safely and effectively. You're probably wondering why I say all firefighters when the bill specifically addresses female firefighters. This is because male firefighters are by default outfitted with gear that is designed to fit them. Passing this legislation would ensure that female firefighters receive the same treatment based on the best available standards for gear recognized by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, uh, known as OSHA, and the National Fire Protection Association, or NFPA. It is critical that gear fit properly for a few reasons. First, it helps the firefighter to move efficiently and unhindered through a dangerous work environment. Female firefighters are at 33% greater risk of injury than male firefighters, in part due to ill-fitting gear. As a former volunteer firefighter myself, I can attest to the fact that working in poorly fitted gear is a challenge. Imagine having to climb a ladder while wearing 60 pounds of gear and carrying a chainsaw. You need to hustle to ventilate an active structure fire to assist the rest of your crew. Now imagine that your pants sag so that you cannot lift your foot to the next rung without hitching up your pants with your not so free hand. This stressful and unsafe situation is the norm rather than the exception for female firefighters. Second, properly fitting gear is designed to entirely isolate firefighters from the toxins in the air around them. Gear that fits poorly can leave gaps, allowing carcinogens to come in direct contact with skin where they can be absorbed. Firefighters have increased risk of cancer diagnosis, 
uh, 9% higher and cancer-related deaths, 14% higher than the general public. Oversized garments create large air spaces, which reduce thermal and vapor resistance of the gear. The result of that being that there can be thermal discomfort and irritation or burn from steam trapped inside. To the extent that we can limit exposure to harmful chemical byproducts of combustion, heat, and vapor to protect our firefighters, I believe we should. Third, it's hard to feel like you belong when your clothes don't fit right. Ill-fitting gear not only makes it hard to do the job with confidence, it can also make you feel like a less valued team member. I absolutely do not think that that is the intention of any department, but I do believe it is an outcome. Women who join the fire service face a lot of pressure in a male dominated field. Nationally, it is estimated that 4% of career firefighters and 11% of volunteer firefighters are women. Given the recruitment and retention issues that departments are experiencing across Maine, I think it is critical that women are welcome and valued members of the fire service. We have a lot to offer. My chief always said, work smarter, not harder and he valued my approach to solving problems because I could not just muscle my way through every challenge. Gear that is sized specifically for females is available from the same companies that currently supply our fire departments with gear designed for men. Tailoring is also an available option. And there is current research that is supported by FEMA aiming to better identify the nuances of this issue and gear design solutions. So ideally there will be improvements to gear for female firefighters in an ongoing basis. I want to commend the departments in Maine who now outfit their female firefighters with properly fitting gear. It seems that um, where that isn't happening, it's largely due to a lack of information about the available options or funding. Uh, protective gear must be cycled out on a regular schedule and at a minimum should be replaced with properly fitting gear at that time. I hope that by passing this bill, the 130th legislature will increase awareness of this serious issue and available options to remedy it as well as signal to current and future female firefighters that we value their work in our communities and their health. Thank you for your attention and I would be happy to answer any questions. And as I mentioned, I really hope you'll take a couple minutes to look at the testimony because um, some of the female firefighters that uh, transition from male gear to female gear talk about that experience and how they were able to better do their work. So I think it's really uh, helpful to read their, um, their anecdotal experience on that as well. So thank you. I'm gonna. Oh, I'm 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 looking at you to recognize. <laughs> um, yes, um, Representative Good. Oh, Jeep, as I want to say it so well, Grohowski, Grohowski. Good enough. Oh, good, thank you. <clears throat> Correct me, I've been hearing this for three or four years and I was flabbergasted when I listened to a number of females, mostly in the Portland area, and there were a number of them, uh, how, um, you know, I never assumed that they were wearing men's clothing or they were trying to adjust it. Um, <clears throat> are you familiar with that group? I guess there is a group of, of, of female firefighters pushing for a lot of these issues? Yeah, that's the group that I'm working with. Good. Um, yeah. When you mention gear, please tell me what that means. Uh, is it just the pants, the, the jacket or the coat, whatever? Or is it the, you know, what they have to use, uh, the tools that they use or what is it? So what's gear? Sure. Yeah. So the way that um, we drafted the language, it says um, personal protective equipment and turnout gear, including boots. Um, so that essentially means the clothing that you're uh, you're donning on top of your regular clothing in order to protect yourself. Uh, I think we've all become familiar with the concept of PPE <laughs> in the past year or so, um, but we're talking about pants, boots, helmets, um, jackets, uh, neck gaiters, I think to a lesser extent, because I think our necks are hopefully not <laughs> dissimilar, uh, in terms of sizing. Um, so it's things like that, less, not air packs or, um, you know, any of the different tools that you would be used to carrying as a firefighter. Um, oh, 
to, to just ask one more question, might get to that. If <clears throat> I know there's a big difference between um, volunteer firefighters, a few of them are women or Portland or Lewiston or what have you. Um, there must be stores, retail, that cater to females uh, for um, firefighting equipment or clothing, correct? Yeah, and I don't know if I mentioned helmets, but an interesting thing about helmets is they have ones um, that have a different amount of uh, coverage in some areas that are two pounds less, um, which, you know, I don't know if you've ever worn around a five pound hat on your head for many hours, but it just, you know, I take a couple pounds off if I might. Um, but in terms of your question, um, these manufacturers that manufacture the gear that our different departments are uh, purchasing do offer female specific clothing. And um, if you're really interested in it, I put some citations in my testimony, some links that hopefully the PDF export and upload maintained um, showing the different gear. But uh, what was astounding, I think, um, as a person who has served is I wasn't even aware that was available. So I wasn't in a position to ask for or advocate for that. And I think a lot of um, just bringing this bill forward and these conversations, like you mentioned, have been happening for a few years, have brought awareness. And I think um, some of those bigger departments, career departments are now starting to offer these options, which is how we're getting that positive feedback that it really does make a difference. So the gear is out there. It could probably use more improvement, just like all fire gear or all protective gear in general. But um, I'd like to see that women who are serving know about and can access this gear. And I'm not aware that there's any cost difference in the gear. It's just, you got to order a different product. I'll probably come back with more on um, the work session. Um, sure. And there will hopefully, if you invite them, I know that they would love to join for the work session that the, the um, folks with this real experience. Um, I mean, I had a real experience, but it's a couple of years ago now and I never got to make the transition. <laughs> so um I think they'd be happy to answer specific questions as well. Uh, Representative Renicki. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Representative, could you tell me why you think this is necessary to be a bill? Why isn't this something, if they have females in their departments, why isn't this something the departments are already doing? Um, are they already doing it in your larger, in the larger cities here in Maine? And is this just kind of to put it onto the small towns and communities or I mean are there that are there many women in the small communities right now I mean I actually have a relative that is a woman firefighter but I'm just curious as to what um the reasoning behind making it a law um yes I, I think there is uh some of the departments have been making the switch um Others I think are less aware of the options or opportunities. I, I think the Fire Chiefs Association has submitted some testimony um, that you might wanna look at regarding you know, their view of how it is uh, happening across the state, but whereby we know that there are a greater percentage of female firefighters in the volunteer um, uh, services versus the career. Um, I think there are a lot of women that are putting themselves at risk to support their community that um, are really in small towns and could use the support of the state to have an even playing field um, with those uh, larger communities that can pay, you know, full-time firefighters and give them health insurance and other things. Um, Could I have a follow-up, Madam Chair? Yes, go right ahead. Um, is this more about the money than it actually is the law? Is it more about um, the legislature um, appropriating a certain amount of money to cover this versus a law to mandate it? Um, I think that could be a policy question for this committee. Uh, my view is everyone is being outfitted with turnout gear. No one is going into a burning building lacking turnout gear. Um, so there is already money that's being spent on this gear. It's just not being spent on the right gear um, for the specific firefighters. And, and there could be uh, male firefighters who are in 
um, improperly sized gear experiencing the same thing. I think it's a bit of an awareness issue and we want to see that everyone um, have access to equipment that works for them in this dangerous field. Um, it's We've identified that females are really a, a greater issue because the, the gear that most departments have isn't suited for them at all. Um, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Representative Luckner. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Grahowski, and I'll keep this brief. I know we're going late and don't really have so much of a question, but I did work for a time as a wildland firefighter, and I can tell you that the women in that field had to put up with a lot just dealing with all those guys day in and day out. Um, so I think this is a really great bill, and i just really glad you're bringing it and very necessary things. Thank you, Representative Lutner. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you. Thank I, will you all. Ask, I will ask if there are any uh, co-sponsors or legislators that wish to, uh, Representative McDonald. Thank you, I'm happy to be before you again. We're spending a lot of time together today. So Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren and distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety, I am Representative Genevieve McDonald of Maine House District 134, and I am testifying before you today as a co-sponsor in favor of LD 1245, an act to ensure the provision of adequate personal protective equipment to firefighters who are women. In December of 2013, I came in off the boat, wet, cold, and frustrated with my ill-fitting foul weather gear. I launched a campaign with the objective of convincing Grundens, the leading manufacturer of foul weather gear for the commercial fishing industry, to create a women's line. I put out a call over social media for women in the fishing industry to send me photos of their poorly fitting gear. The response was overwhelming. I received nearly a thousand submissions from all over the world. Women are built differently than men. We have hips and curves and are frequently shorter and sometimes lighter. I received photos of women in foul weather gear. They had to modify themselves to avoid hazards such as tripping on deck, snagging fishing equipment, falling overboard or experiencing hypothermia. Let me be clear. Our advocacy project was never about fashion. Women in the commercial fishing industry needed foul weather gear that would allow us to do our job safely and efficiently. In November of 2014, I attended the Pacific Marine Expo for the unveiling of Grundon's women's line. Industry leaders are recognizing the important role women hold in the workforce and that we deserve to have gear that keeps us safe. Commercial fishing is a high risk occupation that relies heavily on safety gear, firefighting even more so. Interestingly, in the course of this project, I also received a tremendous amount of correspondence from female firefighters that were having very similar issues, though in a different field. Thank you for your consideration, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions for um, Representative McDonald? Being none? Okay. Uh, thank you. Anyone else wish to speak in, I'm, I'm now going to be asking the public, uh, anyone wishing to speak in support? Please raise your hand, we'll recognize you. I see two hands. Thank you. All right, I will recognize Michael Krauss followed by William Mc, um, Gillespie. Mr. Krauss. I will then go to Mr. Gillespie and come back to Mr. Krauss. Um, Mr. Gillespie. There you are. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's been a long afternoon for you folks. Appreciate your service. My name is Bill Gillespie and Senator Shambles, Representative Warren and members of the committee. Uh, I am here to testify neither for nor against on behalf of the main fire chiefs. The main fire chiefs had a board of directors meeting last week in which this, com this discussion came up um, and a lot of conversation took place in reference to um, this subject and the distributors of the fire gear. 
um, we do support that every firefighter, whether male or female, should have properly fitted protective gear for the job that we do. The issue becomes sometimes um, whether uh, we feel a female firefighter is going to be an interior firefighter, an exterior firefighter. So in that situation, we may not invest in purchasing new gear. And I can say from my department, which is made up of 25% female firefighters, one being my wife, that I have a vested interest to make sure that her turnout gear is properly fitted. She has been an interior firefighter for 11 years and continues to hold that with our department. I had last week, finally, after six months of delivery, outfitted a, another new female firefighter with properly fitted turnout gear. The issue is, is it's $2,500, between 2,000 and, and 3,000 for properly fitted gear. The gear that I, I purchased for her, she was fitted for male, female, male or female gear. And it turned out that the male gear actually fit her better. It was not tailored in any way, very short. The only change was the leg, uh, leg length. So we, there are options out there. What we feel at this point in time is this is really an education for the fire chiefs in the state of Maine to make them aware that there is um, this opportunity out there, which seems to be fairly new uh, in the fire industry. I did sit in on or, or reviewed a, a message or a meeting earlier this past year with the, the female firefighters, which is the professional female firefighters in Maine, um, and, and understood their points. And we do agree with their points. However, I think this isn't something that belongs in the legislature. I believe this belongs um, in the firehouse for the fire chiefs to determine. It is a law, however, and it is on the books that the fire chiefs are responsible to properly outfit every interior firefighter with properly fitted gear. So that is already in statute and we are required to follow that policy. So with the new gear coming out for female firefighters, I would say that this should start seeing some interest over the next few years and we could work on it within the fire service. Thank you for your time and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, any questions for um, this, uh, I call you chief, you're a chief. Please, yes, that's fine, okay. yes. Uh, did you tell us where you're a chief? I'm in Liberty, I'm fire chief in Liberty. Great, thank you. Um, I do have a question on, base, on what you just said. Um, so you wear different clothing if you are interior or exterior firefighter? No, you do not wear different clothing. But what I would say is if I have an interior firefighter, I want to ensure that they have properly fitted gear because they're going to be exposed to the carcinogens in a greater density than an exterior firefighter that may just be a pump operator or maybe traffic control. So that type of gear may change or I may give someone that's not ever going to be an interior firefighter some older gear that's in surplus to allow them to basically protect themselves uh, for most fire, fire calls, but they're not gonna be exposed to the heat and they're not gonna be exposed to the extensive carcinogens. Okay, well, I'm learning something every day, but however, I wanna ask you pointedly, it, it begs the question, when you hire a male firefighter. Is that your concern, whether the male needs is going to be going interior or exterior? It's for everybody. Um, you know, I have 20 members on my department, which I'm fortunate. A lot of departments don't have that luxury. Uh, but with the 20 members I have, 25% of them represent as women. I have out of those five women that I have, four of them are interior certified. My wife, when she was fitted for her gear, fitted with male gear, it actually fits her better than being fitted for a female set of gear. Um, and, I, and I would say that with, with some of the female firefighters, some of the male gear fits them better. Um, with female firefighters, what I'm finding, and I'm just learning, it's only been on my radar for the last year that this was even an option, um, I'm learning the differences, you know, the hip sizes, um, I've listened to testimony. I've listened to um, the representatives that sell us our gear, explain the differences, and we're evolving. We're trying to 
incorporate that in it's but you know with that being said $2,500 for a set of gear on my budget. I can do one, maybe two sets a year. Um, I do write MMA grants. MMA does sponsor grants for that type of equipment. So I try to increase my, my cost. But when I'm setting up my interior, I have to look at who either I can fit with other gear or um, who is the, the person that's going to be exposed to the most. So it varies on a year to date, but um, you know, we have gear in my department, which the, some of the professional fire departments won't do this, but I have gear that's 15 years old that should have been taken out of service years ago. But unfortunately, it's not something that you can easily budget to buy a lot of. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. I've got uh, Representative Warren followed by Senator Shaveway. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good to see you, Chief Gillespie. Thank you for being here. Just a quick question. Did you say that it is in state law that municipalities have to provide firefighting gear to their firefighters? Yes, it's in uh, statute. And I believe some testimony you received from um, Fire Marshal uh, Joe Thomas does it clarify. And it's Title 26-2103 under the directive 10.05 10 that Thanks. refers to that the fire chief is responsible to outfit firefighters with properly fitted firefighting gear. Thank you and thank you for that section. I appreciate it. Certainly. Senator Chairway. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so Chief Gillespie, thank you for coming. Um, how uh, how can we, I guess, how, how do we do it statewide to get the Chiefs Association to kind of have some type of, uh, well, like, like you said, it's been a learning curve for the last year for you. And if, if it's in statute, how do we make it become effective where we can meet the needs of the, the department? I mean, as far as cost, but yet still, uh, achieve getting everybody fitted properly? That's, I guess it's a big question, but. Yeah, um, you know, I, I don't want to put the cart before the horse, but obviously the next bill that you're referring to, 1440, um, has a fiscal note attached to it. Um, that equates to about 200 sets of turnout gear. Um, so when you look at it, you know, the professional firefighters uh, in previous testimony, I've heard that they, they have numbers in the area of about 100 female firefighters within the state. Um, you know, I can talk within Waldo County, you know, when we did a little survey just a day or two, uh, actually a day ago, you know, I came up with about 48 female firefighters in just my area uh, of the county. So, you know, with that being said, 200, uh, 200 firefighters is not going to, it's not going to change the world. I will tell you that I have, and you know, it's not because of, I, I don't wanna give everybody new gear because I do, um, but it's economics, it really is. When you look at the big numbers on the cost of turnout gear uh, and the cost of fire equipment, it is very difficult for some of these small communities to bring on new members and not give them previously ordered gear for other firefighters. So what, what I found in some of the smaller departments is they, they kind of buy a, a mismatch of, of gear and hope that if a new member joins, it's similar, similar to a person that might've been on the department before. And that's the big thing with, especially in the volunteer, I can't speak for the PFFM. I think they have a better uh, handle on, um, you know, their, their employees because they're, they're working a career for 25 years volunteers don't have that, you know, standard. So, you know, I may get a firefighter and I have had firefighters that last for five years and then they move out of town. And now I've got a, a fairly new set of turnout gear that I purchased for this individual. That's not going to fit or will fit somebody else, but it won't fit perfectly. You know, it's very difficult to get that perfect fit unless you fit that individual. So, you know, the, the recent pair that I bought I can't see in my 12 years here as chief that I would ever outfit another person in that size gear. It's very small. So it's going to be challenging if I have a new member join to try to put them in that set of gear. Um, so 
that's always the, the, the cusp of it. And you're forced to in that situation when you really have nothing to put them in. Thank you for that answer too. Are we all set, Senator Searway? Okay. Um, Representative Lugner? Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Chief Gillespie. Um, is, is there a substantial difference in cost and or quality of the women's turnout gear? Would you say the women's gear is maybe lesser quality or has smaller pockets or anything like that? No, no, not at all. Um, they're made by the same manufacturers. They're made, they're made to a, the same quality. Uh, NFPA dictates what everybody's fire gear has to be at. So, you know, if, whether you buy one that's a certain size to the next size, nothing changes, just the size. And, and the cost is the same. Yeah, absolutely. It's the same. We, you know, we find that it can be anywhere. Um, there's there's even new gear out there that's you know a cancer presumption type gear um, that protects everything that runs in the area of about thirty two hundred dollars for a set of turnout gear. But just a basic set of turnout gear. Um, got the bill here on my table. It's twenty four hundred eighty eight dollars is what I just spent. Thank you. And that's just pants and a jacket. Um, the helmets. $300, the boots are about $300 if you go with um, leather boots. So when you get invested right now with this individual firefighter, I'm invested $3,100, $3,200 on a budget of 50,000 a year. I won't get you started on the boots, but yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> it, Tell me, you said NFTA. I'm trying to, is that National Firefighter or TA? N NFPA. P is in Paul, National Fire Protection Agency. Protection Agency. Thank you. Yes. Um, no other questions. We, I will ask again if anyone else wishes to testify in support of this bill. Uh, you testified neither for nor against, correct? Uh, yes, I did. <clears throat> well, you jumped it a little. I just want to first, are we all, um, I'd like to know if I'm all done with asking those in support. Mike Krause? Uh, yes, Mike. Oh, there you go. Uh, welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair and <clears throat> distinguished members of the Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety. Good evening and thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today in support of LD 1245. Uh, again, my name is Michael Krause and I'm the president of the Professional Firefighters of Maine, representing over 1,000 of Maine's professional firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, and dispatchers, including over 100 public sector women firefighters, EMTs, and paramedics. As you know, LD 1245 would require Maine's fire departments to provide adequate personal protective equipment that properly fits our female firefighters. Firefighters understand the importance of proper fitting personal protective turnout gear. Sporting a size too small in an office setting or on a construction site might run the risk of embarrassment, but doing the same on a fire scene might run the risk of serious injury or worse. Several studies have been conducted in which female firefighters and women leadership positions in the fire service were engaged. They examined their perceptions, attitudes, and experiences with injury. This research resulted in some commonly occurring topics. First and not surprising, women noted that injuries sustained on the fire ground are similar between men and women. Fires don't discriminate. It will hurt you, it will kill you either way. And while it's true that fires don't discriminate, women identified numerous differences between them and their male counterparts, such as anatomy, training needs, problems with their PPE, lifting techniques, fitting in, and experiencing some harassment. One of the things that they found most frustrating with women in the fire service was that they had continued struggle with ill-fitting PPE, which serves as fire, the firefighter's baseline level of defense and protection while on the fire ground. Despite the growing number of women in, the, in firefighting, structural turnout gear is predominantly designed to fit the male human form. 80% of female firefighters experience issues with ill-fitting garments. 
Improper fitting turnout gear may lead to a restricted range of motion when performing critical tasks on the fire ground. The results demonstrated that there are fit issues female firefighters face compared to their male counterparts in our industry. According to a national report card on women in firefighting, again, female firefighters experience issues with ill-fitting Ill -fitting PPEs, which at a rate of four times higher than the men's self-reported poor fit. Physical gender differences in human form have been published demonstrating significant various variances between males and females. Improper fitting PPEs for female firefighters may lead to restrictive range of motions, as I said, and mobility when performing critical tasks, especially in the chest and hip areas where the body uh, dimensions vary greatly between men and women. Additionally, ill-fitting PPEs creates air spaces under the garments worn by female wearers that would allow carcinogens to come in direct contact with the firefighter's skins, skin where they uh, can be absorbed. It's no secret that firefighters have an increased risk of cancer diagnosis and cancer-related deaths uh, than those in the general public. Members of the committee, whether it's the restriction of range of motion or the creation of air pockets under the PPE, or PPE, improper fitting of this turnout gear is not as safe as properly fitted PPEs for our female firefighters. Females in a fire, fire service throughout the United States and here in Maine are a growing population and they need to continue and they continue to increase yearly. With that said, we must ensure that our female firefighters are not only provided with the appropriate personal protective equipment as, re as required in Title 26, Section 2103, but the, that the PPE our fire departments provide them fits properly to ensure that our female firefighters are protected from the hazards of the work environment to which they are likely exposed to. It's could time we, for the fire- uh, Excuse me, um, Mr. Krause, could we start wrapping that up? Your I can, I'll, I'll real do that for you. Madam Chair and members of the committee, the efforts of uh, representatives uh, Gohersky and Roeder to raise this issue through respective piece, th their respective pieces of legislation today has become the voice of Maine's female firefighters because no one has really been a voice for them at this level before. So we are asking you to hear their voice and concerns with ill-fitted PPEs and we ask for your support in passing LD 1245. Thank, Thank you. you Appreciate. We we have your testimony. I would hope that you do. Okay. Thank you. Um, any questions of Mr. Krause? I see Representative Morales. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I was just wondering um, if you know when female gear became available uh, for use for female firefighters. I, I think uh, in line with what Chief Gillespie was talking about, I think it really got on the scene about four or five years ago when the manufacturers were really uh, moving in the direction to create uh, a separate set of gear, a separate, a separate uh, style of, of gear for uh, uh, outfitting women firefighters. Uh, and he's correct. It's, it's relatively new, new science. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Krause? Seeing none, uh, thank you. Um, you. Anyone else wishing to speak in support? Please raise your hand. Seeing none, Madam Chair. Okay. Anyone uh, wishing to provide testimony in opposition of this bill? Again, no hands. Okay. And uh, anyone else for neither for nor against? No hands. All right, thank you. So I will uh, close this uh, public hearing on LD 1245. Thank you. <clears throat> the um, next one is excuse me, LD 1440, an act to provide safe gear for female firefighters. Um, and that's Representative Rhoda. I think, Rep Where is she? <laughs> I think Representative Cuddy is going to be standing oh, in for, yes. Great. 
Representative Cuddy, will you join us, please? Hi, uh, I am not Scott Cuddy. I am Amy Rader. He, I got out of committee in time to join you. So, uh, but I'm just going to leave the name up because Scott Cuddy cosplay is my new hobby, apparently. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Senator Deschambeau, Representative Warren, and distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety. My name is Amy Rader, and I represent House District 125, which is a portion of Bangor. I'm here today uh, to speak of LD 1440, an act to provide safe gear for female firefighters. I'm going to go a little bit off my testimony script because because you've already heard Representative Grahowski's amazing facts and figures, her wonderful testimony. You've heard from professional firefighters. The difference in our bills is that LD 1440 appropriates $500,000 in fiscal year 2021 to 2022 for the state fire marshal to provide grants to municipal fire departments, volunteer fire associations, and fire districts to per purchase safe and properly fitting personal protective equipment and firefighter turnout gear for female firefighters. We've heard the safety risks of ill-fitting gear in terms of the um, on-the-job injuries. But we have to also remember that there are the toxins and the carcinogens that uh, female firefighters are exposed to are affecting different systems in their bodies as well. And my committee has heard a lot of testimony in terms of presumptive um, conditions for first responders, for firefighters. So I, I've heard this in my committee as well, all of the things that firefighters are exposed to, especially female firefighters. And I urge you to take a look at the links that are in my testimony. I'm gonna read a couple of portions of that. Um, this is from an article from firerescue.com. Uh, one of the things I found the most frustrating was that women still struggle with ill-fitting PPE, which serves as firefighters' baseline level of defense. Women have struggled for decades with PPE that was designed for men, a sentiment echoed by firefighters in the study. Across the board, I would have to say gear is an issue. A lot of women are getting leftover gear, and when they buy things, they buy them in bulk, and we spend the extra money on new equipment. And the next quote that I have is uh, from TheVerge.com, uh, an article called Female Firefighter Gear Risk in California, Australia, Wildfires and Climate Change. Gear needs to fit well for another reason, to protect firefighters from being exposed to the toxins that are often present in smoke and debris. Ill-fitting gear can leave skin exposed to nasty chemicals, Taylor says. Anywhere there's a gap is an opportunity for toxins to creep inside the gear and eventually inside the body. This is an issue that we're already dealing with in labor and housing because we're hearing bills about those presumptive conditions that affect female firefighters, their retirement age, et cetera, and their uh, workman's comp as well. There's also a comprehensive academic study of firefighter gear for women that I have linked to um, from the fashion and textiles industry that I think is very enlightening and provided me with a lot of information. And Lastly, I will say that I don't care which of our bills you decide to pass, just please pass one of them because our female firefighters deserve to be safe on the job while they protect us. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Rhoda. Any uh, questions from, uh, <clears throat> from Ms. Rhoda? Representative Rhoda, I'm sorry. Uh, Representative Reckitt. You're muted, uh, Lois. I'm wondering whether you and uh, Representative Gr Grahowski have uh, talked about combining your bill. We have not. I mean, we sort of spoke about it very briefly. I'm very open to that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any uh, other questions of Ms. Rhoda? Representative Rhoda, I'm sorry, it is late. That's totally fine. I understand. Okay. I'm losing my voice too. So um, fine. Thank you. Uh, anyone wishing to speak in support of LD 1440? Please raise your hand. You must be the last one in the crowd, I guess. So. Seeing no hands. Thank you. Anyone wishing to testify in opposition of 1440? I'm bringing over Joseph Thomas.
Welcome, Mr. Thomas. <laughs> Good afternoon. Wasn't Good on evening. purpose that we kept you last, so. <laughs> yeah, I, nothing like a little pressure here being between you and getting out of there, right? So, <laughs> so I'll be brief, believe me. Um, uh, Senator DeChambeau, Representative Warren, members of the Criminal Justice uh, Committee. My name is Joseph Thomas. I'm the State Fire Marshal. I'm here today to present testimony in opposition to LD 1440, an act to provide safe gear for female firefighters. However, I, I preface the opposition to the language uh, of the bill by stating that the Office of State Fire Marshal is, is a strong supporter of providing firefighters with appropriate and compliant personal protective equipment. Our opposition to this legislation lies with the designation of the Office of the Fire Marshal administering the fund and the grant program created by this proposed legislation. As you know, the statutory mission of the Office of Fire Marshal is the investigation of origin and cause of fires and explosions and fire and life safety in occupied buildings through code enforcement. This agency has no oversight over fire departments, either their operations, resources, or equipment, as that authority rests with the Department of Labor's Bureau of Labor Standards. Presently, the Bureau of Labor Standards Compliance Directive 10-5 and Associated Statutory Authority in MRSA Title 26, Section 2103, reference the appropriate protective clothing that shall be provided to each firefighter by a fire department. Should a grant program be created as proposed, it should be conducted under the oversight of the agency having the regulatory authority in meeting NFPA standard 1971, the standard for on protective ensembles for structural firefighting and proximity firefighting. I will be happy to answer any questions of committee members and make myself available for the work session. Thank you. Um, I hope oh, Representative Reckett. Hi, <clears throat> welcome, uh, Joe. I haven't seen you in a long time. Thank you, um, Reckett. <clears throat> um, my question is uh, around the where the I, I agree with you that your your um, uh, bailiwick is not the appropriate uh, holder of funds, but my question is. Um, I'm not familiar with the thing you just cited, but my question is whether or not the uh, Justice Assistance Council could cover that easily within their purview. They already are distributing grants to various uh, uh, police and sheriffs and uh, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I served on that committee for a long time and it seems to me that it would fit easily into the job description of the person who handles that, uh, that whole piece uh, within the Department of Public Safety. Do you have I suspect, on that? I, I suspect <clears throat> there's two directions you can look at it from. <clears throat> Number one, like you say, I mean, there, there's the aspect of the administration of the grant that, that takes a certain administrative setup to be able to do that, which obviously mm -hmm. we don't have. Uh, second <clears throat> of all, you've got the regulatory aspect of it, which already falls under the Department of Labor, uh, under the Bureau of Labor Standards, okay. because they, the, the Bureau of Labor Standards is the overseer of fire department operations from the standpoint of its operations, its equipment, and how it conducts it, its evolution. Thanks. So I didn't understand that from way, your. Uh, I didn't understand that just from your numbers of the place in the statute where it was. Do you know whether or not they do any um, uh, granting out of that uh, department of the state? I don't. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Thomas, I waited to ask this question when you came. Um, in both bills, I see municipal. Um, having been a union leader for a number of years, we have uh, forest rangers, firefighters. Um, the Maine State Prison used to have their own fire department. Mm -hmm. um, can you name others uh, within the state? Because the bill, if we're going to make this mandatory uh, for municipal, uh, usually the other words that follow is tribal, you know, plantation, whatever, that um, um, has a fire department or what have you. Sure. Um, 
And how about the state? Can you name for us a couple examples of where we have um, firefighters employed by the state? By the state of Maine itself? Yes. Yeah. Uh, we don't. The, the only, uh, uh, because of home rule statute, um, it says, the, the statute actually says that a municipality may provide fire protection. It doesn't say that they have to. However, if they do, then they have to meet certain requirements of that fire protection. If there is no fire protection provided by the local uh, uh, governance, then that basically becomes an unincorporated township, which then becomes the responsibility of the main forest service for, for providing fire protection. They either do it with their own resources in combination with other departments or they contract for another area department to pick up that unorganized township. The only other types of firefighters that we've got outside of municipal uh, uh, firefighters in the state would be federal where they would be at Bangor for uh, air uh, uh, traffic or uh, Cutler uh, uh, Navy facility still has a fire brigade there and uh, they're going to come under federal standards, not state standards. And, and I'm going to explain why I asked that question. Uh, the Department of Corrections, maybe 10 years ago, at Charleston Correctional Facility, were training, uh, you know, no. not really uh, firefighters, but I remember them going in the helicopter and, and fighting forest fires. They sure. were even called out to do sure. that. Yeah. Um, are those and people? They, they come on, no, they come under the main forest service when they do that. Main forest service. Okay, yeah. so they're not state employees. Uh, that well, that I believe. Uh, in fact, there's there's a there's a uh, I think there's a statute before the legislature right now that is looking at the compact language uh, of the main forest service okay. uh, when they come under the the federal requirements. When, so if they go to California, they have a certain requirement yeah. that they have to meet as part of the national. And, and those, those particular firefighters, either from industry or other departments, when they work with the main forest service, they come under those, under the forest services guidelines. Well, Mr. Thomas, you know where I'm going with this. If yeah. we're gonna mandate it with municipal, I'd like to know um, if we're having females that are going to be hired by the state to fight fires also. Just something, we'll look into that for the work session. Yeah, and if, you know, I can, I can reach out to my, uh, my counterparts at Maine Forestry and, and find oh, out about their uh, uh, providing uh, equipment for their female firefighters, too. So. Thank you. Yep. Um, Representative Recker? Oh, sorry. S sorry, slow hand. <laughs> An old slow hand. Okay. Um, any other questions? Um, all right. Um, anyone else wishing to speak in opposition or neither for nor against? Please raise your hand. Is there an empty room in there? <laughs> There's one person there and he's not raising his hand. Okay, great. Um, so having had testimony and questions, I close the meeting of uh, LD 1440. Boy, when I go to bed tonight, I've got so many stats and figures in my head. We, we've talked about hypodermic needles and uh, a whole bunch of stuff today. So um, we now have um, a work session, do we not? I missed that. Yes, we do. Yes. Um, LD 1070. And I know the title, but I don't have it in front of me. So. An act to make an assault on a person 50 years of age or older with a pre-existing serious medical condition, a class C crime. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, 
So, oh, where did I go? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Warren, did you kick me out? What is no, I can see you perfectly. You're still there. Uh, well, I don't see you. So would you please handle this one, please? <laughs> so I can get back in. Okay, sure. Yeah. Um, Senator, did you bring an amendment for us or Jane, do you have the amendment? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes, Deb. Are you coming are you right up to do the screen share for uh, Senator Searway's amendment? Got it. She is good. Thank you, Deb. Uh, this is Senator Searway's amendment to LD 1070, an act to make assault on a person 50 years of age or older with a pre-existing serious medical condition, a class C crime. And he, the proposal from Senator Searway is uh, changes the bill uh, and it changes the title to an act to protect dependent persons from assault. And it adds to assault in section in Title 17A, Section 207, a, assault on an, a, a dependent person. So the, the elements are the person intentionally, knowingly, or recklessly causes bodily injury to another person who is a dependent person. For the purposes of the paragraph, dependent person means a person who is physically, who has a physical or mental condition that substantially impairs that person's ability to adequately pro provide for that person's daily needs or a person who is wholly or partially dependent upon one or more other persons for care or support, either emotional or physical, because the person suffers from a significant limitation in mobility, vision, hearing, or emotional or mental functioning. And this is a class C crime. It uses the same definition of dependent person that is used in the Adult Protective Services Act. That's what I have for you. And this just, is it all right if I speak, uh, Madam yes, Chair? Please. Yes. Um, uh, I got this from uh, AARP. They recommended it actually um, from a, a Lori, who is the uh, president, or I guess she's like the director of AARP. And she came up with this as a, uh, recommendation. She, I told her about 65 years of age and she thought that might be okay, but she thought this would fit better for defining uh, an elderly person that couldn't protect themselves or, and, and they be like, in a, they may be in a nursing home. They could be in, in, uh, uh, well, what she says, it says, uh, uh, regardless of where the person resides or, or who is wholly or either partially dependent upon one or more other persons for care or support. And uh, so I think this may be uh, a step of protection for elderly people, and it may not be as far going as all 65 or older but I do think it does protect the people that are very dependent. Thank you, Senator Searway. Any comments, questions from committee members? I'll go ahead then. Um, Senator, thank you. I appreciate what you're trying to do. And I appreciate that AARP has given you some advice and I, I definitely appreciate that. Our statutes in Maine are such that this is already a crime and already we have 
factors for sentencing which allow a judge to elevate the class of crime on lots of different, you know, sort of participant identifying factors. I have lost all ability to talk, so please excuse me, I'm so tired. But uh, it's already done. And when a judge sees that somebody has assaulted an older couple, you know, or an older person who is dependent, they are gonna use those aggregate aggravating factors for sentencing. So because of that, I make a motion ought not to pass. Is there a second on that motion? I'll second. Second, Representative Luckner. Discussion? <clears throat> Seeing none, I will ask for a roll call. Video on and unmute, please, for a roll call vote. The motions ought not to pass on LD 1070. Representative Warren. Yes. I'm sorry, Deb. You, yeah, you have a number of people who were not. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> One can vote within two days. <laughs> Representative Morales. Yes. Representative Reckitt. Yes. Representative Sharp is absent. Representative Luckner. Yes. Representative Pickett is no longer here. Representative Costain is also no longer here. Representative Rudnicki. I think we lost Representative Rudnicki too. I'll circle back. Representative Newman. Uh, yes. Representative Pluker. Yes. Senator Lawrence is absent. Senator Searway. And I will say yes, just to let this bill go. Senator DeChambeau. Uh, yes. Representative Rudnicki. That's eight yes and five absent. I know how you feel, Senator Sayway. I've had to do the same thing with that. <laughs> we all have. <laughs> um, Thank you, Senator. Yeah. Yep. Uh, that concludes. Uh, are we still Wednesday? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I started at nine with my bill. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Wow, we haven't done this. I can't remember when, not this long. Um, big kudos on all of you. If we were together, I'd be bringing you some whoopie pies and <laughs> we'll get together and have whoopie pies. And oh, then yeah. something. <laughs> um, so we have another long day uh, Friday. Um, and that is uh, work sessions. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So if you don't want to stay till six, you got eleven bills to read tomorrow and uh, get an idea of what you want to do or ask at the work session. Um, so um, we can crank on work sessions. We can totally crank. Yeah, yeah. Uh, really, I learned a lot today. Um, these, uh, I'm going to tell you that hypodermic needle one was the most difficult one for me to wrap my head around. Uh, but um, so, uh, anyone have any potting words? We're all set. Have Those a good night, all. everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye bye. -bye. Bye. 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 Nice work, everybody. Yeah. Nice work, Senator yeah. Steerway. Nice work, Representative Warren. Good work, you guys.